section twenty five of jean christophe in paris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org jean christophe in paris by romain roland translated by gilbert cannon antoinette chapter one part eight she returned to olivier it was high time she returned to him he had just fallen ill and the poor nervous unhappy little creature who trembled at the thought of illness before it came now that he was really ill refused to write to his sister for fear of upsetting her but he called to her prayed for her coming as for a miracle when the miracle happened he was lying in the school infirmary feverish and wandering when he saw her he made no sound how often had he seen her enter in his fevered fancy he sat up in bed gaping and trembling lest it should be once more only an illusion and when she sat down on the bed by his side when she took him in her arms and he had taken her in his when he felt her soft cheek against his lips and her hands still cold from travelling by night in his when he was quite quite sure that it was his dear sister who began to weep he could do nothing else he was still the little crybaby that he had been when he was a child he clung to her and held her close for fear she should go away from him again how changed they were how sad they looked no matter they were together once more everything was lit up the infirmary the school the gloomy day they clung to each other they would never let each other go before she had said a word he made her swear that she would not go away again he had no need to make her swear no she would never go away again they had been too unhappy away from each other their mother was right anything was better than being parted even poverty even death so only they were together they took rooms they wanted to take their old little flat horrible though it was but it was occupied their new rooms also looked out on to a yard but above a wall they could see the top of a little acacia and grew fond of it at once as a friend from the country a prisoner like themselves in the paved wilderness of the city olivier quickly recovered his health or rather what he was pleased to call his health for what was health to him would have been illness to a stronger boy antoinette's unhappy stay in germany had helped her to save a little money and she made some more by the translation of a german book which a publisher accepted for a time then they were free of financial anxiety and all would be well if olivier passed his examination at the end of the year but if he did not pass no sooner had they settled down to the happiness of being together again than they were once more obsessed by the prospect of the examination they tried hard not to think about it but in vain they were always coming back to it the fixed idea haunted them even when they were seeking distraction from their thoughts at concerts it would suddenly leap out at them in the middle of the performance at night when they woke up it would lie there like a yawning gulf before them in addition to his eagerness to please his sister and repay her for the sacrifice of her youth that she had made for his sake olivier lived in terror of his military service which he could not escape if he were rejected at that time admission to the great schools was still admitted as an exemption from service he had an invincible disgust for the physical and moral promiscuity the kind of intellectual degradation which rightly or wrongly he saw in barrack life every pure and aristocratic quality in him revolted from such compulsion and it seemed to him that death would be preferable in these days it is permitted to make light of such feelings and even to decry them in the name of a social morality which for the moment has become a religion but they are blind who deny it there is no more profound suffering than that of the violation of moral solitude by the coarse liberal communism of the present day the examinations began olivier was almost incapable of going in he was unwell and he was so fearful of the torment he would have to undergo whether he passed or not that he almost 
longed to be taken seriously ill he did quite well in the written examination but he had a cruel time waiting to hear the results following the immemorial custom of the country of revolutions which is the worst country in the world for red tape and routine the examinations were held in july during the hottest days of the year as though it were deliberately intended to finish off the luckless candidates who were already staggering under the weight of cramming a monstrous list of subjects of which even the examiners did not know a tenth part the written examinations were held on the day after the holiday of the fourteenth july when the whole city was upside down and making merry to the undoing of the young men who were by no means inclined to be merry and asked for nothing but silence in the square outside the house booths were set up rifles cracked at the miniature ranges merry-go-rounds creaked and grunted and hideous steam organs roared from morning till night the idiotic noise went on for a week then a president of the republic by way of maintaining his popularity granted the rowdy merrymakers another three days holiday it cost him nothing he did not hear the row but olivier and antoinette were distracted and appalled by the noise and had to keep their windows shut so that their rooms were stifling and stopped their ears trying vainly to escape the shrill insistent idiotic tunes which were ground out from morning till night and stabbed through their brains like daggers so that they were reduced to a pitiful condition the viva voce examination began immediately after the publication of the first results olivier begged antoinette not to go she waited at the door much more anxious than he of course he never told her what he thought of his performance he tormented her by telling her what he had said and what he had not said at last the final results were published the names of the candidates were posted in the courtyard of the sorbonne antoinette would not let olivier go alone as they left the house they thought though they did not say it that when they came back they would know and perhaps they would regret their present fears when at least there was still hope when they came in sight of the sorbonne they felt their legs give way under them brave little antoinette said to her brother please not so fast olivier looked at his sister and she forced a smile he said shall we sit down for a moment on the seat here he would gladly have gone no further but after a moment she pressed his hand and said it's nothing dear let us go on they could not find the list at first they read several others in which the name of jeannin did not appear when at last they saw it they did not take it in at first they read it several times and could not believe it then when they were quite sure that it was true that jeannin was olivier that jeannin had passed they could say nothing they hurried home she took his arm and held his wrist and leaned her weight on him they almost ran and saw nothing of what was going on about them as they crossed the boulevard they were almost run over they said over and over again dear darling dear dear they tore upstairs to their rooms and then they flung their arms round each other antoinette took her brother's hand and led him to the photographs of their father and mother which hung on the wall near her bed in a corner of her room which was a sort of sanctuary to her they knelt down before them and with tears in their eyes they prayed antoinette ordered a jolly little dinner but they could not eat a morsel they were not hungry they spent the evening olivier kneeling by his sister's side while she petted him like a child they hardly spoke at all they could not even be happy for they were too worn out they went to bed before nine o'clock and slept the sleep of the just next day antoinette had a frightful headache but there was such a load taken from her heart olivier felt for the first time in his life that he could breathe freely he was saved she was saved she had accomplished her task and he had shown himself to be not unworthy of his sister's expectations for the first time for years and years they allowed themselves a little laziness they stayed in bed till twelve talking through the wall with the door between their rooms open when they looked in the mirror they saw their faces happy and tired looking they smiled and threw kisses to each other and dozed off again and watched each other sleep and lay weary and worn with hardly the strength to do more than mutter tender little scraps of words antoinette had always put by a little money sou by sou so as to have some small reserve in case of illness she did not tell her brother the surprise she had in store for him the day after his success she told him that they were going to spend a month in switzerland to make up for all their years of trouble and hardship 
now that olivier was assured of three years at the ecole normale at the expense of the state and then when he left the ecole of finding a post they could be extravagant and spend all their savings olivier shouted for joy when she told him antoinette was even more happy than he happy in her brother's happiness happy to think that she was going to see the country once more she had so longed for it it took them some time to get ready for the journey but the work of preparation was an unending joy it was well on in august when they set out they were not used to travelling olivier did not sleep the night before and he did not sleep in the train the whole day they had been fearful of missing the train they were in a feverish hurry they had been jostled about at the station and finally huddled into a second-class carriage where they could not even lean back to go to sleep that is one of the privileges of which the eminently democratic french companies deprive poor travellers so that rich travellers may have the pleasure of thinking that they have a monopoly of it olivier did not sleep a wink he was not sure that they were in the right train and he looked out for the name of every station antoinette slept lightly and woke up very frequently the jolting of the train made her head bob olivier watched her by the light of the funereal lamp which shone at the top of the moving sarcophagus and he was suddenly struck by the change in her face her eyes were hollow her childish lips were half open from sheer weariness her skin was sallow and there were little wrinkles on her cheeks the marks of the sad years of sorrow and disillusion she looked old and ill and indeed she was so tired if she had dared she would have postponed their journey but she did not like to spoil her brother's pleasure she tried to persuade herself that she was only tired and that the country would make her well again she was fearful lest she should fall ill on the way she felt that he was looking at her and she suddenly flung off the drowsiness that was creeping over her and opened her eyes eyes still young still clear and limpid across which from time to time there passed an involuntary look of pain like shadows on a little lake he asked her in a whisper anxiously and tenderly how she was she pressed his hand and assured him that she was well a word of love revived her then when the rosy dawn tinged the pale country between dole and pontalier the sight of the waking fields and the gay sun rising from the earth the sun who like themselves had escaped from the prison of the streets and the grimy houses and the thick smoke of paris the waving fields wrapped in the light mist of their milk-white breath the little things they had passed a little village belfry a glimpse of a winding stream a blue line of hills hovering on the far horizon the tinkling moving sound of the angelus borne from afar on the wind when the train stopped in the midst of the sleeping country the solemn shapes of a herd of cows browsing on a slope above the railway all absorbed antoinette and her brother to whom it all seemed new they were like parched trees drinking in ecstasy the rain from heaven then in the early morning they reached the swiss customs where they had to get out a little station in a bare countryside they were almost worn out by their sleepless night in the cold dewy freshness of the dawn made them shiver but it was calm and the sky was clear and the fragrant air of the fields was about them upon their lips on their tongues down their throats flowing down into their lungs like a cooling stream and they stood by a table out in the open air and drank comforting hot coffee with creamy milk heavenly sweet and tasting of the grass and the flowers of the fields they climbed up into the swiss carriage the novel arrangement of which gave them a childish pleasure but antoinette was so tired she could not understand why she should feel so ill why was everything about her so beautiful so absorbing when she could take so little pleasure in it was it not all just what she had been dreaming for years a journey with her brother with all anxiety for the future left behind dear mother nature what was the matter with her she was annoyed with herself and forced herself to admire and share her brother's naive delight they stopped at tun they were to go up into the mountains next day but that night in the hotel antoinette was stricken with a fever and violent illness and pains in her head olivia was at his wits ends and spent a night of frightful anxiety he had to send for a doctor in the morning an unforeseen expense which was no light tax on their slender purse the doctor could find nothing immediately serious but said that she was run down and that her constitution was undermined there could be no question of their going on the doctor forbade antoinette to get up all day and he thought they would perhaps have to stay at tun for some time 
they were very downcast though very glad to have got off so cheaply after all their fears but it was hard to have come so far to be shut up in a nasty hotel room into which the sunlight poured so that it was like a hothouse antoinette insisted on her brother going out he went a few yards from the hotel saw the beautiful green a r and hovering in the distance against the sky a white peak he bubbled over with joy but he could not keep it to himself he rushed back to his sister's room and told her excitedly what he had just seen and when she expressed her surprise at his coming back so soon and made him promise to go out again he said as once before he had said when he came back from the chatelet concert no no it is too beautiful it hurts me to see it without you that feeling was not new to them they knew that they had to be together to enjoy anything holy but they always loved to hear it said his tender words did antoinette more good than any medicine she smiled now languidly happily and after a good night although it was not very wise to go on so soon she decided that they would get away very early without telling the doctor who would only want to keep them back the pure air and the joy of seeing so much beauty made her stronger so that she did not have to pay for her rashness and without any further misadventure they reached the end of their journey a mountain village high above the lake some distance away from speets there they spent three or four weeks in a little hotel antoinette did not have any further attack of fever but she never got really well she still felt a heaviness and intolerable weight in her head and she was always unwell olivier often asked her about her health he longed to see her grow less pale but he was intoxicated by the beauty of the country and instinctively avoided all melancholy thoughts when she assured him that she was really quite well he tried to believe that it was true although he knew perfectly well that it was not so and she enjoyed to the full her brother's exuberance and the fine air and the all-pervading peace how good was it to rest at last after those terrible years olivier tried to induce her to go for walks with him she would have been happy to join him but on several occasions when she had bravely set out she had been forced to stop after twenty minutes to regain her breath and rest her heart so he went out alone climbing the safe peaks though they filled her with terror until he came home again or they would go for little walks together she would lean on his arm and walk slowly and they would talk and he would suddenly begin to chatter and laugh and discuss his plans and make quips and jests from the road on the hillside above the valley they would watch the white clouds reflected in the still lake and the boats moving like insects on the surface of a pond they would drink in the warm air and the music of the goat bells borne on the gusty wind and the smell of the noon mown hay and the warm resin and they would dream together of the past and the future and the present which seemed to them to be the most unreal and intoxicating of dreams sometimes antoinette would be infected with her brother's jolly childlike humour they would chase each other and roll about on the grass and one day he saw her laughing as she used to do when they were children madly carelessly laughter clear and bubbling as a spring such as he had not heard for many years but most often olivier could not resist the pleasure of going for long walks he would be sorry for it at once and later he had bitterly to regret that he had not made enough of those dear days with his sister even in the hotel he would often leave her alone there was a party of young men and girls in the hotel from whom they had at first kept apart then olivier was attracted by them and shyly joined their circle he had been starved of friendship outside his sister he had hardly known any one but his rough schoolfellows and their girls who repelled him it was very sweet to him to be among well-mannered charming merry boys and girls of his own age although he was very shy he was naively curious sentimental and affectionate and easily bewitched by the little burning flickering fires that shine in a woman's eyes and in spite of his shyness women liked him his frank longing to love and be loved gave him unknown to himself a youthful charm and made him find words and gestures and affectionate little attentions the very awkwardness of which made them all the more attractive he had the gift of sympathy although in his isolation his intelligence had taken on an ironical tinge which made him see the vulgarity of people and their defects which he often loathed yet in their presence he saw nothing but their eyes in which he would see the expression of a living being who one day would die a being who had only one life even as he and even as he would lose it all too soon then of that creature he would involuntarily be fond in that moment nothing in the world could make him do anything to her 
hurt whether he liked it or not he had to be kind and amiable he was weak and in being so he was sure to please the world which pardons every vice and even every virtue except one force on which all the rest depend antoinette did not join them her health her tiredness her apparently causeless moral collapse paralyzed her through the long years of anxiety and ceaseless toil exhausting body and soul the positions of the brother and sister had been inverted now it was she who felt far removed from the world far from everything and everybody so far she could not break down the wall between them all their chatter their noise their laughter their little interests bored her wearied her almost hurt her it hurt her to be so she would have loved to go with the other girls to share their interests and laugh with them but she could not her heart ached she seemed to be as one dead in the evening she would shut herself up in her room and often she would not even turn on the light she would sit there in the dark while downstairs olivier would be amusing himself surrendering to the current of one of those romantic little love affairs to which he so easily succumbed she would only shake off her torpor when she heard him coming upstairs laughing and talking to the girls hanging about saying good-night outside their rooms being unable to tear himself away then in the darkness antoinette would smile and get up to turn on the light the sound of her brother's laughter revived her autumn was setting in the sun was dying down nature was aweary under the thick mists and clouds of october the colours were fading fast snow fell on the mountains mists descended upon the plains the visitors went away one by one and then several at a time and it was sad to see even the friends of a little while going away but sadder still to see the passing of the summer the time of peace and happiness which had been an oasis in their lives they went for a last walk together on a cloudy autumn day through the forest on the mountain side they did not speak they mused sadly as they walked along with the collars of their cloaks turned up clinging close together their hands were locked there was silence in the wet woods and in silence the trees wept from the depths there came the sweet plaintive cry of a solitary bird who felt the coming of winter through the mist came the clear tinkling of the goat bells far away so faint they could hardly hear it so faint it was as though it came up from their inmost hearts they returned to paris they were both sad antoinette was no better section twenty six of jean christophe in paris this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Cannon. Antoinette, Chapter One, Part Nine. They had set to work to prepare olivier's wardrobe for the ecole antoinette spent the last of her little store of money and even sold some of her jewels what did it matter he would repay her later on and then she would need so little when he was gone from her she tried not to think of what it would be like when he was gone she worked away at his clothes and put into the work all the tenderness she had for her brother and she had a presentiment that it would be the last thing she would do for him during the last days together they were never apart they were fearful of wasting the tiniest moment on their last evening they sat up very late by the fireside antoinette occupying the only armchair and olivier a stool at her feet and she made a fuss of him like the spoiled child he was he was dreading though he was curious about it too the new life upon which he was to enter antoinette thought only that it was the end of their dear life together and wondered fearfully what would become of her as though he were trying to make the thought even more bitter for her he was more tender than ever he had been with the innocent instinctive coquetry of those who always wait until they are just going to show themselves at their best and most charming he went to the piano and played her their favourite passages from mozart and gluck those visions of tender happiness and serene sorrow with which so much of their past life was bound up when the time came for them to part antoinette accompanied olivier as far as the gates of the ecole then she returned once more she was alone 
but now it was not as when she had gone away to germany a separation which she could bring to an end at will when she could bear it no longer how it was she who remained behind he who went away it was he who had gone away for a long long time perhaps for life and yet her love for him was so maternal that at first she thought less of herself than of him she thought only of how different the first few days would be for him of the strict rules of the ecole and was preoccupied with those harmless little worries which so easily assume alarming proportions in the minds of people who live alone and are always tormenting themselves about those whom they love her anxiety did at least have this advantage that it distracted her thoughts from her own loneliness she had already begun to think of the half-hour when she would be able to see him next day in the visitor's room she arrived a quarter of an hour too soon he was very nice to her but he was altogether taken up with all the new things he had seen and during the following days when she went to see him full of the most tender anxiety the contrast between what those meetings meant for her and what they meant for him was more and more marked for her they were her whole life for olivier no doubt he loved antoinette dearly but it was too much to expect him to think only of her as she thought of him once or twice he came down late to the visitor's room one day when she asked him if he were at all unhappy he said that he was nothing of the kind such little things as that stabbed antoinette to the heart she was angry with herself for being so sensitive and accused herself of selfishness she knew quite well that it would be absurd even wrong and unnatural for him to be unable to do without her and for her to be unable to do without him and to have no other object in life yes she knew all that but what was the good of her knowing it she could not help it if for the past ten years her whole life had been bound up in that one idea her brother now that the one interest of her life had been torn from her she had nothing left she tried bravely to keep herself occupied and to take up her music and read her beloved books but alas how empty were shakespeare and beethoven without olivier yes no doubt they were beautiful but olivier was not there what is the good of beautiful things if the eyes of the beloved are not there to see them what is the use of beauty what is the use even of joy if they cannot be won through the heart of the beloved if she had been stronger she would have tried to build up her life anew and give it another object but she was at the end of her tether now that there was nothing to force her to hold on at all costs the effort of will to which she had subjected herself snapped she collapsed the illness which had been gaining grip on her for over a year during which she had fought it down by force of will was now left to take its course she spent her evenings alone in her room by the spent fire a prey to her thoughts she had neither the courage to light the fire again nor the strength to go to bed she would sit there far into the night dozing dreaming shivering she would live through her life again and summon up the beloved dead and her lost illusions and she would be terribly sad at the thought of her lost youth without love or hope of love a dumb aching sorrow obscure unconfessed a child laughed in the street its little feet pattered up to the floor below its little feet trampled on her heart she would be beset with doubts and evil thoughts her soul in its weakness would be contaminated by the soul of that city of selfish pleasure she would fight down her regrets and burn with shame at certain longings which she thought evil and wicked she could not understand what it was that hurt her so and attributed it to her evil instincts poor little ophelia devoured by a mysterious evil she felt with horror dark and uneasy desires mounting from the depths of her being from the very pit of life she could not work and she had given up most of her pupils she who was so plucky and had always risen so early now lay in bed sometimes until the afternoon she had no more reason for getting up than for going to bed she ate little or nothing only on her brother's holidays thursday afternoons and sundays she would make an effort to be her old self with him he saw nothing he was too much taken up with his new life to notice his sister much he was at that period of boyhood when it was difficult for him to be communicative and he always seemed to be indifferent to things outside himself which would only be his concern in later days people of riper years sometimes seem to be more open to impressions and to take a simpler delight in life and nature than young people between twenty and thirty and so it is often said that young people are not so young in heart as they were and have lost all sense of enjoyment 
that is often a mistaken idea it is not because they have no sense of enjoyment that they seem less sensitive it is because their whole being is often absorbed by passion ambition desires some fixed idea when the body is worn and has no more to expect from life then the emotions become disinterested and fall into their place and then once more the source of childish tears is reopened olivier was preoccupied with a thousand little things the most outstanding of which was an absurd little passion he was always a victim to them which so obsessed him as to make him blind and indifferent to everything else antoinette did not know what was happening to her brother she only saw that he was drawing away from her that was not altogether olivier's fault sometimes when he came he would be glad to see her and start talking he would come in then all of a sudden he would dry up her affectionate anxiety the eagerness with which she clung to him and drank in his words and overwhelmed him with little attentions all her excess of tenderness and querulous devotion would deprive him utterly of any desire to be warm and open with her he might have seen that antoinette was not in a normal condition nothing could be farther from her usual tact and discretion but he never gave a thought to it he would reply to her questions with a curt yes or no he would grow more stiff and surly the more she tried to win him over sometimes even he would hurt her by some brusque reply then she would be crushed and silent their day together would slip by wasted but hardly had he set foot outside the house on his way back to the echo than he would be heartily ashamed of his treatment of her he would torture himself all night as he lay awake thinking of the pain he had caused her sometimes even as soon as he reached the ecole he would write an effusive letter to his sister but next morning when he read it through he would tear it up and antoinette would know nothing at all about it she would go on thinking that he had ceased to love her she had if not one last joy one last flutter of tenderness and youth when her heart beat strongly once more one last awakening of love in her and hope of happiness hope of life it was quite ridiculous so utterly unlike her tranquil nature it could never have been but for her abnormal condition the state of fear and over-excitement which was the precursor of illness she went to a concert at the chatelet with her brother and as he had just been appointed musical critic to a little review they were in better places than those they occupied in old days but the people among whom they sat were much more apathetic they had stalls near the stage christophe kraft was to play neither of them had ever heard of the german musician when she saw him come on the blood rushed to her heart although her tired eyes could only see him through a mist she had no doubt when he appeared he was the unknown young man of her unhappy days in germany she had never mentioned him to her brother and she had hardly even admitted his existence to her thoughts she had been entirely absorbed by the anxieties of her life since then besides she was a reasonable little french woman and refused to admit the existence of an obscure feeling which she could not trace to its source while it seemed to lead nowhere there was in her a whole region of the soul of unsuspected depths wherein there slept many other feelings which she would have been ashamed to behold she knew that they were there but she looked away from them in a sort of religious terror of that being within herself which lies beyond the mind's control when she had recovered a little she borrowed her brother's glasses to look at christophe she saw him in profile at the conductor's stand and she recognized his expression of forceful concentration he was wearing her shabby old coat which fitted him very badly antoinette sat in silent agony through the vagaries of that lamentable concert when christophe joined issue with the unconcealed hostility of his audience who were at the time ill-disposed towards german artists and actively bored by his music and when he appeared after a symphony which had seemed unconscionably long to play some piano music he was received with catcalls which left no room for doubt as to their displeasure at having to put up with him again however he began to play in the face of the bored resignation of his audience but the uncomplimentary remarks exchanged in a loud voice by two men in the gallery went on to the great delight of the rest of the audience then he broke off and in a childish fit of temper he played malbrook s'en va guerre with one finger got up from the piano faced the audience and said that is all you are fit for 
the audience were for a moment so taken aback that they did not quite take in what the musician meant then there was an outburst of angry protests followed a terrible uproar they hissed and shouted apologize make him apologize they were all red in the face with anger and they blew out their fury tried to persuade themselves that they were really enraged as perhaps they were but the chief thing was that they were delighted to have a chance of making a row and letting themselves go they were like schoolboys after a few hours in school antoinette could not move she was petrified she sat still tugging at one of her gloves ever since the last bars of the symphony she had had a growing presentiment of what would happen she felt the blind hostility of the audience felt it growing she read christophe's thoughts and she was sure he would not go through to the end without an explosion she sat waiting for the explosion while agony grew in her she stretched every nerve to try to prevent it when at last it came it was so exactly what she had foreseen that she was overwhelmed by it as by some fatal catastrophe against which there was nothing to be done and as she gazed at christophe who was staring insolently at the howling audience their eyes met christophe's eyes recognized her greeted her for the space of perhaps a second but he was in such a state of excitement that his mind did not recognize her he had not thought of her for long enough he disappeared while the audience yelled and hissed she longed to cry out to say or do something but she was bound hand and foot and could not stir it was like a nightmare it was some comfort to her to hear her brother at her side and to know that without having any idea what was happening to her he had shared her agony and indignation olivia was a thorough musician and he had an independence of taste which nothing could encroach upon when he liked a thing he would have maintained his liking in the face of the whole world with the very first bars of the symphony he had felt that he was in the presence of something big something the like of which he had never in his life come across he went on muttering to himself with heartfelt enthusiasm that's fine that's beautiful beautiful while his sister instinctively pressed close to him gratefully after the symphony he applauded loudly by way of protest against the ironic indifference of the rest of the audience when he came to the great fiasco he was beside himself he stood up shouted that christophe was right abused the boers and offered to fight them it was impossible to recognize the timid olivier his voice was drowned in the uproar he was told to shut up he was called a snotty little kid and told to go to bed antoinette saw the futility of standing up to them and took his arm and said stop stop i implore you stop he sat down in despair and went on muttering it's shameful shameful the swine she said nothing and bore her suffering in silence he thought she was insensible to the music and said antoinette don't you think it beautiful she nodded she was frozen and could not recover herself but when the orchestra began another piece she suddenly got up and whispered to her brother in a tone of savage hatred come come i can't bear the sight of these people they hurried out they walked along arm in arm and olivia went on talking excitedly antoinette said nothing section twenty seven of jean christophe in paris this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Cannon. Antoinette, Chapter One, Part Ten. All that day and the days following, she sat alone in her room and a feeling crept over her which at first she refused to face but then it went on and took possession of her thoughts like the furious throbbing of the blood in her aching temples some time afterwards olivier brought her christophe's collection of songs which he had just found at a publisher's she opened it at random on the first page on which her eyes fell she read in front of a song this dedication in german to my poor dear little victim together with a date she knew the date well she was so upset that she could read no farther she put the book down and asked her brother to play and went and shut herself up in her room olivier full of his delight in the new music began to play without remarking his sister's emotion antoinette sat in the adjoining room striving to repress the beating of her heart suddenly she got up and looked through a cupboard for a little account book in which was written the date of her departure from germany and the mysterious date she knew 
it already yes it was the evening of the performance at the theatre to which she had been with christophe she lay down on her bed and closed her eyes blushing with her hands folded on her breast while she listened to the dear music her heart was overflowing with gratitude ah why did her head hurt her so when olivier saw that his sister had not come back he went into her room after he had done playing and found her lying there he asked her if she were ill she said she was rather tired and got up to keep him company they talked but she did not answer his questions at once her thoughts seemed to be far away she smiled and blushed and said by way of excuse that her headache was making her stupid at last olivier went away she had asked him to leave the book of songs she sat up late reading them at the piano without playing just lightly touching a note here and there for fear of annoying her neighbours but for the most part she did not even read she sat dreaming she was carried away by a feeling of tenderness and gratitude towards the man who had pitied her and had read her mind and soul with the mysterious intuition of true kindness she could not fix her thoughts she was happy and sad sad ah how her head ached she spent the night in sweet and painful dreams a crushing melancholy during the day she tried to go out for a little to shake off her drowsiness although her head was still aching to give herself something to do she went and made a few purchases at a great shop she hardly gave a thought to what she was doing her thoughts were always with christophe though she did not admit it to herself as she came out worried and mortally sad through the crowd of people she saw christophe go by on the other side of the street he saw her too at the same moment at once suddenly and without thinking she held out her hands towards him christophe stopped this time he recognized her he sprang forward to cross the road to antoinette and antoinette tried to go to meet him but the insensate current of the passing throng carried her along like a windle straw while the horse of an omnibus falling on the slippery asphalt made a sort of dyke in front of christophe by which the opposing streams of carriages were dammed so that for a few moments there was an impassable barrier christophe tried to force his way through in spite of everything but he was trapped in the middle of the traffic and could not move either way when at last he did extricate himself and managed to reach the place where he had seen antoinette she was gone she had struggled vainly against the human torrent that carried her along then she yielded to it gave up the struggle she felt that she was dogged by some fatality which forbade the possibility of her ever meeting christophe against fate there was nothing to be done and when she did succeed in escaping from the crowd she made no attempt to go back she was suddenly ashamed what could she dare to say to him what had she done what must he have thought of her she fled away home she did not regain assurance until she reached her room then she sat by the table in the dark and had not even the strength to take off her hat or her gloves she was miserable at having been unable to speak to him and at the same time there glowed a new light in her heart she was unconscious of the darkness and unconscious of the illness that was upon her she went on and on turning over and over every detail of the scene in the street and she changed it about and imagined what would have happened if certain things had turned out differently she saw herself holding out her arms to christophe and christophe's expression of joy as he recognized her and she laughed and blushed she blushed and then in the darkness of her room where there was no one to see her and she could hardly see herself once more she held out her arms to him her need was too strong for her she felt that she was losing ground and instinctively she sought to clutch at the strong vivid life that passed so near her and gazed so kindly at her her heart was full of tenderness and anguish and through the night she cried help me save me all in a fever she got up and lit the lamp and took pen and paper she wrote to christophe her illness was full upon her or she would never even have thought of writing to him so proud she was and timid she did not know what she wrote she was no longer mistress of herself she called to him and told him that she loved him in the middle of her letter she stopped appalled she tried to write it all over again but her impulse was gone her mind was a blank and her head was aching she had a horrible difficulty in finding words she was utterly worn out she was ashamed what was the good of it all she knew perfectly well that she was trying to trick herself and that she would never send the letter even if she had wished to do so how could she she did not know christophe's address poor christophe and what could he do for her even if he knew all and were kind to her what could 
he do it was too late no no it was all in vain the last dying struggle of a bird blindly desperately beating its wings she must be resigned to it so for a long time she sat there by the table lost in thought unable to move hand or foot it was past midnight when she struggled to her feet bravely mechanically she placed the loose sheets of her letter in one of her few books for she had the strength neither to put them in order nor to tear them up then she went to bed shivering and shaking with fever the key to the riddle lay near at hand she felt that the will of god was to be fulfilled and a great peace came upon her on sunday morning when olivier came he found antoinette in bed delirious a doctor was called in he said it was acute consumption antoinette had known how serious her condition was she had discovered the cause of the moral turmoil in herself which had so alarmed her she had been dreadfully ashamed and it was some consolation to her to think that not she herself but her illness was the cause of it she had managed to take a few precautions and to burn her papers and to write a letter to madame nathan she appealed to her kindness to look after her brother during the first few weeks after her death she dared not write the word the doctor could do nothing the disease was too far gone and antoinette's constitution had been wrecked by the years of hardship and unceasing toil antoinette was quite calm since she had known that there was no hope her agony and torment had left her she lay turning over in her mind all the trials and tribulations through which she had passed she saw that her work was done and her dear olivier saved and she was filled with unutterable joy she said to herself i have achieved that and then she turned in shame from her pride and said i could have done nothing alone god has given me his aid and she thanked god that he had granted her life until she had accomplished her task there was a catch at her heart as she thought that now she had to lay down her life but she dared not complain that would have been to feel ingratitude towards god who might have called her away sooner and what would have happened if she had passed away a year sooner she sighed and humbled herself in gratitude in spite of her weakness and depression she did not complain except when she was sleeping heavily when every now and then she moaned like a little child she watched things and people with a calm smile of resignation it was always a joy to her to see olivier she would move her lips to call him though she made no sound she would want to hold his hand in hers she would bid him lay his head on the pillow near hers and then gazing into his eyes she would go on looking at him in silence at last she would raise herself up and hold his face in her hands and say ah olivier olivier she took the medal that she wore round her neck and hung it on her brother's she commended her beloved olivier to the care of her confessor her doctor everybody it seemed as though she was to live henceforth in him that on the point of death she was taking refuge in his life as upon some island in uncharted seas sometimes she seemed to be uplifted by a mystic exultation of tenderness and faith and she forgot her illness and sadness changed to joy in her a joy divine indeed that shone upon her lips and in her eyes over and over again she said i am happy her senses grew dim in her last moments of consciousness her lips moved and it seemed that she was repeating something to herself olivia went to her bedside and bent down over her she recognized him once more and smiled feebly up at him her lips went on moving and her eyes were filled with tears they could not make out what she was trying to say but faintly olivier heard her breathe the words of the dear old song they used to love so much the song she was always singing i will come again my sweet and bonny i will come again then she relapsed into unconsciousness so she passed away unconsciously she had aroused a profound sympathy in many people whom she did not even know in the house in which she lived she did not even know the names of the other tenants olivier received expressions of sympathy from people who were strangers to him antoinette was not taken to her grave unattended as her mother had been her body was followed to the cemetery by friends and schoolfellows of her brother and members of the families whose children she had taught and people whom she had met without saying a word of her own life or hearing a word from them though they admired her secretly knowing her devotion and many of the poor and the housekeeper had helped her and even many of the small tradesmen of the neighbourhood madame nathan had taken olivier under her wing on the day of his sister's death and she had carried him off in spite of himself and done her best to turn his thoughts away from his grief if it had come later in his life he could never have borne up against such a catastrophe but now it was impossible for him to succumb absolutely to his despair he had just begun a new life he was living in a community and had to live the common life whatever he might be feeling the full busy life of the ecole the intellectual pressure the examinations the struggle for life all kept him from withdrawing into himself 
he could not be alone he suffered but it proved his salvation a year earlier or a few years earlier he must have succumbed and yet he did as far as possible retire into isolation in the memory of his sister it was a great sorrow to him that he could not keep the rooms where they had lived together but he had no money he hoped that the people who seemed to be interested in him would understand his distress at not being able to keep the things that had been hers but nobody seemed to understand he borrowed some money and made a little more by private tuition and took an attic in which he stored all that he could preserve of his sister's furniture her bed her table and her armchair he made it the sanctuary of her memory he took refuge there whenever he was depressed his friends thought he was carrying on an intrigue he would stay there for hours dreaming of her with his face buried in his hands unhappily he had no portrait of her except a little photograph taken when she was a child of the two of them together he would talk to her and weep where was she ah if she had been at the other end of the world wherever she might be and however inaccessible the spot with what great joy and invincible ardour he would have rushed forth in search of her though a thousand sufferings lay in wait for him though he had to go barefoot though he had to wander for hundreds of years if only it might be that every step would bring him nearer to her yes even though there were only one chance in a thousand of his ever finding her but there was nothing nowhere to go no way of ever finding her again how utterly lonely he was now now that she was no longer there to love and counsel and console him inexperienced and childish as he was he was flung into the waters of life to sink or swim he who has once had the happiness of perfect intimacy and boundless friendship with another human being has known the divinest of all joys a joy that will make him miserable for the remainder of his life nasun manjur dolore che ricordarsi del tempo felice nella miseria for a weak and tender soul it is the greatest of misfortunes ever to have known the greatest happiness but though it is sad indeed to lose the beloved at the beginning of life it is even more terrible later on when the springs of life were running dry olivier was young and in spite of his inborn pessimism in spite of his misfortune he had to live his life as often seems to happen after the loss of those dear to us it was as though when antoinette passed away she had breathed part of her soul into her brother's life and he believed it was so though he had not such faith as hers yet he did arrive at a vague conviction that his sister was not dead but lived on in him as she had promised there is a baton superstition that those who die young are not dead but stay and hover over the places where they lived until they have fulfilled the normal span of their existence so antoinette lived out her life in olivier he read through the papers he had found in her room unhappily she had burned most of them besides she was not the sort of woman to keep notes and tallies of her inner life she was too modest to uncloak her inmost thoughts in morbid babbling indiscretion she only kept a little notebook which was almost unintelligible to anybody else a bare record in which she had written down without remark certain dates and certain small events in her daily life which had given her joys and emotions which she had no need to write down in detail to keep alive almost all these dates were connected with some event in olivier's life she had kept every letter he had ever written to her without exception alas he had not been so careful he had lost almost all the letters she had written to him what need had he of letters he thought he would have his sister always with him that dear fount of tenderness seemed inexhaustible he thought that he would always be able to quench his thirst of lips and heart at it he had most prodigally squandered the love he had received and now he was eager to gather up the smallest drops what was his emotion when as he skimmed through one of antoinette's books he found these words written in pencil on a scrap of paper olivier my dear olivier he almost swooned he sobbed and kissed the invisible lips that so spoke to him from the grave thereafter he took down all her books and hunted through them page by page to see if she had not left some other words of him he found the fragment of the letter to christophe and discovered the unspoken romance which had sprung to life in her so for the first time he happed upon her emotional life that he had never known in her and never tried to know he lived through the last passionate days when deserted by himself she had held out her arms to the unknown friend she had never told him that she had seen christophe before certain words in her letter revealed the fact that they had met in germany he understood that christophe had been kind to antoinette in circumstances the details of which were unknown to him and that antoinette's feeling for the musician dated from that day though she had kept her secret to the end 
christophe whom he loved already for the beauty of his art now became unutterably dear to him she had loved him it seemed to olivier that it was she whom he loved in christophe he moved heaven and earth to meet him it was not an easy matter to trace him after his rebuff christophe had been lost in the wilderness of paris he had shunned all society and no one gave a thought to him after many months it chanced that olivier met christophe in the street he was pale and sunken from the illness from which he had only just recovered but olivier had not the courage to stop him he followed him home at a distance he wanted to write to him but could not screw himself up to it what was there to say olivier was not alone antoinette was with him her love her modesty had become a part of him the thought that his sister had loved christophe made him as bashful in christophe's presence as though he had been antoinette and yet how he longed to talk to him of her but he could not her secret was a seal upon his lips he tried to meet christophe again he went everywhere where he thought christophe might be he was longing to shake hands with him and when he saw him he tried to hide so that christophe should not see him at last christophe saw him at the house of some mutual friends where they both happened to be one evening olivier stood far away from him and said nothing but he watched him and no doubt the spirit of antoinette was hovering near olivier that night for christophe saw her in olivier's eyes and it was her image so suddenly evoked that made him cross the room and go towards the unknown messenger who like a young hermes brought him the melancholy greeting of the blessed dead End of section twenty section twenty nine of jean christophe in paris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org jean christophe in paris by romain roland translated by gilbert canin the house chapter one part one i have a friend oh that delight of having found a kindred soul to which to cling in the midst of torment, a tender and sure refuge in which to breathe again while the fluttering heart beats slower, no longer to be alone, no longer never to unarm, no longer to stay on guard with straining burning eyes until from sheer fatigue he should fall into the hands of his enemies to have a dear companion into whose hands all his life should be delivered, the friend whose life was delivered into his. At last, to taste the sweetness of repose, to sleep while the friend watches, watch while the friend sleeps, to know the joy of protecting a beloved creature who should trust in him like a little child, to know the greater joy of absolute surrender to that friend, to feel that he is in possession of all secrets and has power over life and death, aging worn out weary of the burden of life through so many years to find new birth and fresh youth in the body of the friend through his eyes to see the world renewed through his senses to catch the fleeting loveliness of all things by the way through his heart to enjoy the splendour of living even to suffer in his suffering ah even suffering is joy if it be shared i have a friend away from me near me in me always i have my friend and i am his my friend loves me i am my friend's the friend of my friend of our two souls love has fashioned one christophe's first thought when he awoke the day after the roussins party was for olivier jeannin at once he felt an irresistible longing to see him again he got up and went out it was not yet eight o'clock it was a heavy and rather oppressive morning an april day before its time stormy clouds were hovering over paris olivier lived below the hill of st genevieve in a little street near the jardin des plantes the house stood in the narrowest part of the street the staircase led out of a dark yard and was full of diverse unpleasant smells the stairs wound steeply up and sloped down towards the wall which was disfigured with scribblings in pencil on the third floor a woman with grey hair hanging down and in petticoat bodice gaping at the neck opened the door when she heard footsteps on the stairs and slammed it too when she saw christophe there were several flats on each landing and through the ill-fitting doors christophe could hear children romping and squalling the place was a swarming heap of dull base creatures living as it were on shelves one above the other in that low-storied house built round a narrow evil-smelling yard Christophe was disgusted, and wondered what lusts and covetous desires could have drawn so many creatures to this place, far from the fields where at least there is air enough for all, 
and what it could profit them in the end to be in the city of Paris, where all their lives they were condemned to live in such a sepulchre. He reached Olivier's landing. A knotted piece of string was his bell-pull. Christophe tugged at it so mightily that at the noise several doors on the staircase were half opened. Olivier came to the door. Christophe was struck by the careful simplicity of his dress, and the neatness of it, which at any other time would have been little to his liking, was in that place an agreeable surprise. In such an atmosphere of foulness there was something charming and healthy about it, and at once he felt just as he had done the night before, when he gazed into Olivier's clear, honest eyes. He held out his hand, but Olivier was overcome with shyness and murmured, "'You! You here?' Christophe was engrossed in catching at the lovable quality of the man as it was revealed to him in that fleeting moment of embarrassment, and he only smiled in answer. He moved forward and forced Olivier backward, and entered the one room in which he both slept and worked. An iron bedstead stood against the wall near the window. Christophe noticed the pillows heaped up on the bolster. There were three chairs, a black painted table, a small piano, bookshelves, and books, and that was all. The room was cramped, low, ill-lighted, and yet there was in it a ray of the pure light that shone in the eyes of its owner. Everything was clean and tidy as though a woman's hands had dealt with it, and a few roses in a vase brought springtime into the room, the walls of which were decorated with photographs of old Florentine pictures. "'So, you, you have come to see me?' said Olivier warmly. "'Good Lord, I had to,' said Christophe. "'You would never have come to me.' "'You think not?' replied Olivier. "'Then quickly, yes, you are right, but it would not be for want of thinking of it. "'What would have stopped you? "'Wanting to too much. "'That's a fine reason. "'Yes, don't laugh. "'I was afraid you would not want it as much as I. "'A lot that's worried me. "'I wanted to see you, and here I am. "'If it bores you, I shall know at once.' "'You will have to have good eyes.' "'They smiled at each other. "'Olivier went on. "'I was an ass last night. "'I was afraid I might have offended you. "'My shyness is absolutely a disease. "'I can't get a word out. "'I shouldn't worry about that. "'There are plenty of talkers in your country. "'One is only too glad to meet a man "'who is silent occasionally, "'even though it be only from shyness "'and in spite of himself.' "'Christophe laughed and chuckled over his own jibe. "'Then you've come to see me because I can be silent?' "'Yes, for your silence, the sort of silence that is yours. "'There are all sorts, and I like yours, and that's all there is to say. "'But how could you sympathize with me? You hardly saw me.' "'That's my affair. It doesn't take me long to make up my mind. "'When I see a face that I like in the crowd, I know what to do. "'I go after it. I simply have to know the owner of it. "'And don't you ever make mistakes when you go after them?' Often. Perhaps you've made a mistake this time. We shall see. Ah, in that case I'm done. You terrify me. If I think you're watching me, I shall lose what little wits I have. With fond and eager curiosity, Christophe watched the sensitive, mobile face which blushed and went pale by turns. Emotion showed fleeting across it like the shadows of clouds on a lake. What a nervous youngster it is, he thought. He's like a woman. He touched his knee. "'Come, come,' he said. "'Do you think I should come to you with weapons concealed about me? "'I have a horror of people who practice their psychology on their friends. "'I only ask that we should both be open and sincere and frankly and without shame, "'and without being afraid of committing ourselves finally to anything or any sort of contradiction. "'Be true to what we feel. "'I ask only the right to love now and next minute, if needs must, to be out of love.' "'There's loyalty and manliness in that, isn't there?' "'Olivier gazed at him with serious eyes and replied, "'No doubt it is the more manly part, and you're strong enough, "'but I don't think I am.' "'I'm sure you are,' said Christophe, "'but in a different way. "'And then I've come just to help you to be strong if you want to be so. "'For what I have just said gives me leave to go on and say with more frankness "'than I should otherwise have had, that without prejudice for tomorrow, "'I love you.' Olivier blushed hotly. He was struck dumb with embarrassment and could not speak. Christophe glanced round the room. It's a poor place you live in. Haven't you another room? Only a lumber room. Oh, I can't breathe. How do you manage to live here? One does it somehow. I couldn't. 
Never. Christophe unbuttoned his waistcoat and took a long breath. Olivier went and opened the window wide. You must be very unhappy in a town, Monsieur Kraft, but there's no danger of my suffering from too much fatality. I breathe so little that I can live anywhere, and yet there are nights in summer when even I am hard put to it to get through. I'm terrified when I see them coming. Then I stay sitting up in bed, and I'm almost stifled. Christophe looked at the heap of pillows on the bed, and from them to Olivier's worn face, and he could see him struggling there in the darkness. Leave it, he said. Why do you stay? Olivier shrugged his shoulders and replied carelessly, It doesn't matter where I live. Heavy footsteps padded across the floor above them. In the room below, a shrill argument was toward and always, without ceasing, the walls were shaken by the rumbling of the buses in the street. And the house, Christophe went on, the house reeking of filth, the hot dirtiness of it all, the shameful poverty, how can you bring yourself to come back to it night after night? Don't you lose heart with it all? I couldn't live in it for a moment. I'd rather sleep under an arch. Yes, I felt all that at first, and suffered. I was just as disgusted as you are. When I went for walks as a boy, the mere sight of some of the crowded, dirty streets made me ill. They gave me all sorts of fantastic horrors which I dared not speak of. I used to think, if there were an earthquake now, I should be dead and stay here for ever and ever. And that seemed to me the most appalling thing that could happen. I never thought that one day I should live in one of them of my own free will, and that in all probability I shall die there. And then it became easier to put up with. It had to. It still revolts me, but I try not to think of it. When I climb the stairs, I close my eyes and stop my ears and hold my nose and shut off all my senses and withdraw utterly into myself, and then, over the roof there, I can see the tops of the branches of an acacia. I sit here in this corner so that I don't see anything else, and in the evening when the wind rustles through them, I fancy that I'm far away from Paris, and the mighty roar of a forest has never seemed so sweet to me as the gentle murmuring of those few frail leaves at certain moments. Yes, said Christophe, I have no doubt that you are always dreaming, but it's all wrong to waste your fancy in such a struggle against the sordid things of life when you might be using it in the creation of other lives. Isn't it the common lot? Don't you yourself waste energy in anger and bitter struggles? That's not the same thing. It's natural to me, what I was born for. Look at my arms and hands. Fighting is the breath of life to me, but you haven't any too much strength. That's obvious. Olivier looked sadly down at his thin wrists and said, Yes, I am weak. I always have been. But what can I do? One must live. How do you make your living? I teach. Teach what? Everything. Latin, Greek, history. I coach for degrees, and I lecture on moral philosophy at the municipal school. Lecture on what? Moral philosophy? What in thunder is that? Do they teach morality in French schools? Olivier smiled. Of course. Is there enough in it to keep you talking for ten minutes? I have to lecture for twelve hours a week. Do you teach them to do evil, then? What do you mean? There's no need for so much talk to find out what good is. Or to leave it undiscovered, either. Good gracious, yes, leave it undiscovered. There are worse ways of doing good than knowing nothing about it. Good isn't a matter of knowledge, it's a matter of action. It's only your neurasthenics who go haggling about morality, and the first of all moral laws is not to be neurasthenic. Rotten pedants, they are like cripples teaching people how to walk. But they don't do their talking for such as you. You know, but there are so many who do not know. Well, let them crawl like children until they learn how to walk by themselves, but whether they go on two legs or on all fours, the first thing, the only thing you can ask, is that they should walk somehow. He was prowling round and round and up and down the room, though less than four strides took him across it. He stopped in front of the piano, opened it, turned over the pages of some music, touched the keys, and said, Play me something. Olivier started. I, he said, what an idea. Madame Roussin told me you were a good musician. Come, play me something. With you listening? Oh, he said, I should die. The sincerity and simplicity with which he spoke made Christophe laugh. Olivier, too, though rather bashfully. Well, said Christophe, is that a reason for a Frenchman? 
Olivier still drew back. But why, why do you want me to? I'll tell you presently. Play. What? Anything you like. Olivier sat down at the piano with a sigh, and obedient to the imperious will of the friend who had sought him out, he began to play the beautiful adagio in B minor of Mozart. At first his fingers trembled so that he could hardly make them press down the keys, but he regained courage little by little, and while he thought he was but repeating Mozart's utterance, he unwittingly revealed his inmost heart. Music is an indiscreet confidant. It betrays the most secret thoughts of its lovers to those who love it. Through the godlike scheme of the adagio of Mozart, Christophe could perceive the invisible lines of the character, not of Mozart, but of his new friend sitting there by the piano, the serene melancholy, the timid, tender smile of the boy, so nervous, so pure, so full of love, so ready to blush. But he had hardly reached the end of the air, the topmost point where the melody of sorrowful love ascends and snaps, when a sudden irrepressible feeling of shame and modesty overcame Olivier, so that he could not go on. His fingers would not move, and his voice failed him. His hands fell by his side, and he said, I can't play any more. Christophe was standing behind him, and he stooped and reached over him and finished the broken melody. Then he said, Now I know the music of your soul. He held his hands and stayed for a long time gazing into his face. At last he said, How queer it is. I have seen you before. I know you so well, and I have known you so long. Olivier's lips trembled. He was on the point of speaking, but he said nothing. Christophe went on gazing at him for a moment or two longer. Then he smiled and said no more, and went away. He went down the stairs with his heart filled with joy. He passed two ugly children going up, one with bread, the other with a bottle of oil. He pinched their cheeks jovially. He smiled at the scowling porter. When he reached the street, he walked along, humming to himself until he came to the Luxembourg. He laid down on a seat in the shade and closed his eyes. The air was still and heavy. There were only a few passers-by. Very faintly he could hear the irregular trickling of the fountain, and every now and then the scrunching of the gravel as footsteps passed him by. Christophe was overcome with drowsiness, and he lay basking like a lizard in the sun. His face had been out of the shadow of the trees for some time, but he could not bring himself to stir. His thoughts wound about and about. He made no attempt to hold and fix them. They were all steeped in the light of happiness. The Luxembourg clock struck. He did not listen to it. But a moment later he thought it must have been striking twelve. He jumped up to realize that he'd been lounging for a couple of hours, had missed an appointment with Hecht, and wasted the whole morning. He laughed and went home whistling. He composed a rondo in canon on the cry of a peddler. Even sad melodies now took on the charm of the gladness that was in him. As he passed the laundry in his street as usual, he glanced into the shop and saw the little red-haired girl, with her dull complexion flushed with the heat, and she was ironing with her thin arms bare to the shoulder and her bodice open at the neck, and as usual she ogled him brazenly. For the first time he was not irritated by her eyes meeting his. He laughed once more. When he reached his room he was free of all the obsessions from which he had suffered. He flung his hat, coat, and vest in different directions, and sat down to work with an all-conquering zest. He gathered together all his scattered scraps of music which were lying all over the room, but his mind was not in his work. He only read the script with his eyes, and a few minutes later he fell back into the happy somnolence that had been upon him in the Luxembourg Gardens. His head buzzed, and he could not think. Twice or thrice he became aware of his condition, and tried to shake it off, but in vain. He swore light-heartedly, got up, and dipped his head in a basin of cold water. That sobered him a little. He sat down at the table again, sat in silence, and smiled dreamily. He was wondering, what is the difference between that and love? Instinctively he'd begun to think in whispers as though he were ashamed. He shrugged his shoulders. There are not two ways of loving, or rather... Yes, there are two ways. There is the way of those who love with every fibre of their being, and the way of those who only give to love a part of their superfluous energy. God keep me from such cowardice of heart. He stopped in his thought, from a sort of shame and dread of following it any further. He sat for a long time, smiling at his inward dreams. His heart sang through the silence. 
du bist mein, und nun ist das meine, meiner als jemals. Thou art mine, and now I am mine, more mine than I have ever been. He took a sheet of paper and with tranquil ease wrote down the song that was in his heart. They decided to take rooms together. Christophe wanted to take possession at once without worrying about the waste of half a quarter. Olivier was more prudent, though not less ardent in their friendship, and thought it better to wait until their respective tenancies had expired. Christophe could not understand such parsimony. Like many people who have no money, he never worried about losing it. He imagined that Olivier was even worse off than himself. One day, when his friend's poverty had been brought home to him, he left him suddenly and returned a few hours later in triumph with a few francs which he had squeezed in advance out of Hecht. Olivier blushed and refused. Christophe was put out and made to throw them to an Italian who was playing in the yard. Olivier withheld him. Christophe went away, apparently offended, but really furious with his own clumsiness to which he attributed Olivier's refusal. A letter from his friend brought balm to his wounds. Olivier could write what he could not express by word of mouth. He could tell of his happiness in knowing him and how touched he was by Christophe's offer of assistance. Christophe replied with a crazy wild letter, rather like those which he wrote when he was fifteen to his friend Otto. It was full of gemut and blundering jokes. He made puns in French and German, and even translated them into music. At last they went into their rooms, in the Montparnasse quarter, near the Place d'Enfer. On the fifth floor of an old house they had found a flat of three rooms and a kitchen, all very small, and looking on to a tiny garden enclosed by four high walls. From their windows they looked out over the opposite wall, which was lower than the rest, on to one of those large convent gardens which are still to be found in Paris hidden and unknown. Not a soul was to be seen in the deserted avenues. The old trees, taller and more leafy than those in the Luxembourg gardens, trembled in the sunlight. Troops of birds sang. In the early dawn the blackbirds fluted, and then there came the riotously rhythmic chorus of the sparrows, and in summer in the evening the rapturous cries of the swifts, cleaving the luminous air and skimming through the heavens, and at night under the moon like bubbles of air mounting to the surface of a pond, there came up the pearly notes of the toads. Almost they might have forgotten the surrounding presence of Paris, but that the old house was perpetually shaken by the heavy vehicles rumbling by, as though the earth beneath were shivering in a fever. One of the rooms was larger and finer than the rest, and there was a struggle between the friends as to who should not have it. They had to toss for it, and Christophe, who had made the suggestion, contrived not to win, with the dexterity of which he found it hard to believe himself capable. End of section 28, read by Sandra, near Montreal. Section 29 of Jean-Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canin. The House, Chapter 1, Part 2. Then for the two of them there began a period of absolute happiness. Their happiness lay not in any one thing, but in all things at once. Their every thought, their every act, were steeped in it, and it never left them for a moment. During this honeymoon of their friendship, the first days of deep and silent rejoicing known only to him who in all the universe can call one soul his own. Ja, wer auch nur eine Seele sein nennt auf dem Erdenrund. They hardly spoke to each other. They dared hardly breathe a word. It was enough for them to feel each other's nearness, to exchange a look, a word in token that their thoughts, after long periods of silence, still ran in the same channel without probing or inquiring, without even looking at each other, yet unceasingly they watched each other. Unconsciously the lover takes for a model the soul of the beloved. So great is his desire to give no hurt, to be in all things as the beloved, that with mysterious and sudden intuition he marks the imperceptible movements in the depths of his soul. One friend to another is crystal clear. They exchange entities. Their features are assimilated. Soul imitates soul, until that day comes when deep-moving force, the spirit of the race, bursts his bonds, and rends asunder the web of love in which he is held captive. 
Christophe spoke in low tones, walked softly, tried hard to make no noise in his room, which was next to that of the silent Olivier. He was transfigured by his friendship. He had an expression of happiness, confidence, youth, such as he had never worn before. He adored Olivier. It would have been easy for the boy to abuse his power if he had not been so timorous in feeling that it was a happiness undeserved, for he thought himself much inferior to Christophe, who in his turn was no less humble. This mutual humility, the product of their great love for each other, was an added joy. It was a pure delight, even with the consciousness of unworthiness, for each to feel that he filled so great a room in the heart of his friend. Each to other they were tender and filled with gratitude. Olivier had mixed his books with Christophe's. They made no distinction. When he spoke of them he did not say my book, but our book. He kept back only a few things from the common stock, those which had belonged to his sister or were bound up with her memory. With the quick perception of love, Christophe was not slow to notice this, but he did not know the reason of it. He had never dared to ask Olivier about his family. He only knew that Olivier had lost his parents, and to the somewhat proud reserve of his affection, which forbade his prying into his friend's secrets, there was added a fear of calling to life in him the sorrows of the past. Though he might long to do so, yet he was strangely timid, and never dared to look closely at the photographs on Olivier's desk, portraits of a lady and a gentleman stiffly posed, and a little girl of twelve with a great spaniel at her feet. A few months after they had taken up their quarters, Olivier caught cold and had to stay in bed. Christophe, who had become quite motherly, nursed him with fond anxiety, and the doctor, who on examining Olivier had found a little inflammation at the top of the lungs, told Christophe to smear the invalid's chest with a tincture of iodine. As Christophe was gravely acquitting himself of the task, he saw a confirmation medal hanging from Olivier's neck. He was familiar enough with Olivier to know that he was even more emancipated in matters of religion than himself. He could not refrain from showing his surprise. Olivier coloured and said, "'It is a souvenir. My poor sister Antoinette was wearing it when she died.' Christophe trembled. The name of Antoinette struck him like a flash of lightning. "'Antoinette,' he said. "'My sister,' said Olivier. Christophe repeated, "'Antoinette, Antoinette Jeannin. She was your sister? But, he said as he looked at the photograph on the desk, she was quite a child when you lost her. Olivier smiled sadly. It is a photograph of her as a child, he said. Alas, I have no other. She was twenty-five when she left me. Ah, said Christophe, who was greatly moved, and she was in Germany, was she not? Olivier nodded. Christophe took Olivier's hands in his. I knew her, he said. "'Yes, I know,' replied Olivier, and he flung his arms around Christophe's neck. "'Poor girl! Poor girl!' said Christophe over and over again. They were both in tears. Christophe remembered then that Olivier was ill. He tried to calm him and made him keep his arms inside the bed and tucked the clothes up round his shoulders and dried his eyes for him and then sat down by the bedside and looked long at him. "'You see,' he said, "'that is how I knew you.' I recognized you at once that first evening. It were hard to tell whether he was speaking of the present or the absent friend. But, he went on a moment later, you knew? Why didn't you tell me? And through Olivier's eyes, Antoinette replied, I could not tell you. You had to see it for yourself. They said nothing for some time. Then in the silence of the night, Olivier, lying still in bed, in a low voice, told Christophe, who held his hand, poor Antoinette's story. But he did not tell him what he had no right to tell, the secret that she had kept locked, the secret that perhaps Christophe knew already without needing to be told. From that time on, the soul of Antoinette was ever near them. When they were together, she was with them. They had no need to think of her. Every thought they shared was shared with her, too. Her love was the meeting place wherein their two hearts were united. Often Olivier would conjure up the image of her, scraps of memory and brief anecdotes. In their fleeting light they gave a glimpse of her shy, gracious gestures, her grave young smile, the pensive, wistful grace that was so natural to her. Christophe would listen without a word and let the light of the unseen friend pierce to his very soul. In obedience to the law of his own nature, which everywhere and always drank in life more greedily than any other, 
He would sometimes hear in Olivier's words depths of sound which Olivier himself could not hear, and more than Olivier he would assimilate the essence of the girl who was dead. Instinctively he supplied her place in Olivier's life, and it was a touching sight to see the awkward German hap unwittingly on certain of the delicate attentions and little mothering ways of Antoinette. Sometimes he could not tell whether it was Olivier that he loved in Antoinette, or Antoinette in Olivier. Sometimes, on a tender impulse, without saying anything, he would go and visit Antoinette's grave and lay flowers on it. It was some time before Olivier had any idea of it. He did not discover it until one day when he found fresh flowers on the grave, but he had some difficulty in proving that it was Christophe who had laid them there. When he tried bashfully to speak about it, Christophe cut him short roughly and abruptly. He did not want Olivier to know, and he stuck to it until one day, when they met in the cemetery at Ivoli. Olivier, on his part, used to write to Christophe's mother without letting him know. He gave Louisa news of her son, and told her how fond he was of him and how he admired him. Louisa would send Olivier awkward, humble letters in which she thanked him profusely. She used always to write of her son as though he were a little boy. After a period of fond semi-silence, a delicious time of peace and enjoyment without knowing why, their tongues were loosed. They spent hours in voyages of discovery, each in the other's soul. They were very different, but they were both pure metal. They loved each other because they were so different, though so much the same. Olivier was weak, delicate, incapable of fighting against difficulties. When he came up against an obstacle, he drew back, not from fear, but something from timidity, and more from disgust with the brutal and coarse means he would have to employ to overcome it. He earned his living by giving classes and writing art books, shamefully underpaid as usual, and occasionally articles for reviews, in which he never had a free hand, and had to deal with subjects in which he was not greatly interested. There was no demand for the things that did interest him. He was never asked for the sort of thing he could do best. He was a poet, and was asked for criticism. He knew something about music, and he had to write about painting. He knew quite well that he could only say mediocre things, which was just what people liked, for there he could speak to mediocre minds in a language which they could understand. He grew disgusted with it all, and refused to write. He had no pleasure except in writing for certain obscure periodicals, which never paid anything, and like so many other young men, he devoted his talents to them, because they left him a free hand. Only in their pages could he publish what was worthy of publicity. He was gentle, well-mannered, seemingly patient, though he was excessively sensitive. A harsh word drew blood. Injustice overwhelmed him. He suffered both on his own account and for others. Certain crimes, committed ages ago, still had the power to rend him as though he himself had been their victim. He would go pale and shudder and be utterly miserable as he thought how wretched he must have been who suffered them, and how many ages cut him off from his sympathy. When any unjust deed was done before his eyes, he would be wild with indignation and tremble all over, and sometimes become quite ill and lose his sleep. It was because he knew his weakness that he drew on his mask of calmness, for when he was angry he knew that he went beyond all limits and was apt to say unpardonable things. People were more resentful with him than with Christophe, who was always violent, because it seemed that in moments of anger Olivier, much more than Christophe, expressed exactly what he thought, and that was true. He judged men and women without Christophe's blind exaggeration, but lucidly and without his illusions, and that is precisely what people do pardon the least readily. In such cases he would say nothing and avoid discussion, knowing its futility. He had suffered from this restraint. He had suffered more from his timidity, which sometimes led him to betray his thoughts, or deprived him of the courage to defend his thoughts conclusively, and even to apologize for them, as had happened in the argument with Lucien Le Vicar about Christophe. He had passed through many crises of despair before he had been able to strike a compromise between himself and the rest of the world. In his youth and budding manhood, when his nerves were not hopelessly out of order, he lived in a perpetual alternation of periods of exaltation and periods of depression, which came and went with horrible suddenness. Just when he was feeling most at his ease and even happy, he was very certain that sorrow was lying in wait for him, and suddenly it would lay him low without giving any warning of its coming, 
and it was not enough for him to be unhappy. He had to blame himself for his unhappiness, and hold an inquisition into his every word and deed, and his honesty, and take the side of other people against himself. His heart would throb in his bosom, he would struggle miserably, and he would scarcely be able to breathe. Since the death of Antoinette, and perhaps thanks to her, thanks to the peace-giving light that issues from the beloved dead, as the light of dawn brings refreshment to the eyes and soul of those who are sick, Olivier had contrived, if not to break away from these difficulties, at least to be resigned to them and to master them. Very few had any idea of his inward struggles. The humiliating secret was locked up in his breast. All the immoderate excitement of a weak, tormented body, surveyed serenely by a free and keen intelligence which could not master it, though it was never touched by it the central peace which endures amid the endless agitation of the heart. Christophe marked it. This was what he saw in Olivier's eyes. Olivier had an intuitive perception of the souls of men and a mind of a wide, subtle curiosity that was open to everything, denied nothing, hated nothing, and contemplated the world and things with generous sympathy. That freshness of outlook, which is a priceless gift, granting the power to taste with a heart that is always new, the eternal renewal and rebirth. In that inward universe, wherein he knew himself to be free, vast, sovereign, he could forget his physical weaknesses and agony. There was even a certain pleasure in watching from a great height, with ironic pity, that poor, suffering body, which always seemed so near the point of death, so there was no danger of his clinging to his life, and only the more passionately did he hug life itself. Olivier translated into the region of love and mind all the forces which in action he had abdicated. He had not enough vital sap to live by his own substance. He was as ivy. It was needful for him to cling. He was never so rich as when he gave himself. His was a womanish soul with its eternal need of loving and being loved. He was born for Christophe, and Christophe for him. Such are the aristocratic and charming friends who are the escorts of the great artists, and seem to have come to flower in the lives of their mighty souls. Beltraffio, the friend of Leonardo, Cavalier of Michelangelo, the gentle Umbrians, the comrades of young Raphael, Ayert van Gelder, who remained faithful to Rembrandt in his poor old age. They have not the greatness of the masters but it is as though all the purity and nobility of the masters in their friends were raised to a yet higher spiritual power. They are the ideal companions for men of genius. Their friendship was profitable to both of them. Love lends wings to the soul. The presence of the beloved friend gives all its worth to life. A man lives for his friend and for his sake defends his soul's integrity against the wearing force of time. Each enriched the other's nature. Olivier had serenity of mind and a sickly body. Christophe had a mighty strength and a stormy soul. They were in some sort like a blind man and a cripple. Now that they were together, they felt sound and strong. Living in the shadow of Christophe, Olivier recovered his joy in the light. Christophe transmitted to him something of his abounding vitality, his physical and moral robustness, which even in sorrow, even in injustice, even in hate, inclined to optimism. He took much more than he gave, in obedience to the law of genius which gives in vain, but in love always takes more than it gives, quia nominar leo, because it is genius, and genius half consists in the instinctive absorption of all that is great in its surroundings and making it greater still. The vulgar saying has it that riches go to the rich, strength goes to the strong, Christophe fed on Olivier's ideas. He impregnated himself with his intellectual calmness and mental detachment, his lofty outlook, his silent understanding and mastery of things. But when they were transplanted into him, the richer soil, the virtues of his friend grew with a new and other energy. They both marveled at the things they discovered in each other. There were so many things to share. Each brought vast treasures of which till then he had never been conscious, the moral treasure of his nation, Olivier, the wide culture and the psychological genius of France, Christophe, the innate music of Germany and his intuitive knowledge of nature. Christophe could not understand how Olivier could be a Frenchman. His friend was so little like all the Frenchmen he had met. 
Before he found Olivier, he had not been far from taking Lucien Lévicard as a type of the modern French mind. Lévicard was no more than the caricature of it, and now, through Olivier, he saw that there might be in Paris minds just as free, more free indeed, than that of Lucien Lévicard, men who remained as pure and stoical as any in Europe. Christophe tried to prove to Olivier that he and his sister could not be altogether French. "'My poor dear fellow,' said Olivier, "'what do you know of France?' Christophe avowed the trouble he had taken to gain some knowledge of the country. He drew up a list of all the Frenchmen he'd met in the circle of the Stevens and the Roussins, Jews, Belgians, Luxembourgers, Americans, Russians, Levantines, and here and there a few authentic Frenchmen. "'Just what I was saying,' replied Olivier. You haven't seen a single Frenchman, a group of debauchees, a few beasts of pleasure who are not even French, men about town, politicians, useless creatures, all the fuss and flummery which passes over and above the life of the nation, without even touching it. You have only seen the swarms of wasps, attracted by a fine autumn, and the rich meadows. You haven't noticed the busy hives, the industrious city, the thirst for knowledge. I beg pardon, said Christophe. I've come across your intellectual elite as well. What? A few dozen men of letters? They're a fine lot. Nowadays, when science and action play so great a part, literature has become superficial, no more than the bed where the thought of the people sleeps. And in literature you have only come across a theatre, the theatre of luxury, an international kitchen where dishes are turned out for the wealthy customers of the cosmopolitan hotels. The theatres of Paris... Do you think a working man even knows what is being done in them? Pasteur did not go to them ten times in all his life. Like all foreigners, you attach an exaggerated importance to our novels, and our boulevard plays, and the intrigues of our politicians. If you like, I will show you women who never read novels, girls in Paris who have never been to the theatre, men who have never bothered their heads about politics. Yes, even among our intellectuals. You have not come across either our men of science or our poets. You have not discovered the solitary artists who languish in silence, nor the burning flame of our revolutionaries. You have not seen a single great believer or a single great skeptic. As for the people, we won't talk of them. Outside the poor woman who looked after you, what do you know of them? Where have you had a chance of seeing them? How many Parisians have you met who have lived higher than the second or third floor? If you do not know these people, you do not know France. You know nothing of the brave true hearts, the men and women living in poor lodgings in the garrets of Paris, in the dumb provinces, men and women who through a dull drab life think grave thoughts and live in a daily sacrifice, the little church which has always existed in France, small in numbers, great in spirit, almost unknown, having no outward or apparent force of action, though it is the very force of France, that might which endures in silence while the so-called elite rots away and springs to life again unceasingly. You are amazed when you find a Frenchman who lives not for the sake of happiness, happiness at all costs, but to accomplish or to serve his faith? There are thousands of men like myself, men more worthy than myself, more pious, more humble, men who to their dying day live unfailingly to serve an ideal, a God who vouchsafes them no reply. You know nothing of the thrifty, methodical, industrious, tranquil middle class living with a quenchless, dormant flame in their hearts, the people betrayed and sacrificed who in all days defended my country against the selfish arrogance of the great, the blue-eyed, ancient race of Vauban. You do not know the people. You do not know the elite. Have you read a single one of the books which are our faithful friends, the companions who support us in our lives? Do you even know of the existence of our young reviews in which such great faith and devotion are expressed? Have you any idea of the men of moral might and worth who are as the sun to us, the sun whose voiceless light strikes terror to the army of the hypocrites? They dare not make a frontal attack. They bow before them, the better to betray them. The hypocrite is a slave, and there is no slave, but he has a master. You know only the slaves. You know nothing of the masters. 
You have watched our struggles, and they have seemed to you brutish and unmeaning because you have not understood their aim. You see the shadow, the reflected light of day. You have never seen the inward day, our age-old immemorial spirit. Have you ever tried to perceive it? Have you ever heard of our heroic deeds from the Crusades to the Commune? Have you ever seen and felt the tragedy of the French spirit? Have you ever stood at the brink of the abyss of Pascal? How dare you slander a people who for more than a thousand years have been living in action and creation, a people that has graven the world in its own image through Gothic art, and the seventeenth century, and the revolution, a people that has twenty times passed through the ordeal of fire and plunged into it again, and twenty times has come to life again, and never yet has perished? You are all the same. All your countrymen who come among us see only the parasites who suck our blood, literary, political, and financial adventurers, with their minions and their hangers-on and their harlots, and they judge France by these wretched creatures who prey on her. Not one of you has any idea of the real France living under oppression, or of the reserve of vitality in the French provinces, or of the great mass of the people who go on working heedless of the uproar and pother made by their masters of a day. Yes, it is only natural that you should know nothing of all this. I do not blame you. How could you? Why, France is hardly at all known to the French. The best of us are bound down and held captive to our native soil. No one will ever know all that we have suffered. We who have guarded as a sacred charge the light in our hearts which we have received from the genius of our race, to which we cling with all our might, desperately defending it against the hostile winds that strive blusteringly to snuff it out. We are alone, and in our nostrils stinks the pestilential atmosphere of these harpies who have swarmed about our genius like a thick cloud of flies, whose hideous grubs gnaw at our minds and defile our hearts. We are betrayed by those whose duty it is to defend us, our leaders, our idiotic and cowardly critics, who fawn upon the enemy to win pardon for being of our race. We are deserted by the people who give no thought to us and do not even know of our existence. By what means can we make ourselves known to them? We cannot reach them. Ah, that is the hardest thing of all. We know that there are thousands of men in France who all think as we do. We know that we speak in their name, and we cannot gain a hearing. Everything is in the hands of the enemy. Newspapers, reviews, theatres. The press scurries away from ideas or admits them only as an instrument of pleasure or a party weapon. The cliques and cutteries will only suffer us to break through on condition that we degrade ourselves. We are crushed by poverty and overwork. The politicians pursuing nothing but wealth, are only interested in that section of the public which they can buy. The middle class is selfish and indifferent and unmoved sees us perish. The people know nothing of our existence, even those who are fighting the same fight like us, are cut off by silence and do not know that we exist, and we do not know that they exist. Ill-omened Paris. No doubt good also has come of it, by gathering together all the forces of the French mind and genius, but the evil it has done is at least equal to the good, and in a time like the present the good quickly turns to evil. A pseudo-elite fastens on Paris and blows the loud trumpet of publicity, and the voices of all the rest of France are drowned. More than that, France herself is deceived by it. She's scared and silent, and fearfully locks away her own ideas— there was a time when it hurt me dreadfully, but now, Christophe, I can bear it calmly. I know and understand my own strength and the might of my people. We must wait until the flood dies down. It cannot touch or change the bedrock of France. I will make you feel that bedrock under the mud that is borne onward by the flood. And even now, here and there, there are lofty peaks appearing above the waters." Christophe discovered the mighty power of idealism which animated the French poets, musicians, and men of science of his time, while the temporary masters of the country with their coarse sensuality drowned the voice of the French genius. It showed itself too aristocratic to vie with the presumptuous shouts of the rabble, and sang on with burning ardour in its own praise and the praise of its god. It was as though in its desire to escape the revolting uproar of the outer world— 
it had withdrawn to the farthest refuge in the innermost depths of its castle keep. The poets, that is, those only who were worthy of that splendid name, so bandied by the press and the academies and doled out to divers windbags, greedy of money and flattery, the poets, despising impudent rhetoric and that slavish realism which nibbles at the surface of things without penetrating to reality, had entrenched themselves in the very centre of the soul, in a mystic vision into which was drawn the universe of form and idea, like a torrent falling into a lake, there to take on the colour of the inward life, the very intensity of this idealism, which withdrew into itself to recreate the universe, made it inaccessible to the mob. Christophe himself did not understand it at first. The transition was too abrupt after the marketplace. It was as though he had passed from a furious Russian scramble in the hot sunlight into silence and the night. His ears buzzed. He could see nothing. At first, with his ardent love of life, he was shocked by the contrast. Outside was the roaring of the rushing streams of passion overturning France and stirring all humanity, and at the first glance there was not a trace of it in this art of theirs. Christophe asked Olivier, You have been lifted to the stars and hurled down to the depths of hell by your Dreyfus affair. Where is the poet in whose soul the height and depth of it were felt? Now, at this very moment, in the souls of your religious men and women, there is the mightiest struggle there has been for centuries between the authority of the Church and the rights of conscience. Where is the poet in whose soul this sacred agony is reflected? The working classes are preparing for war. Nations are dying. Nations are springing to new life. The Armenians are massacred. Asia, awaking from its sleep of a thousand years, hurls down the Muscovite colossus, the keeper of the keys of Europe. Turkey, like Adam, opens its eyes on the light of day. The air is conquered by man. The old earth cracks under our feet and opens. It devours a whole people. All these prodigies accomplished in twenty years, enough to supply material for twenty Iliads. But where are they? Where shall their fiery traces be found in the books of your poets? Are they, of all men, unable to see the poetry of the world? Patience, my friend, patience, replied Olivier. Be silent. Say nothing. Listen. Slowly the creaking of the axle tree of the world died away, and the rumbling over the stones of the heavy car of action was lost in the distance, and there arose the divine song of silence the hum of bees and the perfume of the limes, the wind with his golden lips kissing the earth of the plains, the soft sound of the rain and the scent of the roses. There rang out the hammer and chisel of the poets carving the sides of a vase with the fine majesty of simple things, solemn, joyous life, with its flutes of gold and flutes of ebony. Religious joy, faith welling up like a fountain of souls, for whom the very darkness is clear, and great sweet sorrow giving comfort and smiling, with her austere face from which there shines a clearness beyond nature, and death serene with her great soft eyes. A symphony of harmonious and pure voices, not one of them had the full sonorousness of such national trumpets as were Corneille and Hugo, but how much deeper and more subtle in expression was their music, the richest music in Europe of today. Olivia said to Christophe, who was silent, Do you understand now? Christophe, in his turn, bade him be silent. In spite of himself, and although he preferred more manly music, yet he drank in the murmuring of the woods and fountains of the soul which came whispering to his ears. Amid the passing struggles of the nations they sang the eternal youth of the world, the sweet goodness of beauty, while humanity, screaming with terror and yelping its complaint, marched round and round a barren, gloomy field, while millions of men and women wore themselves out in wrangling for the bloody rags of liberty. The fountains and the woods sang on, Free! Free! 
Sanctus, Sanctus. And yet they slept not in any dream selfishly serene. In the choir of the poets there were not wanting tragic voices, voices of pride, voices of love, voices of agony. A blind hurricane, mad, intoxicated with its own rough force or gentleness, profound. Tumultuous forces, the epic of the illusions of those who sing the wild fever of the crowd, the conflicts of human gods, the breathless toilers, faces inky black and golden, peering through darkness and mist, muscular backs stretching or suddenly crouching round mighty furnaces and gigantic anvils, forging the city of the future. In the flickering light and shadow falling on the glaciers of the mind, there was the heroic bitterness of those solitary souls which devour themselves with desperate joy. End of section 29, read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2022. Section 30 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canin. The House, Chapter 1, Part 3. Many of the characteristics of these idealists seemed to the German more German than French, but all of them had the love for the fine speech of France, and the sap of the myths of Greece ran through their poetry. Scenes of France and daily life were by some hidden magic transformed in their eyes into visions of Attica. It was as though antique souls had come to life again in these twentieth-century Frenchmen, and longed to fling off their modern garments to appear again in their lovely nakedness. Their poetry as a whole gave out the perfume of a rich civilization that has ripened through the ages, a perfume such as could not be found anywhere else in Europe. It were impossible to forget it once it had been breathed. It attracted foreign artists from every country in the world. They became French poets almost bigotedly French, and French classical art had no more fervent disciples than these Anglo-Saxons and Flemings and Greeks. Christophe, under Olivier's guidance, was impregnated with the pensive beauty of the muse of France, while in his heart he found the aristocratic lady a little too intellectual for his liking, and preferred a pretty girl of the people, simple, healthy, robust, who thinks and argues less, but is more concerned with love. The same odeur de bellezza arose from all French art, as the scent of ripe strawberries and raspberries ascends from autumn woods warmed by the sun. French music was like one of those little strawberry plants hidden in the grass, the scent of which sweetens all the air of the woods. At first Christophe had passed it by without seeing it, for in his own country he had been used to whole thickets of music, much fuller and bearing more brilliant fruits, but now the delicate perfume made him turn. With Olivier's help among the stones and brambles and dead leaves which usurped the name of music, he discovered the subtle and ingenuous art of a handful of musicians. Amid the marshy fields and the factory chimneys of democracy, in the heart of the Plaine Saint-Denis, in a little magic wood, fawns were dancing blithely. Christophe was amazed to hear the ironic and serene notes of their flutes, which were like nothing he had ever heard. A little reed sufficed for me to make the tall grass quiver, and all the meadow, the willows, sweet, and the singing stream also, a little reed, sufficed for me to make the forest sing. Beneath the careless grace and the seeming dilettantism of their little piano pieces and songs, and French chamber music which German art never deigned to notice, while Christophe himself had hitherto failed to see the poetic accomplishment of it all, he now began to see the fever of renovation and the uneasiness, unknown on the other side of the Rhine, with which French musicians were seeking in the unfulfilled fields of their art the germs from which the future might grow. While German musicians sat stolidly in the encampments of their forebears and arrogantly claimed to stay the evolution of the world at the barrier of their past victories, the world was moving onwards, and in the van the French plunged onward to discovery. They explored the distant realms of art, 
dead suns and suns lit up once more and vanished greece and the far east after its age-long slumber once more opening its slanting eyes full of vasty dreams upon the light of day in the music of the west run off into channels by the genius of order and classic reason they opened up the sluices of the ancient fashions into their versailles pools they turned all the waters of the universe popular melodies and rhythms exotic and antique scales new or old beats and intervals just as before them the impressionist painters had opened up a new world to the eyes christopher columbus as of light so the musicians were rushing on to the conquest of the world of sound they pressed on into mysterious recesses of the world of hearing they discovered new lands in that inward ocean it was more than probable that they would do nothing with their conquests as usual the french were the harbingers of the world christophe admired the initiative of their music born of yesterday and already marching in the van of art what valiance there was in the elegant tiny little creature he found indulgence for the follies that he had lately seen in her only those who attempt nothing never make mistakes but error struggling on towards the living truth is more fruitful and more blessed than dead truth whatever the results the effort was amazing olivier showed christophe the work done in the last thirty-five years and the amount of energy expended in raising french music from the void in which it had slumbered before eighteen seventy no symphonic school no profound culture no traditions no masters no public the whole reduced to poor Bellios, who died of suffocation and weariness and now christophe felt a great respect for those who had been the labourers in the national revival he had no desire now to jeer at their aesthetic narrowness or their lack of genius they had created something much greater than music a musical people among all the great toilers who had forged the new french music one man was especially dear to him cesar franck who died without seeing the victory for which he had paved the way and yet like old schutz through the darkest years of french art had preserved intact the treasure of his faith and the genius of his race it was a moving thing to see amid pleasure-seeking paris the angelic master the saint of music in a life of poverty and work despised preserving the unimpeachable serenity of his patient soul whose smile of resignation lit up his music in which is such great goodness to christophe knowing nothing of the depths of the life of france this great artist adhering to his faith in the midst of a country of atheists was a phenomenon almost a miracle but olivier would gently shrug his shoulders and ask if any other country in europe could show a painter so wholly steeped in the spirit of the bible as francois millet a man of science more filled with burning faith and humility than the clear-sighted pasteur bowing down before the idea of the infinite and when that idea possessed his mind in bitter agony as he himself has said praying that his reason might be spared so near it was to toppling over into the sublime madness of pascal their deep-rooted catholicism was no more a bar in the way of the heroic realism of the first of these two men than of the passionate reason of the other who sure of foot and not deviating by one step went his way through the circles of elementary nature the great night of the infinitely little the ultimate abysses of creation in which life is born it was among the people of the provinces from which they sprang that they had found this faith which is for ever brooding on the soil of france while in vain do windy demagogues struggle to deny it olivier knew well that faith it had lived in his own heart and mind he revealed to Christophe the magnificent movement towards a Catholic revival, which had been going on for the last twenty-five years, the mighty effort of the Christian idea in France to wed reason, liberty, and life, the splendid priests who had the courage, as one of their number said, to have themselves baptized as men, and were claiming for Catholicism the right to understand everything and to join in every honest idea, for every honest idea, even when it is mistaken, is sacred and divine the thousands of young catholics banded by the generous vow to build a christian republic free pure in brotherhood open to all men of good will and in spite of the odious attacks the accusations of heresy the treachery on all sides right and left especially on the right 
which these great Christians had to suffer, the intrepid little legion advancing towards the rugged defile which leads to the future, serene of front, resigned to all trials and tribulations, knowing that no enduring edifice can be built except it be welded together with tears and blood. The same breath of living idealism and passionate liberalism brought new life to the other religions in France. The vast, slumbering bodies of Protestantism and Judaism were thrilling with new life. All in generous emulation had set themselves to create the religion of a free humanity, which should sacrifice neither its power for reason nor its power for enthusiasm. This religious exaltation was not the privilege of the religious. It was the very soul of the revolutionary movement. There it assumed a tragic character. Till now Christoph had only seen the lowest form of socialism, that of the politicians who dangled in front of the eyes of their famished constituents the coarse and childish dreams of happiness, or, to be frank, of universal pleasure, which science in the hands of power could, according to them, procure. Against such revolting optimism, Christoph saw the furious mystic reaction of the elite arise to lead the syndicates of the working classes on to battle. It was a summons to war which engenders the sublime, to heroic war, which alone can give the dying worlds a goal, an aim, an ideal. These great revolutionaries, spitting out such bourgeois, peddling, peacemongering English socialism, set up against it a tragic conception of the universe, whose law is antagonism, since it lives by sacrifice, perpetual sacrifice, eternally renewed. If there was reason to doubt that the army, which these leaders urged on to the assault upon the old world, could understand such warlike mysticism which applied both Kant and Nietzsche to violent action, Nevertheless, it was a stirring sight to see the revolutionary aristocracy, whose blind pessimism and furious desire for heroic life and exalted faith in war and sacrifice were like the militant religious ideal of some Teutonic order or the Japanese samurai. And yet they were all Frenchmen. They were of a French stock whose characteristics have endured unchanged for centuries. Seeing with Olivier's eyes, Christophe marked them in the tribunes and proconsuls of the convention, in certain of the thinkers and men of action and French reformers of the Ancien Regime, Calvinists, Jansenists, Jacobins, Syndicalists, in all there was the same spirit of pessimistic idealism, struggling against nature, without illusions and without loss of courage the iron bands which uphold the nation. Christophe drank in the breath of these mystic struggles, and he began to understand the greatness of that fanaticism into which France brought uncompromising faith and honesty, such as were absolutely unknown to other nations more familiar with combinazioni. Like all foreigners, it had pleased him at first to be flippant about the only too obvious contradiction between the despotic temper of the French and the magic formula which their republic wrote up on the walls of their buildings. Now, for the first time, he began to grasp the meaning of the bellicose liberty which they adored as the terrible sword of reason. No, it was not for them, as he had thought, mere-sounding rhetoric and vague ideology. Among a people for whom the demands of reason transcend all others, the fight for reason dominated every other. What did it matter whether the fight appeared absurd to nations who called themselves practical? To eyes that see deeply, it is no less vain to fight for empire, or money, or the conquest of the world. In a million years there will be nothing left of any of these things. But if it is the fierceness of the fight that gives its worth to life— and uplifts all the living forces to the point of sacrifice to a superior being, then there are few struggles that do more honor life than the eternal battle waged in France for or against reason. And for those who have tasted the bitter savor of it, the much-vaunted apathetic tolerance of the Anglo-Saxons is dull and unmanly. The Anglo-Saxons paid for it by finding elsewhere an outlet for their energy, their energy is not in their tolerance, which is only great when between factions it becomes heroism. In Europe of today, it is most often indifference, want of faith, want of vitality. The English, adapting a saying of Voltaire, are fain to boast that diversity of belief has produced more tolerance in England than the revolution has done in France. The reason is that there is more faith in the France of the revolution than in all the creeds of England. 
from the circle of brass of militant idealism and the battles of reason like virgil leading dante olivier led christophe by the hand to the summit of the mountain where silent and serene dwelt the small band of the elect of france who really were free nowhere in the world are there men more free they have the serenity of a bird soaring in the still air on such a height the air was so pure and rarefied that christophe could hardly breathe there he met artists who claimed the absolute and limitless liberty of dreams men of unbridled subjectivity like flaubert despising the poor beasts who believe in the reality of things thinkers who with supple and many-sided minds emulating the endless flow of moving things went on ceaselessly trickling and flowing staying nowhere nowhere coming in contact with stubborn earth or rock and depicted not the essence of life but the passage as montaigne said the eternal passage from day to day from minute to minute men of science who knew the emptiness and void of the universe wherein man has builded his idea his god his art his science and went on creating the world and its laws that vivid day's dream they did not demand of science either rest or happiness or even truth for they doubted whether it were attainable they loved it for itself because it was beautiful because it alone was beautiful and it alone was real on the topmost pinnacles of thought these men of science passionately pyrrhonistic indifferent to all suffering all deceit almost indifferent to reality listened with closed eyes to the silent music of souls the delicate and grand harmony of numbers and forms these great mathematicians these free philosophers the most rigorous and positive minds in the world had reached the uttermost limit of mystic ecstasy they created a void about themselves they hung over the abyss they were drunk with its dizzy depths into the boundless night with joy sublime they flashed the lightnings of thought christophe leaned forward and tried to look over as they did and his head swam he who thought himself free because he had broken away from all laws save those of his own conscience now became fearfully conscious of how little he was free compared with these frenchmen who were emancipated from every absolute law of mind from every categorical imperative from every reason for living why then did they live for the joy of being free replied olivier but Christophe, who was unsteadied by such liberty, thought regretfully of the mighty spirit of discipline and German authoritarianism, and he said, Your joy is a snare, the dream of an opium smoker. You make yourselves drunk with liberty and forget life. Absolute liberty means madness to the mind, anarchy to the state. Liberty. What man is free in this world? What man in your republic is free? Only the knaves. You, the best of the nation, are stilled. You can do nothing but dream. Soon you will not be able even to dream. No matter, said Olivier. My poor dear Christophe, you cannot know the delight of being free. It is worth while paying for it with so much danger and suffering, and even death, to be free, to feel that every mind about you, yes, even the knaves, is free, is a delicious pleasure, which it is impossible to express, it is as though your soul were soaring through the infinite air. It could not live otherwise. What should I do with the security you offer me, and your order, and your impeccable discipline, locked up in the four walls of your imperial barracks? I should die of suffocation. Air. Give me air. More and more of it. Liberty. More and more of that. There must be law in the world, replied Christophe. Sooner or later the master cometh. But Olivier laughed and reminded Christophe of the saying of old Pierre de L'Estoile. It is as little in the power of all the dominions of the earth to curb the French liberty of speech as to bury the sun in the earth or to shut it up inside a hole. End of section 30, read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2022. Section 31 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated 
by Gilbert Canin. The House, Chapter 1, Part 4 Gradually, Christophe grew accustomed to the air of boundless liberty, from the lofty heights of French thought where those minds dream that are all light, he looked down upon the slopes of the mountain at his feet, where the heroic elect, fighting for a living faith, whatever faith it might be, struggle eternally to reach the summit. Those who wage the holy war against ignorance, disease and poverty, the fever of invention, the mental delirium of the modern Prometheus and Icarus, conquering the light and marking out roads in the air, the titanic struggle between science and nature being tamed, lower down, the little silent band, the men and women of good faith, those brave and humble hearts, who after a thousand efforts have climbed halfway, and can climb no farther, being held bound in a dull and difficult existence, while in secret they burn away in obscure devotion, lower still at the foot of the mountain, in a narrow gorge between rocky crags, the endless battle, the fanatics of abstract ideas and blind instincts, fiercely wrestling, with never a suspicion that there may be something beyond, above the wall of rocks which hems them in, still lower, swamps and brutish beasts wallowing in the mire, and everywhere, scattered about the sides of the mountain, the fresh flowers of art, the scented strawberry plants of music, the song of the streams and the poet birds. And Christophe asked Olivier, Where are your people? I see only the elect, all sorts, good and bad. Olivier replied, The people? They're tending their gardens. They never bother about us. Every group and faction among the elect strives to engage their attention. They pay no heed to anyone. There was a time when it amused them to listen to the humbug of the political mountebanks, but now they never worry about it. There are several millions who do not even make use of their rights as electors. The parties may break each other's heads as much as they like, and the people don't care one way or another, so long as they don't trample the crops in their wrangling. If that happens, then they lose their tempers and smash the parties indiscriminately. They do not act, they react in one way or another against all the exaggerations which disturb their work and their rest. Kings, emperors, republics, priests, Freemasons, socialists, whatever their leaders may be, all that they ask of them is to be protected against the great common dangers, war, riots, epidemics, and for the rest to be allowed to go on tending their gardens. When all is said and done, they think, why won't these people leave us in peace? But the politicians are so stupid that they worry the people and won't leave off until they're pitched out with a fork, as will happen some day to our members of Parliament. There was a time when the people were embarked upon great enterprises. Perhaps that will happen again, although they sowed their wild oats long ago. In any case, their embarkations are never for long. Very soon they return to their age-old companion, the earth. It is the soil which binds the French to France, much more than the French. There are so many different races who for centuries have been tilling that brave soil side by side, that it is the soil which unites them, the soil which is their love. Through good times and bad they cultivate it unceasingly, and it is all good to them, even the smallest scrap of ground. Christophe looked down. As far as he could see along the road, around the swamps, on the slopes of rocky hills, over the battlefields and ruins of action, over the mountains and plains of France, all was cultivated and richly bearing. It was the great garden of European civilization. Its incomparable charm lay no less in the good fruitful soil than in the blind labors of an indefatigable people, who for centuries had never ceased to till and sow, and make the land ever more beautiful. A strange people. They are always called inconstant, but nothing in them changes. Olivier, looking backward, saw in Gothic statuary all the types of the provinces of today, and so in the drawings of a Clouet and a Du Moustier, the weary ironical faces of worldly men and intellectuals, or in the work of a Lanin, the clear eyes of the laborers and peasants of Ile-de-France or Picardy, and the thoughts of the men of old days lived in the minds of the present day. The mind of Pascal was alive not only in the elect of reason and religion, but in the brains of obscure citizens or revolutionary syndicalists. The art of Corneille and Racine was living for the people even more than for the elect, for they were less attainted by foreign influences, 
a humble clerk in paris would feel more sympathy with the tragedy of the time of louis fourteenth than with a novel of tolstoy or a drama of ibsen the chants of the middle ages the old french tristan would be more akin to the modern french than the tristan of wagner the flowers of thought which since the twelfth century have never ceased to blossom in french soil however different they may be were yet kin to one another though utterly different from all the flowers about them christophe knew too little of france to be able to grasp how these characteristics had endured what struck him most of all in all the wide expanse of country was the extremely small divisions of the earth as olivier had said every man had his garden and each garden each plot of land was separated from the rest by walls and quick-set hedges and enclosures of all sorts at most there were only a few woods and fields in common and sometimes the dwellers on one side of a river were forced to live nearer to each other than to the dwellers on the other every man shut himself up in his own house and it seemed that this jealous individualism instead of growing weaker after centuries of neighbourhood was stronger than ever christophe thought how lonely they all are in that sense nothing could have been more characteristic than the house in which christophe and olivier lodged it was a world in miniature a little france honest and industrious without any bond which could unite its diverse elements a five-storied house a shaky house leaning over to one side with creaking floors and crumbling ceilings the rain came through into the rooms under the roof in which christophe and olivier lived they had had to have the workmen in to botch up the roof as best they could christophe could hear them working and talking overhead there was one man in particular who amused and exasperated him he never stopped talking to himself and laughing and singing and babbling nonsense and whistling inane tunes and holding long conversations with himself all the time he was working he was incapable of doing anything without proclaiming exactly what it was i'm going to put in another nail where's my hammer i'm putting in a nail two nails one more blow with the hammer there old lady that's it when christophe was playing he would stop for a moment and listen and then go on whistling louder than ever during a stirring passage he would beat time with his hammer on the roof at last christophe was so exasperated that he climbed on a chair and poked his head through the skylight of the attic to rate the man but when he saw him sitting astride the roof with his jolly face and his cheeks stuffed out with nails he burst out laughing and the man joined in and not until they'd done laughing did he remember why he'd come to the window by the way he said i wanted to ask you my playing doesn't interfere with your work the man said it did not but he asked christophe to play something faster because as he worked in time to the music slow tunes kept him back they parted very good friends in a quarter of an hour they had exchanged more words than in six months christophe had spoken to the other inhabitants of the house there were two flats on each floor one of three rooms the other of only two there were no servants rooms each household did its own housework except for the tenants of the ground floor and the first floor who occupied the two flats thrown into one on the fifth floor christophe and olivia's next-door neighbour was the abbe Cornet, a priest of some forty years old a learned man an independent thinker broad-minded formerly a professor of exegesis in a great seminary who had recently been censured by rome for his modernist tendency he had accepted the censure without submitting to it in silence he made no attempt to dispute it and refused every opportunity offered to him of publishing his doctrine he shrank from a noisy publicity and would rather put up with the ruin of his ideas than figure in a scandal christophe could not understand that sort of revolt in resignation he had tried to talk to the priest who however was coldly polite and would not speak of the things which most interested him and seemed to prefer as a matter of dignity to remain buried alive on the floor below in the flat corresponding to that of the two friends there lived a family of the name of elie elsberger an engineer his wife and their two little girls seven and ten years old superior and sympathetic people who kept themselves very much to themselves chiefly from a sort of false shame of their straitened means the young woman who kept her house most pluckily was humiliated by it she would have put up with twice the amount of worry and exhaustion if she could have prevented anybody knowing their condition and that too was a feeling which christophe could not understand they belonged to a protestant family and came from the east of france 
both man and wife a few years before had been bowled over by the storm of the dreyfus affair both of them had taken the affair passionately to heart and like thousands of french people they had suffered from the frenzy brought on by the turbulent wind of that exalted fit of hysteria which lasted for seven years they had sacrificed everything to it rest position relations they had broken off many dear friendships through it they had almost ruined their health for months at a time they did not sleep or act but went on bringing forward the same arguments over and over again with the monotonous insistence of the insane they screwed each other up to a pitch of excitement in spite of their timidity and their dread of ridicule they had taken part in demonstrations and spoken at meetings from which they returned with minds bewildered and aching hearts and they would weep together through the night in the struggle they had expended so much enthusiasm and passion that when at last victory was theirs they had not enough of either to rejoice it left them dry of energy and broken for life their hopes had been so high their eagerness for sacrifice had been so pure the triumph when it came had seemed a mockery compared to with what they had dreamed to such single-minded creatures for whom there could exist but one truth the bargaining of politics the compromises of their heroes had been bitter disappointment they had seen their comrades in arms men whom they had thought inspired with the same single passion for justice once the enemy was overcome swarming about the loot catching at power carrying off honours and positions and in their turn trampling justice under foot only a mere handful of men held steadfast to their faith and in poverty and isolation rejected by every party rejecting every party they remained in obscurity cut off one from the other a prey to sorrow and neurasthenia left hopeless and disgusted with men and utterly weary of life the engineer and his wife were among these wretched victims they made no noise in the house they were morbidly afraid of disturbing their neighbours the more so as they suffered from their neighbours noises and they were too proud to complain christophe was sorry for the two little girls whose outbursts of merriment and natural need of shouting jumping about and laughing were continually being suppressed he adored children and he made friendly advances to his little neighbours when he met them on the stairs the little girls were shy at first but were soon on good terms with christophe who always had some funny story to tell them or sweetmeats in his pockets they told their parents about him and though at first they had been inclined to look askance at his advances they were won over by the frank open manners of their noisy neighbour whose piano playing and terrific disturbance overhead had often made them curse for christophe used to feel stifled in his room and take up pacing up and down like a caged bear they did not find it easy to talk to him christophe's rather boorish and abrupt manners sometimes made elie elsberger shudder but it was all in vain for the engineer to try to keep up the wall of reserve behind which he had taken shelter between himself and the german it was impossible to resist the impetuous good humour of the man whose eyes were so honest and affectionate and so free from any ulterior motive every now and then christophe managed to squeeze a little confidence out of his neighbour elsberger was a queer man full of courage yet apathetic sorrowful and yet resigned he had energy enough to bear a life of difficulty with dignity but not enough to change it it was as though he took a delight in justifying his own pessimism just at that time he had been offered a post in brazil as manager of an undertaking but he had refused as he was afraid of the climate and fearful of the health of his wife and children well leave them said christophe go alone and make their fortune leave them cried the engineer it's easy to see that you have no children i assure you that if i had i should be of the same opinion never never leave the country no i would rather suffer here to christophe it seemed an odd way of loving one's country and one's wife and children to sit down and vegetate with them olivier understood just think he said of the risk of dying out there in a strange unknown country far away from those you love anything is better than the horror of that besides it isn't worth while taking so much trouble for the few remaining years of life as though one always had to be thinking of death said christophe with a shrug and even if that does happen isn't it better to die fighting for the happiness of those one loves than to flicker out in apathy End of section thirty one
Read by Sandra near Montreal, 2022. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 32 of Jean-Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canin. The House. Chapter 1. Part 5. On the same landing, in the smaller flat on the fourth floor, lived a journeyman electrician named Aubert. If he lived entirely apart from the other inhabitants of the house, it was not altogether his fault. He had risen from the lower class and had a passionate desire not to sink back into it. He was small and weakly looking. He had a harsh face, and his forehead bulged over his eyes, which were keen and sharp and bored into you like a gimlet. He had a fair moustache, a satirical mouth, a sibilant way of speaking, a husky voice, a scarf round his neck, and he always had something the matter with his throat, in which irritation was set up by his perpetual habit of smoking. He was always feverishly active, and had the consumptive temperament. He was a mixture of conceit, irony, and bitterness, cloaking a mind that was enthusiastic, bombastic, and naive, while it was always being taken in by life. He was the bastard of some burgess whom he had never known, and was brought up by a mother whom it was impossible to respect, so that in his childhood he had seen much that was sad and degrading. He had plied all sorts of trades, and had travelled much in France. He had an admirable desire for education, and had taught himself with frightful toil and labour. He read everything—history, philosophy, decadent poets. He was up to date in everything—theatres, exhibitions, concerts— he had a touching veneration for art, literature, and middle-class ideas. They fascinated him. He had imbibed the vague and ardent ideology which intoxicated the middle classes in the first days of the Revolution. He had a definite belief in the infallibility of reason, in boundless progress, quo non ascendum, in the near advent of happiness on earth, in the omnipotence of science, in divine humanity, and in France the eldest daughter of humanity. He had an enthusiastic and credulous sort of anti-clericalism which made him lump together religion, especially Catholicism, and obscurantism, and see in priests the natural foe of light. Socialism, individualism, chauvinism jostled each other in his brain. He was a humanitarian in mind, despotic in temperament, and an anarchist in fact. He was proud and knew the gaps in his education, and in conversation he was very cautious. He turned to account everything that was said in his presence, but he would never ask advice. That humiliated him. Now, though he had intelligence and cleverness, these things could not altogether supply the defects of his education. He had taken it into his head to write. Like so many men in France who have not been taught, he had the gift of style and a clear vision, but he was a confused thinker. He had shown a few pages of his productions to a successful journalist in whom he believed, and the man made fun of him. He was profoundly humiliated, and from that time on never told a soul what he was doing. But he went on writing. It fed his need of expansion and gave him pride and delight. In his heart he was immensely pleased with his eloquent passages and philosophic ideas, which were not worth a brass farthing. And he set no store by his observation of real life, which was excellent. It was his crank to fancy himself as a philosopher, and he wished to write sociological plays and novels of ideas. He had no difficulty in solving all sorts of insoluble questions, and at every turn he discovered America. When in due course he found that America was already discovered, he was disappointed, humiliated, and rather bitter. He was never far from scenting injustice and intrigue. He was consumed by a thirst for fame and a burning capacity for devotion, which suffered from finding no means or direction of employment. He would have loved to be a great man of letters, a member of that literary elite who, in his eyes, were adorned with a supernatural prestige. In spite of his longing to deceive himself, he had too much good sense, and was too ironical not to know that there was no chance of its coming to pass. 
but he would at least have liked to live in that atmosphere of art and middle-class ideas which at a distance seemed to him so brilliant and pure and chastened of mediocrity this innocent longing had the unfortunate result of making the society of the people with whom his condition in life forced him to live intolerable to him and as the middle-class society which he wished to enter closed its doors to him the result was that he never saw anybody and so christophe had no difficulty in making his acquaintance on the contrary he had very soon to bolt and bar against him otherwise aubert would have more often been in christophe's rooms than christophe in his he was only too happy to find an artist to whom he could talk about music plays etc but as one would imagine christophe did not find them so interesting he would rather have discussed the people with a man who was of the people but that was just what aubert would not and could not discuss in proportion as he went lower in the house relations between christophe and the other tenants became naturally more distant besides some secret magic some open sesame would have been necessary for him to reach the inhabitants of the third floor in the one flat there lived two ladies who were under the self-hypnotism of grief for a loss that was already some years old madame germain a woman of thirty-five who had lost her husband and daughter and lived in seclusion with her aged and devout mother-in-law on the other side of the landing there dwelt a mysterious character of uncertain age anything between fifty and sixty with a little girl of ten he was bald with a handsome well-trimmed beard a soft way of speaking distinguished manners and aristocratic hands he was called monsieur watelet he was said to be an anarchist a revolutionary a foreigner from what country was not known russia or belgium as a matter of fact he was a northern frenchman and was hardly at all revolutionary but he was living on his past reputation he had been mixed up with the commune of seventy one and condemned to death he had escaped how he did not know and for ten years he had lived for a short time in every country in europe he had seen so many ill deeds during the upheaval in paris and afterwards and also in exile and also since his return ill deeds done by his former comrades now that they were in power and also by men in every rank of the revolutionary parties that he had broken with them peacefully keeping his convictions to himself useless and untarnished he read much wrote a few mildly incendiary books pulled so it was said the wires of anarchist movements in distant places in india or the far east busied himself with the universal revolution and at the same time with researches no less universal but of a more genial aspect namely with the universal language a new method of popular instruction in music he never came in contact with anybody in the house when he met any of its inmates he did no more than bow to them with exaggerated politeness however he condescended to tell christophe a little about his musical method christophe was not the least interested in it the symbols of his ideas mattered very little to him in any language he would have managed somehow to express them but vatelet was not to be put off and went on explaining his system gently but firmly christophe could not find out anything about the rest of his life and so he gave up stopping when he met him on the stairs and only looked at the little girl who was always with him she was fair pale anemic she had blue eyes rather a sharp profile a thin little figure she was always very neatly dressed and she looked sickly and her face was not very expressive like everybody else he thought she was vatelet's daughter she was an orphan the daughter of poor parents whom vatelet had adopted when she was four or five after the death of her father and mother in an epidemic he had an almost boundless love for the poor especially for poor children it was a sort of mystic tenderness with him as with vincent de paul he distrusted official charity and knew exactly what philanthropic institutions were worth and therefore he set about doing charity alone he did it by stealth and took a secret joy in it he had learned medicine so as to be of some use in the world one day when he went to the house of a working man in the district and found sickness there he turned to and nursed the invalids he had some medical knowledge and turned it to account he could not bear to see a child suffer it broke his heart but on the other hand what a joy it was when he had succeeded in tearing one of these poor little creatures from the clutches of sickness and the first pale smile appeared on the little pinched face then vatelet's heart would melt those were his moments of paradise they made him forget the trouble he often had with his protégés for they very rarely showed him much gratitude 
and the housekeeper was furious at seeing so many people with dirty boots going up her stairs, and she would complain bitterly, and the proprietor would watch uneasily these meetings of anarchists and make remarks. Batelet would contemplate leaving his flat, but that hurt him. He had his little whimsies. He was gentle and obstinate, and he put up with the proprietor's observations. Christophe won his confidence, up to a certain point, by the love he showed for children. That was their common bond. Christophe never met the little girl without a catch at his heart, for though he did not know why, by one of those mysterious similarities in outline which the instinct perceives immediately and subconsciously, the child reminded him of Sabine's little girl. Sabine, his first love, now so far away, the silent grace of whose fleeting shadow had never faded from his heart, and so he took an interest in the pale-faced little girl, whom he never saw romping or running, whose voice he hardly ever heard, who had no little friend of her own age, who was always alone, mum, quietly amusing herself with lifeless toys, a doll or a block of wood, while her lips moved as she whispered some story to herself. She was affectionate and a little off-handed in manner. There was a foreign and uneasy quality in her, but her adopted father never saw it. He loved her too much. Alas, does not that foreign and uneasy quality exist even in the children of our own flesh and blood? Christophe tried to make the solitary little girl friends with the engineer's children, but with both Elsberger and Vatelet he met with a polite but categorical refusal. These people seemed to make it a point of honour to bury themselves alive, each in his own mausoleum. If it came to a point, each would have been ready to help the other, but each was afraid of it being thought that he himself was in need of help, and as they were both equally proud and vain, and the means of both were equally precarious, there was no hope of either of them being the first to hold out his hand to the other. The larger flat on the second floor was almost always empty. The proprietor of the house reserved it for his own use, and he was never there. He was a retired merchant who had closed down his business as soon as he had made a certain fortune, the figure of which he had fixed for himself. He spent the greater part of the year in some hotel on the Riviera, and the summer at some watering place in Normandy, living as a gentleman with private means who enjoys the illusion of luxury cheaply by watching the luxury of others, and like them, leading a useless existence. The smaller flat was let to a childless couple, Monsieur and Madame Arnaud. The husband, a man of between forty and forty-five, was a master at school. He was so overworked with lectures and correcting exercises and giving classes that he had never been able to find time to write his thesis, and at last he had given it up altogether. The wife was ten years younger, pretty and very shy. They were both intelligent, well-read, in love with each other. They knew nobody and never went out. The husband had no time for it. The wife had too much time, but she was a brave little creature who fought down her fits of depression when they came over her, and hid them by occupying herself as best she could, trying to learn, taking notes for her husband, copying out her husband's notes, mending her husband's clothes, making frocks and hats for herself. She would have liked to go to the theatre from time to time, but Arnaud did not care about it. He was too tired in the evening, and she resigned herself to it. Their great joy was music. They both adored it. He could not play, and she dared not, although she could. When she played before anybody, even before her husband, it was like a child strumming. However, that was good enough for them, and Gluck, Mozart, Beethoven, whom they stammered out, were as friends to them. They knew their lives in detail, and their sufferings filled them with love and pity. Books, too, beautiful fine books, which they read together, gave them happiness— but there are few such books in the literature of today. Authors do not worry about those people who can bring them neither reputation nor pleasure nor money. Such humble readers who are never seen in society and do not write in any journal can only love and say nothing. The silent light of art, which in their upright and religious hearts assumed almost a supernatural character, and their mutual affection were enough to make them live in peace, happy enough, though a little sad, there's no gain saying that. Very lonely, a little bruised in spirit. They were both much superior to their position in life. Monsieur Arnaud was full of ideas, but he had neither the time nor enough courage left to write them down. It meant such a lot of trouble to get articles and books published. It was not worth it. Futile vanity. Anything he could do was so small in comparison with the thinkers he loved. 
he had too true a love for the great works of art to want to produce art himself it would have seemed to him pretentious impertinent and ridiculous it seemed to be his lot to spread their influence he gave his pupils the benefit of his ideas they would turn them into books later on without mentioning his name of course nobody spent more money than he in subscribing to various publications the poor are always the most generous they do buy their books the rich would take it as a slur upon themselves if they did not somehow manage to get them for nothing arnaud ruined himself in buying books it was his weakness his vice he was ashamed of it and concealed it from his wife but she did not blame him for it she would have spent just as much and with it all they were always making fine plans for saving with a view to going to italy some day though as they knew quite well they never would go and they were the first to laugh at their incapacity for keeping money arnaud would console himself his dear wife was enough for him and his life of work and inward joys was it not also enough for her she said it was she dared not say how dear it would have been to her if her husband could have some reputation which would in some sort be reflected upon herself and brighten her life and give her ease and comfort inward joys are beautiful but a little ray of light from without shining in from time to time is sweet and does so much good but she never said anything because she was timid and besides she knew that even if he wished to make a reputation it was by no means certain that he would succeed it was too late their greatest sorrow was that they had no children each hid that sorrow from the other and they were only the more tender with each other it was as though the poor creatures were striving to win one another's forgiveness madame arnaud was kind and affectionate she would gladly have been friends with madame elsberger but she dared not she was never approached as for christophe husband and wife would have asked nothing better than to know him they were fascinated by the music that they could hear faintly when he was playing but nothing in the world would have induced them to make the first move they would have thought it indiscreet the whole of the first floor was occupied by monsieur and madame felix Weil. they were rich jews and had no children and they spent six months of the year in the country near paris although they had lived in the house for twenty years they stayed there as a matter of habit although they could easily have found a flat more in keeping with their fortune they were always like passing strangers they had never spoken a word to any of their neighbours and no one knew any more about them than the day of their arrival but that was no reason why the other tenants should not pass judgment on them on the contrary they were not liked and no doubt they did nothing to win popularity and yet they were worthy of more acquaintance they were both excellent people and remarkably intelligent the husband a man of sixty was an assyriologist well known through his famous excavations in central asia like most of his race he was open-minded and curious and did not confine himself to his special studies he was interested in an infinite number of things the arts social questions every manifestation of contemporary thought but these were not enough to occupy his mind for they all amused him and none of them roused passionate interest he was very intelligent too intelligent too much emancipated from all ties always ready to destroy with one hand what he had constructed with the other for he was constructive always producing books and theories he was a great worker as a matter of habit and spiritual health he was always patiently ploughing his deep furrow in the field of knowledge without having any belief in the utility of what he was doing he had always had the misfortune to be rich so that he had never had the interest of the struggle for life and since his explorations in the east of which he had grown tired after a few years he had not accepted any official position outside his own personal work however he busied himself with clairvoyance contemporary problems social reforms of a practical and pressing nature the reorganization of public education in france he flung out ideas and created lines of thought he would set great intellectual machines working and would immediately grow disgusted with them more than once he had scandalized people who had been converted to a cause by his arguments by producing the most incisive and discouraging criticisms of the cause itself he did not do it deliberately it was a natural necessity for him he was very nervous and ironical in temper and found it hard to bear with the foibles of things and people which he saw with the most disconcerting clarity and as there is no good cause nor any good man who seen at a certain angle or with a certain distortion does not present a ridiculous aspect 
there was nothing that with his ironic disposition he could go on respecting for long. All this was not calculated to make him friends, and yet he was always well disposed toward people and inclined to do good. He did much good. But no one was ever grateful to him, even those whom he had helped could not in their hearts forgive him, because they had seen that they were ridiculous in his eyes. It was necessary for him not to see too much of men if he were to love them, not that he was a misanthrope. He was not sure enough of himself to be that. Face to face with the world at which he mocked, he was timid and bashful. At heart he was not at all sure that the world was not right and himself wrong. He endeavoured not to appear too different from other people, and strove to base his manners and apparent opinions on theirs. But he strove in vain. He could not help judging them. He was keenly sensible of any sort of exaggeration and anything that was not simple, and he could never conceal his irritation. He was especially sensible of the foibles of the Jews, because he knew them best, and as, in spite of his intellectual freedom which did not admit of barriers between races, he was often brought up sharp against those barriers which men of other races raised against him. As, in spite of himself, he was out of his element among Christian ideas, he retired with dignity into his ironic labours and the profound affection he had for his wife. Worst of all, his wife was not secure against his irony. She was a kindly, busy woman, anxious to be useful, and always taken up with various charitable works. Her nature was much less complex than that of her husband, and she was cramped by her moral benevolence and the rather rigidly intellectual, though lofty, idea of duty that she had begotten. Her whole life, which was sad enough, without children, and with no great joy nor great love, was based on this moral belief of hers, which was more than anything else the will to believe. Her husband's irony had, of course, seized on the element of voluntary self-deception in her faith, and, if it was too strong for him, he had made much fun at her expense. He was a mass of contradictions. He had a feeling for duty no less lofty than his wife's, and at the same time a merciless desire to analyze, to criticize, and to avoid deception, which made him dismember and take to pieces his moral imperative. He could not see that he was digging away the ground from under his wife's feet. He used cruelly to discourage her. When he realized that he had done so, he suffered even more than she, but the harm was done. It did not keep them from loving each other faithfully and working and doing good, but the cold dignity of the wife was not more kindly judged than the irony of the husband, and as they were too proud to publish abroad the good they did, or their desire to do good, their reserve was regarded as indifference, and their isolation as selfishness and the more conscious they became of the opinion that was held of them, the more careful they were to do nothing to dispute it. Reacting against the coarse indiscretion of so many of their race, they were the victims of an excessive reserve which covered a vast deal of pride. As for the ground floor, which was a few steps higher than the little garden, it was occupied by Commandant Chabrin, a retired officer of the colonial artillery, he was still young, a man of great vigour, who had fought brilliantly in the Sudan and Madagascar. Then suddenly he had thrown the whole thing up, and buried himself there. He did not even want to hear the army mentioned, and spent his time in digging his flower-beds and practising the flute, without making any progress, and growling about politics, and scolding his daughter whom he adored. She was a young woman of thirty, not very pretty, but quite charming, who devoted herself to him and had not married so as not to leave him. Christophe used often to see them leaning out of the window, and naturally he paid more attention to the daughter than the father. She used to spend part of the afternoon in the garden, sewing, dreaming, digging, always in high good humour with her grumbling old father. Christophe could hear her soft, clear voice laughingly replying to the growling tones of the commandant, whose footsteps ground and scrunched on the gravel paths, then he would go in, and she would stay sitting on a seat in the garden, and so, for hours together, never stirring, never speaking, smiling vaguely, while inside the house the bored old soldier played flourishes on his shrill flute, or by way of a change made a broken-winded old harmonium squeal and groan, much to Christophe's amusement or exasperation, which depended on the day and his mood. All these people went on living side by side in that house with its walled-in garden, sheltered from all the buffets of the world, hermetically sealed even against each other. Only Christophe, with his need of expansion and his great fullness of life, 
unknown to them, wrapped them about with his vast sympathy, blind yet all-seeing. He could not understand them. He had no means of understanding them. He lacked Olivier's psychological insight and quickness. But he loved them. Instinctively, he put himself in their place. Slowly, mysteriously, there crept through him a dim consciousness of these lives so near him and yet so far removed. The stupefying sorrow of the mourning woman, the stoic silence of all their proud thoughts, the priest, the Jew, the engineer, the revolutionary, the pale and gentle flame of tenderness and faith which burned in silence in the hearts of the two Arnauds, the naive aspirations towards the light of the man of the people, the suppressed revolt and fertile activity which were stifled in the bosom of the old soldier, and the calm resignation of the girl dreaming in the shade of the lilac. But only Christophe could perceive and hear the silent music of their souls. They heard it not. They were all absorbed in their sorrow and their dreams. They all worked hard, the sceptical old scientist, the pessimistic engineer, the priest, the anarchist, and all these proud or dispirited creatures. And on the roof the mason sang. End section 33 of Jean Christophe in Paris this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland Translated by Gilbert Canin The House Chapter 1, Part 6 In the district round the house, among the best of people, Christophe found the same moral solitude, even when the people were banded together. Olivier had brought him in touch with a little review for which he wrote. It was called Aesop, and had taken for its motto this quotation from Montaigne. Aesop was put up for sale with two other slaves. The purchaser inquired of the first what he could do, and he, to put a price upon himself, described all sorts of marvels. The second said as much for himself or more. When it came to Aesop's turn, and he was asked what he could do, nothing, he said, for these two have taken everything, they can do everything. End quote. Their attitude was that of pure reaction against the impudence, as Montaigne says, of those who profess knowledge and their overweening presumption. The self styled sceptics of the Aesop Review were at heart men of the firmest faith, but their mask of irony and haughty ignorance, naturally enough, had small attraction for the public, rather it repelled. The people are only with a writer when he brings them words of simple, clear, vigorous, and assured life. They prefer a sturdy lie to an anemic truth. Skepticism is only to their liking when it is the covering of lusty naturalism or Christian idolatry. The scornful Pyrrhonism in which the Aesop clothed itself could only be acceptable to a few minds, Aemi Stignosi, who knew the solid worth behind it. It was force absolutely lost upon action and life. There was no help for it. The more democratic France became, the more aristocratic did her ideas, her art, her science, seem to grow. Science securely lodged behind its special languages, in the depths of its sanctuary, wrapped about with a triple veil which only the initiate had the power to draw, was less accessible than at the time of Buffon and the encyclopedists. Art that art, at least, which had some respect for itself and the worship of beauty, was no less hermetically sealed. It despised the people, even among writers who cared less for beauty than for action, among those who gave moral ideas precedence over aesthetic ideas. There was often a strange dominance of the aristocratic spirit. They seemed to be more intent upon preserving the purity of their inward flame than to communicate its warmth to others. It was as though they desired not to make their ideas prevail, but only to affirm them. And yet among these writers there were some who applied themselves to popular art. Among the most sincere, some hurled into their writings destructive anarchical ideas, truths of the distant future which might be beneficent in a century or so, but for the time being corroded and scorched the soul. Others wrote bitter or ironical plays, robbed of all illusion, sad to the last degree. Christophe was left in a state of collapse, hamstrung for a day or two after he read them. And you give that sort of thing to the people, he would ask, 
feeling sorry for the poor audiences who had come to forget their troubles for a few hours, only to be presented with these lugubrious entertainments. It's enough to make them all go and drown themselves. You may be quite easy on that score, said Olivier, laughing. The people don't go. And a jolly good thing, too. You're mad. Are you trying to rob them of every scrap of courage to live? Why? Isn't it right to teach them to see the sadness of things as we do, and yet to go on and do their duty without flinching? Without flinching? I doubt that. But it's very certain that they'll do it without pleasure, and you don't go very far when you've destroyed a man's pleasure in living. What else can one do? One has no right to falsify the truth. Nor have you any right to tell the whole truth to everybody. You say that? You who are always shouting the truth aloud? You who pretend to love truth more than anything in the world? Yes, truth for myself and those whose backs are strong enough to bear it. But it is cruel and stupid to tell it to the rest. Yes, I see that now. At home, that would never have occurred to me. In Germany, people are not so morbid about the truth as they are here. They're too much taken up with living. Very wisely, they see only what they wish to see. I love you for not being like that. You're honest and go straight ahead. But you are inhuman. When you think you've unearthed a truth, you let it loose upon the world, without stopping to think whether, like the foxes in the Bible with their burning tails, it will not set fire to the world. I think it is fine of you to prefer truth to your happiness, but when it comes to the happiness of other people, then I say, stop. You are taking too much upon yourselves. Thou shalt love truth more than thyself, but thy neighbor more than truth. Is one to lie to one's neighbor? Christophe replied with the words of Goethe, quote, We should only express those of the highest truths which will be to the good of the world. The rest we must keep to ourselves, like the soft rays of a hidden sun they will shed their light upon all our actions. End quote. But they were not moved by these scruples. They never stopped to think whether the bow in their hands shot ideas or death, or both together. They were too intellectual. They lacked love. When a Frenchman has ideas, he tries to impose them on others. He tries to do the same thing when he has none. And when he sees that he cannot do it, he loses interest in other people. He loses interest in action. That was the chief reason why this particular group took so little interest in politics, save to moan and groan. Each of them was shut up in his faith, or want of faith. Many attempts had been made to break down their individualism and to form groups of these men, but the majority of these groups had immediately resolved themselves into literary clubs or split up into absurd factions. The best of them were mutually destructive. There were among them some first-rate men of force and faith, men well fitted to rally and guide those of weaker will. But each man had his following, and would not consent to merging it with that of other men. So they were split up into a number of reviews, unions, associations, which had all the moral virtues, save one. Self-denial, for not one of them would give way to the others, and while they wrangled over the crumbs that fell from an honest and well-meaning public— Small in numbers and poor in purse, they vegetated for a short time, starved and languished, and at last collapsed, never to rise again, not under the assault of the enemy, but, most pitiful, under the weight of their own quarrels. The various professions, men of letters, dramatic authors, poets, prose writers, professors, members of the Institute, journalists— were divided up into a number of little castes, which they themselves split up again into smaller castes, each one of which closed its doors against the rest. There was no sort of mutual interchange. There was no unanimity on any subject in France except at those very rare moments when unanimity assumed an epidemic character, and as a rule was in the wrong, for it was morbid. A crazy individualism predominated in every kind of French activity, in scientific research as well as in commerce, in which it prevented businessmen from combining and organizing working agreements. This individualism was not that of a rich and bustling vitality, but that of obstinacy and self-repression. To be alone, 
to owe nothing to others, not to mix with others for fear of feeling their inferiority in their company, not to disturb the tranquillity of their haughty isolation. These were the secret thoughts of almost all men who found it outside reviews, outside theatres, outside groups. Reviews, theatres, groups all most often had no other reason for existing than the desire not to be with the general herd, and an incapacity for joining with other people in a common idea or course of action, distrust of other people, or at the very worst, party hostility, setting one against the other, the very men who were most fitted to understand each other. Even when men who thought highly of each other were united in some common task, like Olivier and his colleagues on the Aesop Review, they always seemed to be on their guard with each other, they had nothing of that open-handed geniality so common in Germany, where it is apt to become a nuisance. Among these young men, there was one especially who attracted Christophe, because he divined him to be a man of exceptional force. He was a writer of inflexible logic and will, with a passion for moral ideas, in the service of which he was absolutely uncompromising, and ready in their cause to sacrifice the whole world and himself. He had founded and conducted, almost unaided, a review in which to uphold them. He had sworn to impose on Europe and on France the idea of a pure, heroic, and free France. He firmly believed that the world would one day recognize that he was responsible for one of the boldest pages in the history of French thought, and he was not mistaken. Christophe would have been only too glad to know him better and to be his friend, but there was no way of bringing it about. Although Olivia had a good deal to do with him, they saw very little of each other except on business. They never discussed any intimate matter, and never got any farther than the exchange of a few abstract ideas, or rather, for to be exact there was no exchange, and each adhered to his own ideas. They soliloquized in each other's company, in turn. However, they were comrades in arms, and knew their worth. There were innumerable reasons for this reservedness reasons difficult to discern even for their own eyes. The first reason was a too great critical faculty which saw too clearly the unalterable differences between one mind and another, backed by an excessive intellectualism which attached too much importance to those differences. They lacked that prescient and naive sympathy whose vital need is of love, the need of giving out its overflowing love. Then, too, perhaps overwork, the struggle for existence, the fever of thought, which so taxes strength that by the evening there is none left for friendly intercourse, had a great deal to do with it. And there was that terrible feeling which every Frenchman is afraid to admit, though too often it is stirring in his heart, the feeling of not being of one race, the feeling that the nation consists of different races established at different epochs on the soil of France, who, though all bound together, have few ideas in common, and therefore ought not in the common interest to ponder them too much. But above all, the reason was to seek in the intoxicating and dangerous passion for liberty, to which, when a man has once tasted it, there is nothing that he will not sacrifice. Such solitary freedom is all the more precious for having been bought by years of tribulation. The select few have taken refuge in it to escape the slavishness of the mediocre. It is a reaction against the tyranny of the political and religious masses, the terrific crushing weight which overbears the individual in France, the family, public opinion, the state, secret societies, parties, coteries, schools. Imagine a prisoner who, to escape, has to scale twenty great walls hemming him in. If he manages to clear them all without breaking his neck, and above all, without losing heart, he must be strong indeed. A rough schooling for free will. But those who have gone through it bear the marks of it all their life in the mania for independence and the impossibility of their ever living in the lives of others. Side by side with this loneliness of pride, there was the loneliness of renunciation. There were many, many good men in France whose goodness and pride and affection came to nothing in withdrawal from life. A thousand reasons, good and bad, stood in the way of action for them. With some it was obedience, timidity, force of habit. With others, human respect, fear of ridicule, fear of being conspicuous, of being a mark for the comments of the gallery, of meddling with things that did not concern them, of having their disinterested actions attributed to motives of interest. 
there were men who would not take part in any political or social struggle women who declined to undertake any philanthropic work because there were too many people engaged in these things who lacked conscience and even common sense and because they were afraid of the taint of these charlatans and fools in almost all such people there are disgust weariness dread of action suffering ugliness stupidity risks responsibilities the terrible what's the use which destroys the good will of so many of the french of to-day they are too intelligent their intelligence has no wide sweep of the wings they are too intent upon reasons for and against they lack force they lack vitality when a man's life beats strongly he never wonders why he goes on living he lives for the sake of living because it is a splendid thing to be alive in fine the best of them were a mixture of sympathetic and average qualities a modicum of philosophy moderate desires fond attachment to the family the earth moral custom discretion dread of intruding of being a nuisance to other people modesty of feeling unbending reserve all these amiable and charming qualities could in certain cases be brought into line with serenity courage and inward joy but at bottom there was a certain connection between them and poverty in the blood the progressive ebb of french fatality the pretty garden beneath the house in which christophe and olivier lived tucked away between the four walls was symbolical of that part of the life of france it was a little patch of green earth shut off from the outer world only now and then did the mighty wind of the outer air whirling down bring to the girl dreaming there the breath of the distant fields and the vast earth now that christophe was beginning to perceive the hidden resources of france he was furious that she should suffer the oppression of the rabble the half-light in which the select and silent few were huddled away stifled him stoicism is a fine thing for those whose teeth are gone but he needed the open air the great public the sunshine of glory the love of thousands of men and women he needed to hold close to him those whom he loved to pulverize his enemies to fight and to conquer you can said olivier you're strong you were born to conquer through your faults forgive me as well as through your qualities you're lucky enough not to belong to a race and a nation which are too aristocratic action does not repel you if need be you could even become a politician besides you have the inestimable good fortune to write music nobody understands you and so you can say anything and everything if people had any idea of the contempt for themselves which you put into your music and your faith in what they deny and your perpetual hymn in praise of what they are always trying to kill they would never forgive you and you would be so fettered and persecuted and harassed that you would waste most of your strength in fighting them when you had beaten them back you would have no breath left for going on with your work your life would be finished the great men who triumph have the good luck to be misunderstood they are admired for the very opposite of what they are poof said christophe you don't understand how cowardly your masters are at first i thought you were alone and i used to find excuses for your inaction but as a matter of fact there's a whole army of you all of the same mind you are a hundred times stronger than your oppressors you are a thousand times more worthy and you let them impose on you with their effrontery i don't understand you you live in a most beautiful country you're gifted with the finest intelligence and the most human quality of mind and with it all you do nothing you allow yourselves to be overborne and outraged and trampled underfoot by a parcel of fools good lord be yourselves don't wait for heaven or a napoleon to come to your aid arise band yourselves together get to work all of you sweep out your house but olivier shrugged his shoulders and said wearily and ironically grapple with them no that is not our game we have better things to do violence disgusts me i know only too well what would happen all the old embittered failures the young royalist idiots the odious apostles of brutality and hatred would seize on anything i did and bring it to dishonour do you want me to adopt the old device of hate fuori barbari or france for the french why not asked christophe no 
Such a device is not for the French. Any attempt to propagate it among our people under cover of patriotism must fail. It is good enough for barbarian countries, but our country has no use for hatred. Our genius never yet asserted itself by denying or destroying the genius of other countries, but by absorbing them. Let the troublous north and the loquacious south come to us, and the poisonous east, and the poisonous east. We will absorb it with the rest. We have absorbed many others. I just laugh at the air of triumph, they assume, and the pusillanimity of some of my fellow countrymen. They think they have conquered us. They strut about our boulevards and in our newspapers and reviews, and in our theatres and in the political arena. Idiots! It is they who are conquered. They will be assimilated after having fed us. Gaul has a strong stomach. In these twenty centuries she's digested more than one civilization. We are proof against poison. It is meet that you Germans should be afraid. You must be pure or impure. But with us it is not a matter of purity, but of universality. You have an emperor. Great Britain calls herself an empire. But in fact it is our Latin genius that is imperial. We are the citizens of the city of the universe. Orbis, orbis. That is all very well, said Christophe, as long as the nation is healthy and in the flower of its manhood. But there will come a day when its energy declines, and then there is a danger of its being submerged by the influx of foreigners. Between ourselves, does it not seem as though that day had arrived? People have been saying that for ages. Again and again our history has given the lie to such fears. We've passed through many different trials since the days of the Maid of Orléans, when Paris was deserted and bands of wolves prowled through the streets. Neither in the prevalent immorality, nor the pursuit of pleasure, nor the laxness, nor the anarchy of the present day, do I see any cause for fear. Patience. Those who wish to live must endure in patience. I am sure that presently there will be a moral reaction, which will not be much better, and will probably lead to an equal degree of folly. Those who are now living on the corruptness of public life will not be the least clamorous in the reaction. But what does that matter to us? All these movements do not touch the real people of France. Rotten fruit does not corrupt the tree. It falls. Besides, all these people are such a small part of the nation. What does it matter to us whether they live or die? Why should I bother to organize leagues and revolutions against them? The existing evil is not the work of any form of government. It is the leprosy of luxury, a contagion spread by the parasites of intellectual and material wealth. Such parasites will perish. After they've sapped your vitality. It is impossible to despair of such a race. There is in it such hidden virtue, such a power of light and practical idealism, that they creep into the veins even of those who are exploiting and ruining the nation. Even the grasping, self-seeking politicians succumb to its fascination. Even the most mediocre of men, when they're in power, are gripped by the greatness of its destiny. It lifts them out of themselves. The torch is passed on from hand to hand among them. One after another they resume the holy war against darkness. They are drawn onward by the genius of the people, willy-nilly. They fulfill the law of the God whom they deny. Gesta Dei per Francos. O oh, my beloved country, I will never lose my faith in thee. And though in thy trials thou didst perish, yet should I find in that only a reason the more for my proud belief, even to the bitter end in our mission in the world. I will not have my beloved France fearfully shutting herself up in a sick room and closing every inlet to the outer air. I have no mind to prolong a sickly existence. When a nation has been so great as we have been, then it were far better to die rather than to sink from greatness. Therefore let the ideas of the world rush into the channels of our minds. I am not afraid. The floor will go down of its own accord after it has enriched the soil of France with its ooze. My poor dear fellow, said Christophe, but it's a grim prospect in the meanwhile. Where will you be when your France emerges from the Nile? Don't you think it would be better to fight against it? You wouldn't risk anything except defeat, and you seem inclined to impose that on yourself as long as you like. I should be risking much more than defeat, said Olivier. 
I should be running the risk of losing my peace of mind, which I prize far more than victory. I will not be a party to hatred. I will be just to all my enemies. In the midst of passion, I wish to preserve the clarity of my vision, to understand and love everything. But Christophe, to whom this love of life, detached from life, seemed to be very little different from resignation and acceptance of death, felt in his heart, as in Empedocles of old, the stirring of a hymn to hatred and to love, the brother of hate, fruitful love, tilling and sowing good seed in the earth. He did not share Olivier's calm fatalism. He had no such confidence in the continuance of a race which did not defend itself, and his desire was to appeal to all the healthy forces of the nation, to call forth and band together all the honest men in the whole of France. Just as it is possible to learn more of a human being in one minute of love than in months of observation, so Christophe had learned more about France in a week of intimacy with Olivier, hardly ever leaving the house, than during a whole year of blind wandering through Paris, and standing at attention at various intellectual and political gatherings, amid the universal anarchy in which he had been floundering, a soul like that of his friend seemed to him veritably to be the Ile de France, the island of reason and serenity in the midst of the ocean. The inward peace which was in Olivier was all the more striking, inasmuch as it had no intellectual support, as it existed amid unhappy circumstances, in poverty and solitude, while the country of its birth was decadent, and as its body was weak, sickly, and nerve-ridden. That serenity was apparently not the fruit of any effort of will striving to realize it. Olivier had little will. It came from the depths of his being and his race. In many of the men of Olivier's acquaintance, Christophe perceived the distant light of that Greek, Sophrosane, the silent calm of the motionless sea, and he, who knew none better, the stormy, troublous depths of his own soul, and how he had to stretch his willpower to the utmost to maintain the balance in his lusty nature, marvelled at its veiled harmony. What he had seen of the inner France had upset all his preconceived ideas about the character of the French. Instead of a gay, sociable, careless, brilliant people, he saw men of a headstrong and close temper, living in isolation, wrapped about with a seeming optimism like a gleaming mist, while they were in fact steeped in a deep-rooted and serene pessimism, possessed by fixed ideas, intellectual passions, indomitable souls, which it would have been easier to destroy than to alter. No doubt these men were only the select few among the French, but Christophe wondered where they could have come by their stoicism and their faith. Olivier told him, In defeat. It is you, my dear Christophe, who have forged us anew. Ah, but we suffered for it, too. You can have no idea of the darkness in which we grew up in a France humiliated and sore, which had come face to face with death and still felt the heavy weight of the murderous menace of force. Our life, our genius, our French civilization, the greatness of a thousand years. We were conscious that France was in the hands of a brutal conqueror who did not understand her and hated her in his heart, and at any moment might crush the life out of her forever. And we had to live for that and no other destiny. Have you ever thought of the French children born in houses of death in the shadow of defeat, fed with ideas of discouragement, trained to strike for a bloody, fatal, and perhaps futile revenge? For even as babies, the first thing they learned was that there was no justice. There was no justice in the world. Might prevailed against right. For a child to open its eyes upon such things is for its soul to be degraded or uplifted forever. Many succumbed, they said. Since it is so, why struggle against it? Why do anything? Everything is nothing. We will not think of it. Let us enjoy ourselves. But those who stood out against it are proof against fire. No disillusion can touch their faith, for from their earliest childhood they have known that their road could never lead them near the road to happiness, and that they had no choice but to follow it, else they would suffocate. Such assurance is not come by all at once. It is not to be expected of boys of fifteen. There is bitter agony before it is attained, and many tears are shed. But it is well that it should be so. It must be so. O oh, faith, virgin of steel, dig deep with thy lance into the downtrodden hearts of the peoples. Peoples. 
In silence, Christophe pressed Olivier's hand. Dear Christophe, said Olivier, your Germany has made us suffer indeed. And Christophe begged for forgiveness almost as though he'd been responsible for it. There's nothing for you to worry about, said Olivier, smiling. The good it has unintentionally done us far outweighs the ill. You have rekindled our idealism. You have revived in us the keen desire for knowledge and faith. You have filled our France with schools. You have raised to the highest pitch the creative powers of a pastor, whose discoveries are alone worth more than your indemnity of two hundred million. You have given new life to our poetry, our painting, our music. To you we owe the new awakening of the consciousness of our race. We have reward enough for the effort needed to learn to set our faith before our happiness, for in doing so we have come by a feeling of such moral force that amid the apathy of the world we have no doubt even of victory in the end. Though we are few in number, my dear Christophe, though we seem so weak, a drop of water in the ocean of German power, we believe that the drop of water will, in the end, color the whole ocean. The Macedonian phalanx will destroy the mighty armies of the plebs of Europe. Christophe looked down at the puny Olivier, in whose eyes there shone the light of faith, and he said, Poor weakly little Frenchman, you are stronger than we are. Oh, beneficent defeat, Olivier went on. Blessed be that disaster. We will no more deny it. We are its children. End of section 33, read by Sandra, Montreal, 2022. Section 34 of Jean-Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canin. The House, Chapter 2, Part 1. Defeat new forges the chosen among men it sorts out the people it winnows out those who are purest and strongest and makes them purer and stronger but it hastens the downfall of the rest or cuts short their flight in that way it separates the mass of the people who slumber or fall by the way from the chosen few who go marching on the chosen few know it and suffer even in the most valiant there is a secret melancholy a feeling of their own impotence and isolation. Worst of all, cut off from the great mass of their people, they're also cut off from each other. Each must fight for his own hand. The strong among them think only of self-preservation. O oh, man, help thyself. They never dream that the sturdy saying means, O oh, men, help yourselves. In all there is a want of confidence. They lack free-flowing sympathy and do not feel the need of common action which makes a race victorious, the feeling of overflowing strength, of reaching upward to the zenith. Christophe and Olivier knew something of all this, in Paris full of men and women who could have understood them, in the house, peopled with unknown friends, they were as solitary as in a desert of Asia. They were very poor, their resources were almost nil. Christophe had only the copying and transcriptions of music given him by Hecht. Olivier had very unwisely thrown up his post at the university during the period of depression following on his sister's death, which had been accentuated by an unhappy love affair with a young lady he'd met at Madame Nathan's. He had never mentioned it to Christophe, for he was modest about his troubles. Part of his charm lay in the little air of mystery which he always preserved about his private affairs, even with his friend, from whom, however, he made no attempt to conceal anything. In his depressed condition, when he had longed for silence, his work as a lecturer became intolerable to him. He never cared for the profession, which necessitates a certain amount of showing off and thinking aloud, while it gives a man no time to himself. If teaching in a school is to be at all a noble thing, it must be a matter of a sort of apostolic vocation, and that Olivier did not possess in the slightest degree, and lecturing for any of the faculties means being perpetually in contact with the public, which is a grim fate for a man like Olivier with a desire for solitude. On several occasions he had to speak in public. It gave him a singular feeling of humiliation. At first he loathed being exhibited on a platform. He saw the audience, felt it as with antennae, 
and knew that for the most part it was composed of idle people who were there only for the sake of having something to do and the role of official entertainer was not at all to his liking worst of all speaking from a platform is almost bound to distort ideas if the speaker does not take care there is a danger of his passing gradually from a certain theatricality in gesture diction attitude and the form in which he presents his ideas to mental trickery a lecture is a thing hovering in the balance between tiresome comedy and polite pedantry for an artist who is rather bashful and proud a lecture which is a monologue shouted in the presence of a few hundred unknown silent people a ready-made garment warranted to fit all sizes though it actually fits no one is a thing intolerably false olivier being more and more under the necessity of withdrawing into himself and saying nothing which was not wholly the expression of his thought gave up the profession of teaching which he had had so much difficulty in entering and as he no longer had his sister to check him in his tendency to dream, he began to write. He was naive enough to believe that his undoubted worth as an artist could not fail to be recognized without his doing anything to procure recognition. He was quickly undeceived. He found it impossible to get anything published. He had a jealous love of liberty which gave him a horror of everything that might impinge on it and made him live apart like a poor, starved plant among the solid masses of the political churches whose baleful associations divided the country and the press between them. He was just as much cut off from all the literary coteries and rejected by them. He had not, nor could he have, a single friend among them. He was repelled by the hardness, the dryness, the egoism of the intellectuals, except for the very few who were following a real vocation, or were absorbed by a passionate enthusiasm for scientific research. That man is a sorry creature who has let his heart atrophy for the sake of his mind, when his mind is small. In such a man there is no kindness, only a brain like a dagger in a sheath. There is no knowing, but it will one day cut your throat. Against such a man it is necessary to be always armed. Friendship is only possible with honest men who love fine things for their own sake and not for what they can make out of them, those who live outside their art. The majority of men cannot breathe the atmosphere of art. Only the very great can live in it, without loss of love, which is the source of life. Olivier could only count on himself, and that was a very precarious support. Any fresh step was a matter of extreme difficulty to him. He was not disposed to accept humiliation for the sake of his work. He went hot with shame at the base and obsequious homage which young authors forced themselves to pay to a well-known theatre manager who took advantage of their cowardice and treated them as he would never dare to treat his servants. Olivier could never have done that to save his life. He just sent his manuscripts by post, or left them at the offices of the theatres or the reviews where they lay for months unread. However, one day... By chance, he met one of his old schoolfellows, an amiable loafer, who had still a sort of grateful admiration for him for the ease and readiness with which Olivier had done his exercises. He knew nothing at all about literature, but he knew several literary men, which was much better. He was rich and in society, something of a snob, and so he let them discreetly exploit him. He put in a word for Olivier with the editor of an important review in which he was a shareholder, and at once one of his forgotten manuscripts was disinterred and read, and after much temporization, for if the article seemed to be worth something the author's name being unknown was valueless, they decided to accept it. When he heard the good news, Olivier thought his troubles were over. They were only just beginning. It is comparatively easy to have an article accepted in Paris, but getting it published is quite a different matter. The unhappy writer has to wait and wait for months, if need be for life, if he has not acquired the trick of flattering people or bullying them, and showing himself from time to time at receptions of these petty monarchs, and reminding them of his existence, and making it clear that he means to go on being a nuisance to them as long as they make it necessary. Olivier just stayed at home, and wore himself out with waiting. At best, he would write a letter or two which were never answered. He would lose heart and be unable to work. It was quite absurd, but there was nothing to be done. 
He would wait for post after post, sitting at his desk with his mind blanketed by all sorts of vague injuries. Then he would get up and go downstairs to the porter's room and look hopefully in his letter-box, only to meet with disappointment. He would walk blindly about, with no thought in his head but to go back and look again, and when the last post had gone, when the silence of his room was broken only by the heavy footsteps of the people in the room above, he would feel strangled by the cruel indifference of it all. Only a word of reply, only a word. Could that be refused him, if only in charity? And yet those who refused him that had no idea of the hurt they were dealing him. Every man sees the world in his own image. Those who have no life in their hearts see the universe as withered and dry, and they never dream of the anguish of expectation, hope, and suffering which rends the hearts of the young, or if they give it a thought, they judge them coldly, with the weary, ponderous irony of those who are surfeited and beyond the freshness of life. At last the article appeared. Olivier had waited so long that it gave him no pleasure. The thing was dead for him, and yet he hoped desperately that it would be a living thing for others. There were flashes of poetry and intelligence in it which could not pass unnoticed. It fell upon absolute silence. He made two or three more attempts. Being attached to no clique, he met with silence or hostility everywhere. He could not understand it. He had thought simply that everybody must be naturally well disposed towards the work of a new man, even if it was not very good. It always represents such an amount of work, and surely people would be grateful to a man who's tried to give others a little beauty, a little force, a little joy. But he only met with indifference or disparagement, and yet he knew that he could not be alone in feeling what he'd written, and that it must be in the minds of other good men. He did not know that such good men did not read him, and had nothing to do with literary opinion, or with anything, or with anything. If here and there there were a few men whom his words had reached, men who sympathized with him, they would never tell him so. They remained immured in their unnatural silence, just as they refrained from voting, so they took no share in art. They did not read books, which shocked them. They did not go to the theatre, which disgusted them. But they let their enemies vote, elect their enemies, engineer a scandalous success and a vulgar celebrity for books and plays and ideas, which only represented an impudent minority of the people of France. Since Olivier could not count on those who were mentally akin to himself as they did not read, he was delivered up to the hosts of the enemy, to the mercy of men of letters, who were for the most part hostile to his ideas, and the critics who were at their beck and call. His first bouts with them left him bleeding. He was as sensitive to criticism as old Bruchner, who could not bear to have his work performed because he'd suffered so much from the malevolence of the press. He did not even win the support of his former colleagues at the university, who, thanks to their profession, did preserve a certain sense of the intellectual traditions of France and might have understood him. But for the most part, these excellent young men, cramped by discipline, absorbed in their work, often rather embittered by their thankless duties, could not forgive Olivier for trying to break away and do something else. Like good little officials, many of them were inclined only to admit the superiority of talent when it was consonant with hierarchic superiority. In such a position, three courses were open to him, to break down resistance by force, to submit to humiliating compromises, or to make up his mind to write only for himself. Olivier was incapable of the two first. He surrendered to the third. To make a living he went through the drudgery of teaching and went on writing, and as there was no possibility of his work attaining full growth in publicity, it became more and more involved, chimerical and unreal. Christophe dropped like a thunderbolt into the midst of his dim crepuscular life. He was furious at the wickedness of people and Olivier's patience. Have you no blood in your veins, he would say. How can you stand such a life? You know your own superiority to these swine, and yet you let them squeeze the life out of you without a murmur. What can I do, Olivier would say. I can't defend myself. It revolts me to fight with people I despise. I know that they can use every weapon against me, and I can't. 
Not only should I loathe to stoop to use the means they employ, but I would be afraid of hurting them. When I was a boy, I used to let my schoolfellows beat me as much as they liked. They used to think me a coward and that I was afraid of being hit. I was more afraid of hitting than of being hit. I remember someone saying to me one day when one of my tormentors was bullying me, Why don't you stop it once and for all and give him a kick in the stomach? That filled me with horror. I would much rather be thrashed. There's no blood in your veins, said Christophe, and on top of that, all sorts of Christian ideas. Your religious education in France is reduced to the catechism, the immaculate gospel, the tame, boneless New Testament, humanitarian claptrap, always tearful, and the revolution, Jean-Jacques, Robespierre, quarante-huit, and on top of that, the Jews. Take a dose of the full-blooded Old Testament every morning. Olivier protested. He had a natural antipathy for the Old Testament, a feeling which dated back to his childhood when he used secretly to pore over an illustrated Bible which had been in the library at home, where it was never read, and the children were even forbidden to open it. The prohibition was useless. Olivier could never keep the book open for long. He used quickly to grow irritated and saddened by it, and then he would close it, and he would find consolation in plunging into the Iliad, or the Odyssey, or the Arabian Nights. The gods of the Iliad are men, beautiful, mighty, vicious. I can understand them, said Olivier. I like them or dislike them. Even when I dislike them, I still love them. I'm in love with them. More than once with Patroclus, I have kissed the lovely feet of Achilles as he lay bleeding. But the god of the Bible is an old Jew, a manic, a monomaniac, a raging madman who spends his time in growling and hurling threats and howling like an angry wolf, raving to himself in the confinement of that cloud of his. I don't understand him. I don't love him. His perpetual curses make my head ache, and his savagery fills me with horror. The burden of Moab, the burden of Damascus, the burden of Babylon, the burden of Egypt, the burden of the desert of the sea, the burden of the valley of vision. He's a lunatic who thinks himself judge, public prosecutor, and executioner rolled into one, and even in the courtyard of his prison he pronounces sentence of death on the flowers and the pebbles. One is stupefied by the tenacity of his hatred, which fills the book with bloody cries. Quote, the cry of destruction, the cry is gone round the borders of Moab, the howling thereof unto Eglaim, and the howling thereof unto Be'erelim. Every now and then he takes a rest and looks round on his massacres and the little children done to death, and the women outraged and butchered and he laughs like one of the captains of Joshua, feasting after the sack of a town. Quote, and the Lord of hosts shall make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the lees well refined. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood, it is made fat with fatness, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. End quote. But worst of all is the perfidy with which this God sends his prophet to make men blind, so that in due course he may have a reason for making them suffer. Quote, make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Lord, how long? until the cities be wasted without inhabitants, and the houses without men, and the land be utterly desolate. End quote. Oh, I have never found a man so evil as that. I am not so foolish as to deny the force of the language, but I cannot separate thought and form, and if I do occasionally admire this Hebrew god, it is with the same sort of admiration that I feel for a viper, or a I'm trying in vain to find a Shakespearean monster as an example. I can't find one. Even Shakespeare never begat such a hero of hatred, saintly and virtuous hatred. Such a book is a terrible thing. Madness is always contagious. 
and that particular madness is all the more dangerous inasmuch as it sets up its own murderous pride as an instrument of purification. England makes me shudder when I think that her people have for centuries been nourished on no other fare. I'm glad to think that there is the dyke of the channel between them and me. I shall never believe that a nation is altogether civilized as long as the Bible is its staple food. In that case, said Christophe, you will have to be just as much afraid of me, for I get drunk on it. It is the very marrow of a race of lions. Stout hearts are those which feed on it. Without the antidote of the Old Testament, the gospel is tasteless and unwholesome fare. The Bible is the bone and sinew of nations with the will to live. A man must fight, and he must hate. I hate hatred, said Olivier. I only wish you did, retorted Christophe. You're right. I am too weak even for that. What would you? I can't help seeing the arguments in favour of my enemies, and I say to myself over and over again, like Chardin, gentleness, gentleness. What a silly sheep you are, said Christophe. But whether you like it or not, I'm going to make you leap the ditch you're shying at, and I'm going to drag you on and beat the big drum for you. In the upshot, he took Olivier's affairs in hand and set out to do battle for him. His first efforts were not very successful. He lost his temper at the very outset and did his friend much harm by pleading his cause. He recognized what he had done very quickly and was in despair at his own clumsiness. Olivier did not stand idly by. He went and fought for Christophe. In spite of his fear and dislike of fighting, in spite of his lucid and ironical mind, which scorned any sort of exaggeration in word and deed, when it came to defending Christophe he was far more violent than anybody else, and even than Christophe himself. He lost his head. Love makes a man irrational, and Olivier was no exception to the rule. However, he was cleverer than Christophe. Though he was uncompromising and clumsy in handling his own affairs, when it came to promoting Christophe's success he was politic and even tricky. He displayed an energy and ingenuity well calculated to win support. He succeeded in interesting various musical critics and maecenases in Christophe, though he would have been utterly ashamed to approach them with his own work. In spite of everything they found it very difficult to better their lot. Their love for each other made them do many stupid things. Christophe got into debt over getting a volume of Olivier's poems published secretly, and not a single copy was sold. Olivier induced Christophe to give a concert, and hardly anybody came to it. Faced with the empty hall, Christophe consoled himself bravely with Handel's quip. Splendid! My music will sound all the better. But these bold attempts did not repay the money they cost and they would go back to their rooms full of indignation at the indifference of the world. End of section 34, read by Sandra, Montreal, 2020. Section 35 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canon. The House. Chapter 2, Part 2 In their difficulties, the only man who came to their aid was a Jew, a man of forty named Tade Mout. He kept an art photograph shop, but although he was interested in his trade and brought much taste and skill to bear on it, he was interested in so many things outside it that he was apt to neglect his business for them. When he did attend to his business, he was chiefly engaged in perfecting technical devices, and he would lose his head over new reproduction processes, which, in spite of their ingenuity, hardly ever succeeded, and always cost him a great deal of money. He was a voracious reader, and was always hard on the heels of every new idea in philosophy, art, science, and politics. He had an amazing knack of finding out men of originality and independence of character. It was as though he answered to their magnetism. He was a sort of connecting link between Olivier's friends, who were all as isolated as himself, and all working in their several directions. He used to go from one to the other, and through him there was established between them a complete circuit of ideas, though neither he nor they had any notion of it. When Olivier first proposed to introduce him to Christophe, Christophe refused. He was sick of his experiences with the tribe of Israel. 
Olivier laughed and insisted on it, saying that he knew no more of the Jews than he did of France. At last Christophe consented, but when he saw Tadej Mouch, he made a face. In appearance, Mouch was extraordinarily Jewish. He was the Jew, as he's drawn by those who dislike the race. Short, bald, badly built, with a greasy nose, and heavy eyes goggling behind large spectacles. His face was hidden by a rough, black, scrubby beard. He had hairy hands, long arms, and short, bandy legs, a little Syrian ball. But he had such a kindly expression that Kistoff was touched by it. Above all, he was very simple and never talked too much. He never paid exaggerated compliments, but just dropped the right word, pat. He was very eager to be of service, and before any kindness was asked of him, it would be done. He often came, too often, and he almost always brought good news, work for one or other of them, a commission for an article or a lecture for Olivier or music lessons for Christophe. He never stayed long. It was a sort of affectation with him never to intrude. Perhaps he saw Christophe's irritation, for his first impulse was always towards an ejaculation of impatience when he saw the bearded face of the Carthaginian idol. He used to call him Moloch, a peer round the door, but the next moment it would be gone, and he would feel nothing but gratitude for his perfect kindness. Kindness is not a rare quality with the Jews. Of all the virtues, it is the most readily admitted among them, even when they do not practice it. Indeed, in most of them it remains negative or neutral. Indulgence, indifference, dislike for hurting anybody, ironic tolerance. With Moot it was an active passion. He was always ready to devote himself to some cause or person, to his poor co-religionists, to the Russian refugees, to the oppressed of every nation, to unfortunate artists, to the alleviation of every kind of misfortune, to every generous cause. His purse was always open, and however thinly lined it might be, he could always manage to squeeze a mite out of it. When it was empty, he would squeeze the mite out of someone else's purse. If he could do anyone a service, no pains were too great for him to take. No distance was too far for him to go. He did it simply with exaggerated simplicity. He was a little apt to talk too much about his simplicity and sincerity, but the great thing was that he was both simple and sincere. Christophe was torn between irritation and sympathy with Moot, and one day he said an innocently cruel thing, though he said it with the air of a spoiled child. Moot's kindness had touched him, and he took his hands affectionately and said, What a pity! What a pity it is that you are a Jew! Olivier started and blushed as though the shaft had been levelled at himself. He was most unhappy and tried to heal the wound his friend had dealt. Mooch smiled with sad irony and replied calmly, It is an even greater misfortune to be a man. To Christophe the remark was nothing but the whim of a moment, but its pessimism cut deeper than he imagined, and Olivier, with his subtle perception, felt it intuitively. Beneath the Mooch of their acquaintance there was another, different Mooch, who was in many ways exactly the opposite. His apparent nature was the result of a long struggle with his real nature. Though he was apparently so simple, he had a distorted mind. When he gave way to it, he was forced to complicate simple things and to endow his most genuine feelings with a deliberately ironical character. Though he was apparently modest, and if anything too humble, at heart he was proud and knew it, and strove desperately to whip it out of himself. His smiling optimism, his incessant activity, his perpetual business in helping others were the mask of a profound nihilism a deadly despondency which dared not see itself face to face. Mooch made a show of immense faith in all sorts of things, in the progress of humanity, in the future of the pure Jewish spirit, in the destiny of France, the soldier of the new spirit. He was apt to identify the three causes. Olivier was not taken in by it, and used to say to Christophe, at heart he believes in nothing. With all his ironical common sense and calmness, Mooch was a neurasthenic who dared not look upon the void within himself. He had terrible moments when he felt his nothingness. Sometimes he would wake suddenly in the middle of the night screaming with terror, and he would cast about for things to do like a drowning man clinging to a life boy. It is a costly privilege to be a member of a race which is exceedingly old. It means the bearing of a frightful burden of the past trials and tribulations, 
weary experience, disillusion of mind and heart, all the ferment of immemorial life, at the bottom of which is a bitter deposit of irony and boredom, boredom, the immense boredom of the Semites, which has nothing in common with our Aryan boredom, though that too makes us suffer, while it is at least traceable to definite causes and vanishes when those causes cease to exist. For in most cases it is only the result of regret that we cannot have what we want, but in some of the Jews the very source of joy and life is tainted with a deadly poison. They have no desire, no interest in anything, no ambition, no love, no pleasure. Only one thing continues to exist, not intact, but morbid and fine-drawn in these men, uprooted from the East, worn out by the amount of energy they have had to give out for centuries, longing for quietude without having the power to attain it, thought, endless analysis which forbids the possibility of enjoyment and leaves them no courage for action. The most energetic among them set themselves parts to play, and play them, rather than act on their own account. It is a strange thing that in many of them, and not in the least intelligent or least seriously minded, this lack of interest in life prompts the impulse or the unavowed desire to act a part, to play at life, the only means they know of living. Mutre was an actor after his fashion. He rushed about to try to deaden his senses. But whereas most people only bestir themselves for selfish reasons, he was restlessly active in procuring the happiness of others. His devotion to Christophe was both touching and a bore. Christophe would snub him and then immediately be sorry for it. But Mutre never bore him any ill will. Nothing abashed him. Not that he had any ardent affection for Christophe. It was devotion that he loved rather than the men to whom he devoted himself. They were only an excuse for doing good, for living. He laboured to such effect that he managed to induce Hecht to publish Christophe's David and some other compositions. Hecht appreciated Christophe's talent, but he was in no hurry to reveal it to the world. It was not until he saw that Mutsch was on the point of arranging the publication at his own expense with another firm that he took the initiative out of vanity. And on another occasion, when things were very serious and Olivier was ill and they had no money, Mutsch thought of going to Felix Weil, the rich archaeologist who lived in the same house. Mutsch and Weil were acquainted, but had little sympathy with one another. They were too different. Mooch's restlessness and mysticism and revolutionary ideas and vulgar manners, which perhaps he exaggerated, were an incentive to the irony of Felix Weil, with his calm, mocking temper, his distinguished manners and conservative mind. They had only one thing in common. They were both equally lacking in any profound interest in action, and if they did indulge in action, it was not from faith, but from their tenacious and mechanical vitality. But neither was prepared to admit it. They preferred to give their minds to the parts they were playing, and their different parts had very little in common, and so Mooch was quite coldly received by Weil when he tried to interest him in the artistic projects of Olivier and Christophe. He was brought up sharp against a mocking scepticism. Mooch's perpetual embarkations for one utopia or another were a standing joke in Jewish society, where he was regarded as a dangerous visionary. But on this occasion, as on so many others, he was not put out and he went on speaking about the friendship of Christophe and Olivier until he roused Weil's interest. He saw that and went on. He had touched a responsive chord. The friendless, solitary old man worshipped friendship. The one great love of his life had been a friendship which he had left behind him. It was his inward treasure. When he thought of it, he felt a better man. He had founded institutions in his friend's name, and had dedicated his books to his memory. He was touched by what Mooch told him of the mutual tenderness of Christophe and Olivier. His own story had been something like it. His lost friend had been a sort of elder brother to him, a comrade of youth, a guide whom he had idolized. That friend had been one of those young Jews, burning with intelligence and generous ardor, who suffer from the hardness of their surroundings and set themselves to uplift their race, and through their race the world and burn hotly into flame and, like a torch of rosin, flare for a few hours and then die. The flame of his life had kindled the apathy of young Weil. He had raised him from the earth. While his friend was alive, 
while had marched by his side in the shining light of his stoical faith faith in science in the power of the spirit in a future happiness the rays of which were shed upon everything with which that messianic soul came in contact when he was left alone in his weakness and irony vile fell from the heights of that idealism into the sands of that book of ecclesiastes which exists in the mind of every jew and saps his spiritual vitality but he had never forgotten the hours spent in the light with his friend jealously he guarded its clarity now almost entirely faded he had never spoken of him to a soul not even to his wife whom he loved it was a sacred thing and the old man who was considered prosaic and dry of heart and nearing the end of his life used to say to himself the bitter and tender words of a brahmin of ancient india quote, the poisoned tree of the world puts forth two fruits sweeter than the waters of the fountain of life one is poetry the other friendship End quote. from that time on he took an interest in christophe and olivier he knew how proud they were and got mooch without saying anything to send him olivier's volume of poems which had just been published and without the two friends having anything to do with it, without their having even the smallest idea of what he was up to, he managed to get the Academy to award the book a prize, which came in the nick of time to help them in their difficulty. When Christophe discovered that such unlooked-for assistance came from a man of whom he was inclined to think ill, he regretted all the unkind things he'd said or thought of him. He gulped down his dislike of calling and went and thanked him, his good intentions met with no reward. Old Vile's irony was excited by Christophe's young enthusiasm, although he tried hard to conceal it from him, and they did not get on at all well. That very day, when Christophe returned irritated, though still grateful, to his attic, after his interview with Vile, he found Mooch there, doing Olivier some fresh act of service, and also a review containing a disparaging article on his music by Lucien Lévicard. It was not written in a vein of frank criticism, but took the insultingly kindly line of chafing him and banteringly considering him alongside certain third-rate and fourth-rate musicians whom he loathed. "'You see,' said Christophe to Olivier, after Mooch had gone, "'we always have to deal with Jews. Nothing but Jews. Perhaps we're Jews ourselves. Do tell me that we're not. We seem to attract them.' We're always knocking up against them, both friends and foes. The reason is, said Olivier, that they are more intelligent than the rest. The Jews are almost the only people in France to whom a free man can talk of new and vital things. The rest are stuck fast in the past among dead things. Unfortunately, the past does not exist for the Jews, or at least it is not the same for them as for us. With them we can only talk about the things of today. With our fellow countrymen, we can only discuss the things of yesterday. Look at the activity of the Jews in every kind of way. Commerce, industry, education, science, philanthropy, art. Don't let's talk about art, said Christophe. I don't say that I'm always in sympathy with what they do. Very often I detest it. But at least they are alive and can understand men who are alive. It's all very well for us to criticize and make fun of the Jews and speak ill of them. We can't do without them. Don't exaggerate, said Christophe jokingly. I could do without them perfectly. You might go on living, perhaps, but what good would that be to you if your life and your work remained unknown, as they probably would without the Jews? Would the members of your own religion come to your assistance? The Catholic Church lets the best of its members perish without raising a hand to help them. Men who are religious from the very bottom of their hearts men who give their lives in the defense of God, if they have dared to break away from Catholic dominion and shake off the authority of Rome, at once find the unworthy mob who call themselves Catholic not only indifferent but hostile. They condemn them to silence and abandon them to the mercy of the common enemy. If a man of independent spirit, be he never so great and Christian at heart, is not a Christian as a matter of obedience, it is nothing to the catholics that in him is incarnate all that is most pure and most truly divine in their faith he is not of the pack the blind and deaf sect which refuses to think for itself he's cast out and the rest rejoice to see him suffering alone torn to pieces by the enemy and crying for help to those who are his brothers for whose faith he is done to death 
In the Catholicism of today, there's a horrible death-dealing power of inertia. It would find it far easier to forgive its enemies than those who wish to wake it and restore it to life. My dear Christophe, where should we be and what should we do, we who are Catholics by birth, we who have shaken free without the little band of free Protestants and Jews. The Jews in Europe of today are the most active and living agents of good and evil. They carry hither and thither the pollen of thought. Have not your worst enemies and your friends from the very beginning been Jews? That's true, said Christophe. They have given me encouragement and help and said things to me which have given me new life for the struggle by showing me that I was understood. No doubt very few of my friends have remained faithful to me. Their friendship was but a fire of straw. No matter. That fleeting light is a great thing in darkness. You're right. We mustn't be ungrateful. We must not be stupid, either, replied Olivier. We must not mutilate our already diseased civilization by lopping off some of its most living branches. If we were so unfortunate as to have the Jews driven from Europe— we should be left so poor in intelligence and power for action that we should be in danger of utter bankruptcy. In France, especially in the present condition of French vitality, their expulsion would mean a more deadly drain on the blood of the nation than the expulsion of the Protestants in the 17th century. No doubt, for the time being, they do occupy a position out of all proportion to their true merit. They do take advantage of the present moral and political anarchy which in no small degree they help to aggravate because it suits them and because it's natural to them to do so. The best of them, like our friend Mooch, make the mistake in all sincerity of identifying the destiny of France with their Jewish dreams, which are often more dangerous than useful. But you can't blame them for wanting to build France in their own image. It means that they love the country. If their love becomes a public danger, all we have to do is to defend ourselves and keep them in their place, which in France is the second. Not that I think their race inferior to ours. All these questions of the supremacy of races are idiotic and disgusting. But we cannot admit that a foreign race which has not yet been fused into our own can possibly know better than we do what suits us. The Jews are well off in France. I'm glad of it. They must not think of turning France into Judea. An intelligent and strong government which was able to keep the Jews in their place would make them one of the most useful instruments for the building of the greatness of France, and it would be doing both them and us a great service. These hyper-nervous, restless, and unsettled creatures need the restraint of law and the firm hand of a just master, in whom there is no weakness, to curb them. The Jews are like women, admirable when they are reined in. But with the Jews, as with women, their use of mastery is an abomination and those who submit to it present a pitiful and absurd spectacle. In spite of their love for each other and the intuitive knowledge that came with it, there were many things which Christophe and Olivier could not understand in each other, things, too, which shocked them. In the beginning of their friendship, when each tried instinctively only to suffer the existence of those qualities in himself which were most like the qualities of his friend, they never remarked them. It was only gradually that the different aspects of their two nationalities appeared on the surface again, more sharply defined than before, for being in contrast each showed the other up. There were moments of difficulty, moments when they clashed, which with all their fond indulgence they could not altogether avoid. Sometimes they misunderstood each other. Olivier's mind was a mixture of faith, liberty, passion, irony, and universal doubt, for which Christophe could not find any working formula. Olivier, on his part, was distressed by Christophe's lack of psychology. Being of an old intellectual stock and therefore aristocratic, he was moved to smile at the awkwardness of such a vigorous, though lumbering and single mind, which had no power of self-analysis and was always being taken in by others and by itself. Christophe's sentimentality, his noisy outbursts, his facile emotions, used sometimes to exasperate Olivier, to whom they seemed absurd not to speak of a certain worship of force, the German conviction of the excellence of fist morality, Faustrecht, to which Olivier and his countrymen had good reason for not subscribing, and Christophe could not bear Olivier's irony, which used sometimes to make him furious with exasperation. He could not bear his mania for arguing, 
his perpetual analysis and the curious intellectual immorality which was surprising in a man who set so much store by moral purity as olivier and arose from the very breadth of his mind to which every kind of negation was detestable so that he took a delight in the contemplation of ideas the opposite of his own a lady's outlook on things was in some sort historical and panoramic it was so necessary for him to understand everything that he always saw reasons both for and against and supported each in turn according as the opposite thesis was put forward and so amid such contradictions he lost his way he would leave christophe hopelessly perplexed it was not that he had any desire to contradict or any taste for paradox it was an imperious need in him for justice and common sense he was exasperated by the stupidity of any assumption and he had to react against it the crudeness with which christophe judged immoral men and actions by seeing everything as much coarser and more brutal than it really was distressed olivier who was just as moral but was not of the same unbending steel he allowed himself to be tempted coloured and moulded by outside influences he would protest against christophe's exaggerations and fly off into exaggeration in the opposite direction almost every day this perverseness of mind would make him take up the cudgels for his adversaries against his friends christophe would lose his temper he would cry out upon olivier's sophistry and his indulgence of hateful things and people olivier would smile he knew the utter absence of illusion that lay behind his indulgence he knew that christophe believed in many more things than he did and had a greater power of acceptance but christophe would look neither to the right hand nor the left but went straight ahead he was especially angry with parisian kindness their great argument of which they are so proud in favour of pardoning rascals is he would say that all rascals are sufficiently unhappy in their wickedness or that they are irresponsible or diseased in the first place it's not true that those who do evil are unhappy that's a moral idea in action a silly melodramatic idea stupid empty optimism such as you find in scribe and capus scribe and capus your parisian great men artists of whom your pleasure-seeking vulgar society is worthy childish hypocrites too cowardly to face their own ugliness it is quite possible for a rascal to be a happy man he has every chance of being so and as for his irresponsibility that's an idiotic idea do have the courage to face the fact that nature does not care a rap about good and evil and is so far malevolent that a man may easily be a criminal and yet perfectly sound in mind and body virtue is not a natural thing it's the work of man it is his duty to defend it human society has been built up by a few men who were stronger and greater than the rest it is their duty to see that the work of so many ages of frightful struggles is not spoiled by the cowardly rabble at bottom there was no great difference between these ideas and olivier's but by a secret instinct for balance and proportion he was never so dilettante as when he heard provocative words thrown out don't get so excited my friend he would say to christophe let the world hug its vices like the friends in the decameron let us breathe in peace the balmy air of the gardens of thought while under the cypress hill and the tall shady pines twined about with roses florence is devastated by the black plague he would amuse himself for days together by pulling to pieces art science philosophy to find their hidden wheels so he came by a sort of pyrrhonism in which everything that was became only a figment of the mind a castle in the air which had not even the excuse of the geometric symbols of being necessary to the mind christophe would rage against his pulling the machine to pieces it was going quite well you'll probably break it then how will you be better off what are you trying to prove that nothing is nothing good lord i know that it is because nothingness creeps in upon us from every side that we fight nothing exists i exist there's no reason for doing anything i'm doing what i can if people like death let them die for my part i'm alive and i'm going to live my life is in one scale of the balance my mind and thought in the other to hell with thought he would fly off with his usual violence and in their argument he would say things that hurt hardly had he said them than he was sorry he would long to withdraw them but the harm was done 
Olivier was very sensitive. His skin was easily barked. A harsh word, especially if it came from someone he loved, hurt him terribly. He was too proud to say anything and would retire into himself, and he would see in his friend those sudden flashes of unconscious egoism which appear in every great artist. Sometimes he would feel that his life was no great thing to Christophe compared with a beautiful piece of music. Christophe hardly troubled to disguise the fact. He would understand and see that Christophe was right, but it made him sad. And then... There were in Christos' nature all sorts of disordered elements which eluded Olivier and made him uneasy. He used to have sudden fits of a freakish and terrible humour. For days together he would not speak, or he would break out in diabolically malicious moods and try deliberately to hurt. Sometimes he would disappear altogether and be seen no more for the rest of the day and part of the night. Once he stayed away for two whole days, God knows what he was up to, he was not very clear about it himself. The truth was that his powerful nature shut up in that narrow life and those small rooms, as in a hen coop, every now and then reached bursting point. His friend's calmness maddened him, and he would long to hurt him, to hurt someone. He would have to rush away and wear himself out. He would go striding through the streets of Paris and the outskirts in the vague quest of adventure which sometimes he found and he would not have been sorry to meet with some rough encounter which would have given him the opportunity of expending some of his superfluous energy in a brawl. It was hard for Olivier, with his poor health and weakness of body, to understand. Christophe was not much nearer understanding it. He would wake up from his aberrations as from an exhausting dream, a little uneasy and ashamed of what he'd been doing and might yet do, but when the fit of madness was over, he would feel like a great sky washed by the storm, purged of every taint, serene, and sovereign of his soul. He would be more tender than ever with Olivier, and bitterly sorry for having hurt him. He would give up trying to account for their little quarrels. The wrong was not always on his side, but he would take all the blame upon himself and put it down to his unjust passion for being right— and he would think it better to be wrong with his friend than to be right if right were not on his side. Their misunderstandings were especially grievous when they occurred in the evening, so that the two friends had to spend the night in disunion, which meant that both of them were morally upset. Christophe would get up and scribble a note and slip it under Olivier's door, and next day, as soon as he woke up, he would beg his pardon. Sometimes, even, he would knock at his door in the middle of the night, he could not bear to wait for the day to come before he humbled himself. As a rule, Olivier would be just as unable to sleep. He knew that Christophe loved him and had not wished to hurt him, but he wanted to hear him say so. Christophe would say so, and then the whole thing would be forgotten. Then they would be pacified. Delightful state. How well they would sleep for the rest of the night. Ah, Olivier would sigh, how difficult it is to understand each other. But... Is it necessary always to understand each other? Christophe would ask. I give it up. We only need love each other. All these petty quarrels, which with anxious tenderness they would at once find ways of mending, made them almost dearer to each other than before. When they were hotly arguing, Antoinette would appear in Olivier's eyes. The two friends would pay each other womanish attentions. Christophe never let Olivier's birthday go by without celebrating it, by dedicating a composition to him, or by the gift of flowers, or a cake, or a little present, bought heaven knows how, for they often had no money in the house. Olivier would tire his eyes out with copying out Christophe's scores at night and by stealth. Misunderstandings between friends are never very serious, so long as a third party does not come between them. But that was bound to happen. There are too many people in this world ready to meddle in the affairs of others and make mischief between them. End of section 35 Read by Sandra near Montreal Section 36 of Jean-Christophe in Paris This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland Translated by Gilbert Canon The House Chapter 2 Part 3 Olivier knew the Stevens whom Christophe rarely visited, and he too had been attracted by Colette. The reason why Christophe had not met him in the girl's little court 
was that just at that time Olivier was suffering from his sister's death and had shut himself up with his grief and saw no one. Colette, on her part, did not go out of her way to see him. She liked Olivier, but she did not like unhappy people. She used to declare that she was so sensitive that she could not bear the sight of sorrow. She waited until Olivier's sorrow was over before she remembered his existence. When she heard that he seemed to be himself again, and that there was no danger of infection, she made bold to beckon him to her. Olivier did not need much inducement to go. He was shy, but he liked society, and he was easily led, and he had a weakness for Colette. When he told Christophe of his intention of going back to her, Christophe, who had too much respect for his friend's liberty to express any adverse opinion, just shrugged his shoulders and said jokingly, "'Go, dear boy, if it amuses you.' But nothing would have induced him to follow his example. He had made up his mind to have nothing more to do with a coquette like Colette, or the world she lived in. Not that he was a misogynist, far from it. He had a very tender feeling for all the young women who worked for their living, the factory hands and typists and government clerks, who are to be seen every morning half awake, always a little late, hurrying to their workshops and offices. It seemed to him that a woman was only in possession of all her senses when she was working and struggling for her own individual existence by earning her daily bread and her independence. And it seemed to him that only then did she possess all her charm, her alert suppleness of movement, the awakening of all her senses, her integrity of life and will. He detested the idle, pleasure-seeking woman who seemed to him to be only an overfed animal, perpetually in the act of digestion, bored, browsing over unwholesome dreams. Olivier, on the contrary, adored the farniente of women, their charm like the charm of flowers living only to be beautiful and to perfume the air about them. He was more of an artist. Christophe was more human. Unlike Colette, Christophe loved other people in proportion as they shared in the suffering of the world, so between him and them there was a bond of brotherly compassion. Colette was particularly anxious to see Olivier again, after she heard of his friendship with Christophe, for she was curious to hear the details. She was rather angry with Christophe for the disdainful manner in which he seemed to have forgotten her, and though she had no desire for revenge— it was not worth the trouble, and revenge does mean a certain amount of trouble. She would have been very glad to pay him out. She was like a cat that bites the hand that strokes it. She had an ingratiating way with her, and she had no difficulty in getting Olivier to talk. Nobody could be more clear-sighted than he, or less easily taken in by people when he was away from them. But nobody could be more naively confiding than he when he was with a woman whose eyes smiled kindly at him. Colette displayed so genuine an interest in his friendship with Christophe that he went so far as to tell her the whole story, and even about certain of their amicable misunderstandings, which at a distance seemed amusing, and he took the whole blame for them on himself. He also confided to Colette Christophe's artistic projects, and also some of his opinions which were not altogether flattering concerning France and the French. Nothing that he told her was of any great importance in itself, but Colette repeated it all at once, and adapted it partly to make the story more spicy, and partly to satisfy her secret feeling of malice against Christophe. And as the first person to receive her confidence was naturally her inseparable Lucien Lévicard, who had no reason for keeping it secret, the story went the rounds, and was embellished by the way. A note of ironic pity for Olivier, who was represented as a victim, was introduced, and he cut rather a sorry figure. It seemed unlikely that the story could be very interesting to anybody, since the heroes of it were very little known, but a Parisian takes an interest in everything that does not concern him, so much so that one day Christophe heard the story from the lips of Madame Roussa. She met him one day at a concert, and asked him if it were true that he had quarrelled with that poor Olivier Jeanne and she asked about his work and alluded to things which he believed were known only to himself and Olivier. And when he asked her how she'd come by her information, she said she had had it from Lucien Le Vicard, who had had it direct from Olivier. The blow overwhelmed Christophe. Violent and uncritical as he was, it never occurred to him to think how utterly fantastic the story was. He only saw one thing. His secrets, which he had confided to Olivier, had been betrayed— betrayed to Lucien Le Vicard. He could not stay to the end of the concert. 
he left the hall at once. Around him all was blank and dark. In the street he narrowly escaped being run over, he said to himself over and over again. My friend has betrayed me. Olivier was with Colette. Christophe locked the door of his room, so that when Olivier came in he could not have his usual talk with him. He heard him come in a few moments later and try to open the door and whisper good night through the keyhole. He did not stir. He was sitting on his bed in the dark, holding his head in his hands and saying, over and over again, My friend has betrayed me. And he stayed like that, half through the night. Then he felt how dearly he loved Olivier, for he was not angry with him for having betrayed him. He only suffered. Those whom we love have absolute rights over us, even the right to cease loving us. We cannot bear them any ill will. We can only be angry with ourselves for being so unworthy of love that it must desert us. There is mortal anguish in such a state of mind, anguish which destroys the will to live. Next morning, when he saw Olivier, he did not tell him anything. He so detested the idea of reproaching him, reproaching him for having abused his confidence and flung his secrets into the enemy's maw, that he could not find a single word to say to him. But his face said what he could not speak. His expression was icy and hostile. Olivier was struck dumb. He could not understand it. He tried timidly to discover what Christophe had against him. Christophe turned away from him brutally and made no reply. Olivier was hurt in his turn and said no more, and gulped down his distress in silence. They did not see each other again that day. Even if Olivier had made him suffer a thousand times more, Christophe would never have done anything to avenge himself, and he would have done hardly anything to defend himself. Olivier was sacred to him. But it was necessary that the indignation he felt should be expended upon someone, and since that someone could not be Olivier, it was Lucien Lévicard. With his usual passionate injustice, he put upon him the responsibility for the ill-doing which he attributed to Olivier and he suffered intolerable pangs of jealousy in the thought that such a man as that could have robbed him of his friend's affection, just as he had previously ousted him from his friendship with Colette Stevens. To bring this exasperation to a head, that very day he happened to see an article by Lucien Lévicard on a performance of Fidelio. In it he spoke of Beethoven in a bantering way and poked fun at his heroine. Christophe was as alive as anybody to the absurdities of the opera, and even to certain mistakes in the music. He had not always displayed an exaggerated respect for the acknowledged master himself, but he set no store by always agreeing with his own opinions, nor had he any desire to be friendly logical. He was one of those men who are quite ready to admit the faults of their friends, but cannot bear anybody else to do so. And besides, it was one thing to criticize a great artist, however bitterly, from a passionate faith in art, and even, one may say, from an uncompromising love for his fame and intolerance of anything mediocre in his work, and another thing, as Lucien Le Vicard did, only to use such criticism to flatter the baseness of the public, and to make the gallery laugh by an exhibition of wit at the expense of a great man. Again, free though Christophe was in his judgments, there had always been a certain sort of music which he had tacitly left alone and shielded, music which was not to be tampered with that music which was higher and better than music, the music of an absolutely pure soul, a great health-giving soul to which a man could turn for consolation, strength, and hope. Beethoven's music was in the category. To see a puppy like Le Vicard insulting Beethoven made him blind with anger. It was no longer a question of art, but a question of honor. Everything that makes life rare, love, heroism, passionate virtue, the good human longing for self-sacrifice, was at stake. The Godhead itself was imperiled. There was no room for argument. It is as impossible to suffer that to be besmirched as to hear the woman you respect and love insulted. There is but one thing to do, to hate and kill. What is there to say when the insulting blackguard was of all men, the one whom Christophe most despised? and, as luck would have it, that very evening the two men came face to face. To avoid being left alone with Olivier, contrary to his habit, Christophe went to an at-home at the Roussins. He was asked to play. He consented unwillingly, 
However, after a moment or two, he became absorbed in the music he was playing, until glancing up he saw Lucien Lévica standing in a little group, watching him with an ironical stare. He stopped short in the middle of a bar. He got up and turned away from the piano. There was an awkward silence. Madame Roussin came up to Christophe in her surprise and smiled forcedly and very cautiously, for she was not sure whether the piece was finished or not. She asked him, "'Won't you go on, Monsieur Kraft?' "'I've finished,' he replied curtly. He had hardly said it, then he became conscious of his rudeness, but instead of making him more restrained it only excited him the more. He paid no heed to the amused attention of his auditors, but went and sat in a corner of the room from which he could follow Lucien Lévica's movements. His neighbor, an old general with a pinkish, sleepy face, light blue eyes and a childish expression, thought it incumbent on him to compliment on the originality of his music. Christophe bowed irritably and growled out a few inarticulate sounds. The general went on talking with effusive politeness and a gentle, meaningless smile and he wanted Christophe to explain how he could play such a long piece of music from memory. Christophe fidgeted impatiently and thought wildly of knocking the old gentleman off the sofa. He wanted to hear what Lucien Lévicard was saying. He was waiting for an excuse for attacking him. For some moments past he'd been conscious that he was going to make a fool of himself, but no power on earth could have kept him from it. Lucien Lévicard, in his high falsetto voice, was explaining the aims and secret thoughts of great artists to a circle of ladies. During a moment of silence, Christophe heard him talking about the friendship of Wagner and King Ludwig, with all sorts of nasty innuendos. Stop, he shouted, bringing his fist down on the table by his side. Everybody turned in amazement. Lucien Lévicard met Christophe's eyes and paled a little and said, were you speaking to me? You hound. Yes, said Christophe. He sprang to his feet. You soil and sully everything that is great in the world, he went on furiously. There's the door. Get out, you cur, or I'll fling you through the window. He moved towards him. The ladies moved aside, screaming. There was a moment of general confusion. Christophe was surrounded at once. Lucien Lévicard had half risen to his feet, then he resumed his careless attitude in his chair. He called a servant who was passing and gave him a card, and he went on with his remarks as though nothing had happened. But his eyelids were twitching nervously, and his eyes blinked as he looked this way and that to see how people had taken it. Roussin had taken his stand in front of Christophe, and he took him by the lapel of his coat and urged him in the direction of the door. Christophe hung his head in his anger and shame, and his eyes saw nothing but the wide expanse of shirt front, and kept on counting the diamond studs, and he could feel the big man's breath on his cheek. Come, come, my dear fellow, said Roussin. What's the matter with you? Where are your manners? Control yourself. Do you know where you are? Come, come, are you mad? I'm damned if I ever set foot in your house again, said Christophe breaking free, and he reached the door. The people prudently made way for him. In the cloakroom a servant held out a salver. It contained Lucien Lévicard's card. He took it without understanding what it meant and read it aloud. Then, suddenly, snorting with rage, he fumbled in his pockets. Mixed up with a varied assortment of things, he pulled out three or four crumpled, dirty cards. There. There, he said flinging them on the salver so violently that one of them fell to the ground. He left the house. End of section 36 Read by section 37 of Jean-Christophe in Paris This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland Translated by Gilbert Canon The House Chapter 2 Part 4 Olivier knew nothing about it. Christophe chose as his witnesses the first men of his acquaintance who turned up, the musical critic Théophile Goujard, and a German, Dr. Barth, an honorary lecturer in a Swiss university, whom he'd met one night in a café. He had made friends with him, though they had little in common, but they could talk to each other about Germany. After conferring with Lucien Lévicard's witnesses, 
pistols were chosen Christophe was absolutely ignorant about the use of arms and goujard told him it would not be a bad thing for him to go and have a few lessons but christophe refused and while he was waiting for the day to come went on with his work but his mind was distracted he had a fixed idea of which he was dimly conscious while it kept buzzing in his head like a bad dream it was unpleasant yes very unpleasant what was unpleasant oh the duel to-morrow just a joke nobody's ever hurt but it was possible well then afterwards afterwards that was it afterwards a cock of the finger by that swine who hates me may wipe out my life so be it yes to-morrow in a day or two i may be lying in the loathsome soil of paris bah here or anywhere what does it matter oh lord i'm not going to play the coward no but it would be monstrous to waste the mighty world of ideas that i feel springing to life in me for a moment's folly what rot it is these modern duels in which they try to equalize the chances of the two opponents that's a fine sort of equality that sets the same value on the life of a mountebank as on mine why don't they let us go for each other with fists and cudgels there'd be some pleasure in that but this cold-blooded shooting and of course he knows how to shoot and i've never had a pistol in my hand they're right i must learn he'll try to kill me i'll kill him he went out there was a range a few yards away from the house christophe asked for a pistol and had it explained how he ought to hold it with his first shot he almost killed his instructor he went on with a second and a third and fared no better he lost patience and went from bad to worse a few young men were standing by and watching and laughing he paid no heed to them with his german persistency he went on trying and was so indifferent to their laughter and so determined to succeed that as always happens his blundering patience roused interest and one of the spectators gave him advice in spite of his usual violence he listened to everything with childlike docility he managed to control his nerves which were making his hand tremble he stiffened himself and knit his brows the sweat was pouring down his cheeks he said not a word but every now and then he would give way to a gust of anger and then go on shooting he stayed there for a couple of hours at the end of that time he hit the bull's-eye few things could have been more absorbing than the sight of such a power of will mastering an awkward and rebellious body it inspired respect some of those who had scoffed at the outset had gone and the others were silenced one by one and had not been able to tear themselves away they took off their hats to christophe when he went away when he reached home christophe found his friend mooch waiting anxiously mooch had learned of the quarrel and had come at once he wanted to know how it had originated in spite of christophe's reticence and desire not to attach any blame to olivier he guessed the reason he was very cool-headed and knew both the friends and had no doubt of olivier's innocence of the treachery ascribed to him he looked into the matter and had no difficulty in finding out that the whole trouble arose from the scandal-mongering of colette and lucien le vicar he rushed back with his evidence to christophe thinking that he could in that way prevent the duel but the result was exactly the opposite of what he had expected. Christophe was only the more rancorous against Le Vicar when he learned that it was through him that he had come to doubt his friend. To get rid of Mooch, who kept on imploring him not to fight, he promised him everything he asked. But he had made up his mind. He was quite happy now. He was going to fight for Olivier, not for himself. A remark made by one of the seconds as the carriage was going along a road through the woods suddenly caught christophe's attention he tried to find out what they were thinking and saw how little they really cared about him professor bart was wondering when the affair would be over and whether he would be back in time to finish a piece of work he'd begun on the manuscripts in the bibliothèque nationale of christophe's three companions he was the most interested in the result of the encounter as a matter of german national pride goujard paid no attention either to christophe or the other german but discussed certain scabrous subjects in connection with the coarser branches of physiology with dr julien a young physician from toulouse 
who had recently come to live next door to Christophe, and occasionally borrowed his spirit lamp, or his umbrella, or his coffee cups, which he invariably returned broken. In return he gave him free consultations, tried medicine on him, and laughed at his simplicity. Under his impassive manner, that would have well become a Castilian hidalgo, there was a perpetual love of teasing. He was highly delighted with the adventure of the duel which struck him as sheer burlesque, and he was amusing himself with fancying the mess that Christophe would make of it. He thought it a great joke to be driving through the woods at the expense of good old craft. That, clearly, was what was in the minds of the trio. They regarded it as a jolly excursion which cost them nothing. Not one of them attached the least importance to the duel. But on the other hand, they were just as calmly prepared for anything that might come of it. They reached the appointed spot before the others. It was a little inn in the heart of the forest. It was a pleasure resort, more or less unclean, to which Parisians used to resort to cleanse their honour when the dirt on it became too apparent. The hedges were bright with the pure flowers of the eglantine. In the shade of the bronze-leaved oak trees there were rows of little tables. At one of these tables were seated three bicyclists, a painted woman in knickerbockers with black socks, and two men in flannels who were stupefied by the heat, and every now and then gave out growls and grunts, as though they'd forgotten how to speak. The arrival of the carriage produced a little buzz of excitement in the inn. Goujard, who knew the house and the people of old, declared that he would look after everything. Bart dragged Christophe into an arbour and ordered beer. The air was deliciously warm and soft and resounding with the buzzing of bees. Christophe forgot why he had come. Bart emptied the bottle and said, after a short silence, "'I know what I'll do.' He drank and went on. "'I shall have plenty of time. I'll go to Versailles when it's all over.' Goujard was heard haggling with the landlady over the price of the dueling ground. Julien had not been wasting his time. As he passed near the bicyclists, he broke into noisy and ecstatic comment on the woman's bare legs— and there was exchanged a perfect deluge of filthy epithets in which Julien did not come off worst. Bart said in a whisper, The French are a low-minded lot. Brother, I drink to your victory. He clinked his glass against Christophe's. Christophe was dreaming. Scraps of music were floating in his mind, mingled with the harmonious humming of insects. He was very sleepy. The wheels of another carriage crunched over the gravel of the drive. Christophe saw Lucien Lévicard's pale face with its inevitable smile, and his anger leaped up in him. He got up, and Bart followed him. Lévicard, with his neck swathed in a high stock, was dressed with a scrupulous care which was strikingly in contrast with his adversary's untidiness. He was followed by Count Bloch, a sportsman well known for his mistresses, his collection of old pixes, and his ultra-royalist opinions. Léon Mouy, another man of fashion who had reached his position as deputy through literature, and was a writer from political ambition. He was young, bald, clean-shaven, with a lean, bilious face. He had a long nose, round eyes, and a head like a bird's. And Dr. Emmanuel, a fine type of Semite, well-meaning and cold, a member of the Academy of Medicine, a chief surgeon in a hospital famous for a number of scientific books, and a medical scepticism which made him listen with ironic pity to the plaints of his patients without making the least attempt to cure them. The newcomers saluted the other three courteously. Christophe barely responded, but was annoyed by the eagerness and the exaggerated politeness with which they treated Lévicard's seconds. Julien knew Emmanuel, and Goujard knew Mouy, and they approached them obsequiously, smiling. Mouy greeted them with cold politeness and Emmanuel jocularly and without ceremony. As for Count Bloch, he stayed by Le Vicar, and with a rapid glance he took in the condition of the clothes and linen of the three men of the opposing camp, and hardly opening his lips passed abrupt, humorous comment on them with his friend, and both of them stood calm and correct. Lucien Le Vicar stood at his ease, waiting for Count Bloch, who had the ordering of the duel, to give the signal. He regarded the affair as a mere formality. He was an excellent shot, and was fully aware of his adversary's want of skill. 
He would not be foolish enough to make use of his advantage and hit him, always supposing, as was not very probable, that the seconds did not take good care that no harm came of the encounter, for he knew that nothing is so stupid as to let an enemy appear to be a victim, when a much surer and better method is to wipe him out of existence without any fuss being made. But Christophe stood waiting, stripped to his shirt, which was open to reveal his thick neck, while his sleeves were rolled up to show his strong wrists, head down with his eyes glaring at Lévicard. He stood taut with murder, written implacably on every feature, and Count Bloch, who watched him carefully, thought, what a good thing it was that civilization had, as far as possible, suppressed the risks of fighting. After both men had fired, of course without result, the seconds hurried forward and congratulated the adversaries. Honor was satisfied. Not so Christophe. He stayed there, pistol in hand, unable to believe that it was all over. He was quite ready to repeat his performance at the range the evening before, and go on shooting until one or other of them had hit the target. Then he heard Goujard proposing that he should shake hands with his adversary, who advanced chivalrously toward him with his perpetual smile. He was exasperated by the pretense of the whole thing. Angrily he hurled his pistol away, pushed Goujard aside, and flung himself upon Lucien Lévicard. They were hard put to keep him from going on with the fight with his fists. The seconds intervened while Lévicard escaped. Christophe broke away from them, and without listening to their laughing expostulation, he strode along in the direction of the forest, talking loudly and gesticulating wildly. He did not even notice that he left his hat and coat on the dueling ground. He plunged into the woods. He heard his seconds laughing and calling him. Then they tired of it and did not worry about him any more. Very soon he heard the wheels of the carriages rumbling away and away, and knew that they had gone. He was left alone among the silent trees. His fury had subsided. He flung himself down on the ground and sprawled on the grass. Shortly afterwards, Mooch arrived at the inn. He had been pursuing Christophe since the early morning. He was told that his friend was in the woods and went to look for him. He beat all the thickets and woke all the echoes and was going away in despair when he heard him singing. He found his way by the voice and at last came upon him in a little clearing with his arms and legs in the air, rolling about like a young calf. When Christophe saw him, he shouted merrily, called him dear old Moloch, and told him how he had shot his adversary full of holes until he was like a sieve. He made him tuck in his tuppenny and then join him in a game of leapfrog and when he jumped over him he gave him a terrific thump. Mooch was not very good at it, but he enjoyed the game almost as much as Christophe. They returned to the inn arm in arm, and caught the train back to Paris at the nearest station. Olivier knew nothing of what had happened. He was surprised at Christophe's tenderness. He could not understand his sudden change. It was not until the next day when he saw the newspapers that he knew that Christophe had fought a duel. It made him almost ill to think of the danger that Christophe had run. He wanted to know why the duel had been fought. Christophe refused to tell him anything. When he was pressed, he said with a laugh, It was for you. Olivier could not get a word more out of him. Mooch told him all about it. Olivier was horrified, quarrelled with Colette, and begged Christophe to forgive his imprudence. Christophe was incorrigible and quoted for his benefit an old French saying which he adapted so as to infuriate poor Mooch, who was present to share in the happiness of the friends. My dear boy, let this teach you to be careful. From an idle, chattering girl, from a wheedling, hypocritical Jew, from a painted friend, from a familiar foe, and from flat wine, libera nos, domine. Their friendship was re-established. The danger of losing it, which had come so near, made it only the more dear. Their small misunderstandings had vanished. The very differences between them made them more attractive to each other. In his own soul, Christophe embraced the souls of the two countries, harmoniously united. He felt that his heart was rich and full, and as usual with him, his abundant happiness expressed itself in a flow of music. Olivier marveled at it. Being too critical in mind, he was never far from believing that music which he adored had said its last word. 
He was haunted by the morbid idea that decadence must inevitably succeed a certain degree of progress, and he trembled lest the lovely art which made him love life should stop short and dry up and disappear into the ground. Christophe would scoff at such pusillanimous ideas. In a spirit of contradiction, he would pretend that nothing had been done before he appeared on the scene, and that everything remained to be done. Olivier would instance French music, which seemed to have reached a point of perfection and ultimate civilization, beyond which there could not possibly be anything. Christophe would shrug his shoulders. French music? There has never been any. And yet you have such fine things to do in the world. You can't really be musicians, or you would have discovered that. Ah, if only I were a Frenchman. And he would set out all the things that a Frenchman might turn into music. You involve yourselves in forms which do not suit you, and you do nothing at all with those which are admirably fitted for your use. You are a people of elegance, polite poetry, beautiful gestures, beautiful walking movements, beautiful attitudes, fashion, clothes, and you never write ballets nowadays, though you ought to be able to create an inimitable art of poetic dancing. You are a people of laughter and comedy, and you never write comic operas, or else you leave it to minor musicians, the confectioners of music. Ah, if I were a Frenchman, I would set Rabelais to music. I would write comic epics. You are a people of storytellers, and you never write novels in music, for I don't count the feuilletons of Gustave Charpentier. You make no use of your gift of psychological analysis, your insight into character. Ah, if I were a Frenchman, I would give you portraits in music. Would you like me to sketch the girl sitting in the garden under the lilac? I would write you Stendhal for a string quartet. You are the greatest democracy in Europe, and you have no theatre for the people, no music for the people. Ah, if I were a Frenchman, I would set your revolution to music. The 14th July, the 10th August, Valmy, the Federation, I would express the people in music, not in the false form of Wagnerian declamation. I want symphonies, choruses, dances, not speeches. I'm sick of them. There's no reason why people should always be talking in a music drama. Bother the words. Paint in bold strokes, in vast symphonies with choruses, immense landscapes in music, Homeric and biblical epics, fire, earth, water, and sky, all bright and shining, the fever which makes hearts burn, the stirring of the instincts and destinies of a race, the triumph of rhythm, the emperor of the world, who enslaves thousands of men and hurls armies down to death. Music everywhere, music in everything. If you were musicians, you would have music for every one of your public holidays, for your official ceremonies, for the trades unions, for the student associations, for your family festivals. But above all, Above all, if you are musicians, you would make pure music, music which has no definite meaning, music which has no definite use, save only to give warmth and air and life. Make sunlight for yourselves, satpata. What is that in Latin? There has been rain enough. Your music gives me a cold. One can't see in it. Light your lanterns. You complain of the Italian porcherie who invade your theatres and conquer the public and turn you out of your own house, it's your own fault. The public are sick of your crepuscular art, your harmonized neurasthenia, your contrapuntal pedantry. The public goes where it can find life, however coarse and gross. Why do you run away from life? Your Debussy is a bad man. However great he may be as an artist, he aids and abets you in your torpor. You want roughly waking up. What about Strauss? No better. Strauss would finish you off. You need the digestion of my fellow countrymen to be able to bear such immoderate drinking, and even they cannot bear it. Strauss's Salome, a masterpiece. I should not like to have written it. I think of my old grandfather and Uncle Gottfried, and with what respect and loving tenderness they used to talk to me about the lovely art of sound but to have the handling of such divine powers and to turn them to such uses? A flaming, consuming meteor, an Isolde who was a Jewish prostitute, bestial and mournful lust. 
the frenzy of murder pillage incest and untrammelled instincts which is stirring in the depths of german decadence and on the other hand the spasm of a voluptuous and melancholy suicide the death rattle which sounds through your french decadence on the one hand the beast on the other the prey where is man your debussy is the genius of good taste strauss is the genius of bad taste debussy is rather insipid but strauss is very unpleasant one is a silvery thread of stagnant water losing itself in the reeds and giving off an unhealthy aroma the other is a mighty muddy flood oh the musty base italianism and neo meyerbeerism the filthy masses of sentiment which are borne on by the torrent an odious masterpiece salome the daughter of isoda and whose mother will salome be in her turn yes said olivier i wish we could jump fifty years this headlong gallop towards the precipice must end one way or another either the horse must stop or fall then we shall breathe again thank heaven the earth will not cease to flower nor the sky to give light with or without music what have we to do with an art so inhuman the west is burning away soon very soon i see other stars arising in the furthest depths of the east bother the east said christophe the west has not said its last word yet do you think i'm going to abdicate i have enough to say to keep you going for centuries hurrah for life hurrah for joy hurrah for the courage which drives us on to struggle with our destiny hurrah for love which maketh the heart big hurrah for friendship which rekindles our faith friendship a sweeter thing than love hurrah for the day hurrah for the night glory be to the sun laus deo the god of joy the god of dreams and actions the god who created music hosanna with that he sat down at his desk and wrote down everything that was in his head without another thought for what he had been saying at that time christophe was in a condition in which all the elements of his life were perfectly balanced he did not bother his head with aesthetic discussions as to the value of this or that musical form nor with reasoned attempts to create a new form he did not even have to cast about for subjects for translation into music one thing was as good as another the flood of music welled forth without christophe knowing exactly what feeling he was expressing he was happy that was all happy in expanding happy in having expanded happy in feeling within himself the pulse of universal life his fullness of joy was communicated to those about him the house with its closed garden was too small for him he had the view out over the garden of the neighbouring convent with the solitude of its great avenues and century-old trees but it was too good to last in front of christophe's windows they were building a six-storey house which shut out the view and completely hemmed him in in addition he had the pleasure of hearing the creaking of pulleys the chipping of stones the hammering of nails all day long from morning to night among the workmen he found his old friend the slater whose acquaintance he had made on the roof they made signs to each other and once when he met him in the street he took the man to a wine shop and they drank together much to the surprise of olivier who was a little scandalized he found the man's drollery and unfailing good humour very entertaining but did not curse him any the less with his troop of workmen and stupid idiots who were raising a barricade in front of the house and robbing him of air and light olivier did not complain much he could quite easily adapt himself to a limited horizon he was like the stove of descartes from which the suppressed ideas darted upward to the free sky but christophe needed more air shut up in that confined space he avenged himself by expanding into the lives of those about him he drank in their inmost life and turned it into music olivier used to tell him that he looked like a lover if i were in love christophe would reply i should see nothing love nothing be interested in nothing outside my love what's the matter with you then i'm very well i'm hungry lucky christophe olivier would sigh i wish you could hand a little of your appetite over to us health like sickness is contagious the first to feel the benefit of christophe's vitality was naturally olivier vitality was what he most lacked he retired from the world because its vulgarity revolted him 
brilliantly clever though he was and in spite of his exceptional artistic gifts he was too delicate to be a great artist great artists do not feel disgust the first law for every healthy being is to live and that law is even more imperative for a man of genius for such a man lives more olivier fled from life he drifted along in a world of poetic fictions that had no body no flesh and blood no relation to reality he was one of those literary men who in quest of beauty have to go outside time into the days that are no more or the days that have never been as though the wine of life were not as intoxicating and its vintages as rich nowadays as ever they were but men who are weary in soul recoil from direct contact with life they can only bear to see it through the veil of visions spun by the backward movement of time and hear it in the echo which sends back and distorts the dead words of those who were once alive christophe's friendship gradually dragged olivier out of his limbo of art the sun's rays pierced through to the innermost recesses of his soul in which he was languishing elsberger the engineer succumbed to christophe's contagious optimism it was not shown in any change in his habits they were too inveterate and it was too much to expect him to become enterprising enough to leave france and go and seek his fortune elsewhere but he was shaken out of his apathy he recovered his taste for research and reading and the scientific work which he had long neglected he would have been much astonished had he been told that christophe had something to do with his new interest in his work and certainly no one would have been more surprised than christophe but of all the inhabitants of the house christophe was the soonest intimate with the little couple on the second floor more than once as he passed their door he had stopped to listen to the sound of the piano which madame arnaud used to play quite well when she was alone then he gave them tickets for his concert for which they thanked him effusively and after that he used to go and sit with them occasionally in the evening he had never heard madame arnaud playing again she was too shy to play in company and even when she was alone now that she knew she could be heard on the stairs she kept the soft pedal down but christophe used to play to them and they would talk about it for hours together the arnauds used to speak of music with such eagerness and freshness of feeling that he was enchanted with them he had not thought it possible for french people to care so much for music that olivia would say is because you have only come across musicians i'm perfectly aware christophe would reply that professed musicians are the very people who care least for music but you can't make me believe that there are many people like you in france a few thousands at any rate i suppose it's an epidemic the latest fashion it's not a matter of fashion said arnaud he who does not rejoice to hear a sweet accord of instruments or the sweetness of the natural voice and is not moved by it and does not tremble from head to foot with its sweet ravishment and is not taken completely out of himself does thereby show himself to have a twisted vicious and depraved soul and of such an one we should beware as of a man ill-born i know that said christophe it's my friend shakespeare no said arnaud gently it's a frenchman who lived before him ronsard that will show you that if it is the fashion in france to care for music it is no new thing but what astonished christophe was not so much that people in france should care for music as that almost without exception they cared for the same music as the people in germany in the world of parisian snobs and artists in which he had moved at first it had been the mode to treat the german masters as distinguished foreigners by all means to be admired but to be kept at a distance they were always ready to poke fun at the dullness of a gluck and the barbarity of a wagner against them they set up the subtlety of the french composers and in the end christophe had begun to wonder whether a frenchman could have the least understanding of german music to judge by the way it was rendered in france only a short time before he had come away perfectly scandalized from a performance of an opera of gluck's the ingenious parisians had taken it into their head to deck the old fellow up and cover him with ribbons and pad out his rhythms and bedizen his music with impressionistic settings and charming little dancing girls forward and wanton poor gluck there was nothing left of his eloquent and sublime feeling his moral purity his naked sorrow was it that the french could not understand these things and now christophe could see how deeply and tenderly his new friends loved the very inmost quality of the germanic spirit and the old german lieder and the german classics 
and he asked them if it was not the fact that the great germans were as foreigners to them and that a frenchman could only really love the artists of his own nationality not at all they protested it's only the critics who take upon themselves to speak for us they always follow the fashion and they want us to follow it too but we don't worry about them any more than they worry about us they're funny little people trying to teach us what is and is not french us who are french of the old stock of france they come and tell us that our france is in rameau or racine and nowhere else as though we did not know and thousands like us in the provinces and in paris how often beethoven mozart and gluck have sat with us by the fireside and watched with us by the bedside of those we love and shared our troubles and revived our hopes and been one of ourselves if we dared say exactly what we thought it's much more likely that the french artists who are set up on a pedestal by our parisian critics are strangers among us the truth is said olivier that if there are frontiers in art they are not so much barriers between races as barriers between classes i'm not so sure that there is a french art or a german art but there is certainly one art for the rich and another for the poor gluck was a great man of the middle classes he belongs to our class a certain french artist whose name i won't mention is not of our class though he was of the middle class by birth he's ashamed of us and denies us and we deny him what olivier said was true the better christophe got to know the french the more he was struck by the resemblance between the honest men of france and the honest men of germany the annos reminded him of dear old schultz with his pure disinterested love of art his forgetfulness of self his devotion to beauty and he loved them in memory of schultz End of section 37, read by Sandra near Montreal. Section 38 of Jean-Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canon. The House. Chapter 2, Part 5 at the same time as he realized the absurdity of moral frontiers between the honest men of different nationalities christophe began to see the absurdity of the frontiers that lay between the different ideas of honest men of the same nationality thanks to him though without any deliberate effort on his part the abbe cornet and m watelet two men who seemed very far indeed from understanding each other made friends christophe used to borrow books from both of them and with a want of ceremony which shocked olivier he used to lend their books in turn to the other the abbe cornet was not at all scandalized he had an intuitive perception of the quality of a man and without seeming to do so he had marked the generous and even unconsciously religious nature of his young neighbour a book by kropotkin which had been borrowed from m watelet and for different reasons had given great pleasure to all three of them began the process of bringing them together it chanced one evening that they met in christophe's room at first christophe was afraid that they might be rude to each other but on the contrary they were perfectly polite they discussed various sage subjects their travels and their experience of men and they discovered in each other a fund of gentleness and the spirit of the gospels and chimerical hopes in spite of the many reasons that each had for despair they discovered a mutual sympathy mingled with a little irony their sympathy was of a very discreet nature they never revealed their fundamental beliefs they rarely met and did not try to meet but when they did so they were glad to see each other of the two men the abbe cornet was not the least independent of mind though christophe would never have thought it he gradually came to perceive the greatness of the religious and yet free ideas the immense serene and unfevered mysticism which permeated the priest's whole mind the every action of his daily life and his whole outlook on the world leading him to live in christ as he believed that christ had lived in god he denied nothing no single element of life to him the whole of scripture ancient and modern lay and religious from moses to bertolo was certain divine the very expression of god holy writ was to him only its richest example just as the church was the highest company of men united in the brotherhood of god but in neither of them was the spirit confined in any fixed unchanging truth christianity was the living christ the history of the world was only the history of the perpetual advance of the idea of god 
the fall of the jewish temple the ruin of the pagan world the repulse of the crusades the humiliation of boniface VIII, galileo flinging the world back into giddy space the infinitely little becoming more mighty than the great the downfall of kingdoms and the end of the concordats all these for a time threw the minds of men out of their reckoning some clung desperately to the passing order some caught at a plank and drifted the abbe cornet only asked where do we stand as men where is that which makes us live for he believed where life is there is god and that was why he was in sympathy with christophe for his part christophe was glad once more to hear the splendid music of a great religious soul it woke in him echoes distant and profound through the feeling of perpetual reaction which is in vigorous natures a vital instinct the instinct of self-preservation the stroke which preserves the quivering balance of the boat and gives it a new drive onward his surfeit of doubts and his disgust with parisian sensuality had for the last two years been slowly restoring god to his place in christophe's heart not that he believed in god he denied god but he was filled with the spirit of god the abbe cornet used to tell him with a smile that like his namesake the sainted giant he bore god on his shoulders without knowing it how is it that i don't see it then christophe would ask you are like thousands of others you see god every day and never know that it is he god reveals himself to all in every shape to some he appears in their daily life as he did to saint peter in galilee to others like your friend m Vatelet, as he did to saint thomas in wounds and suffering that call for healing to you in the dignity of your ideal noli me tangere some day you will know it i will never surrender said christophe i am free free i shall remain only the more will you live in god replied the priest calmly but christophe would not admit to being made out a christian against his will he defended himself ardently and simply as though it mattered in the least whether one label more than another was plastered on to his ideas the abbe cornet would listen with a faint ecclesiastical irony that was hardly perceptible while it was altogether kindly he had an inexhaustible fund of patience based on his habit of faith it had been tempered by the trials to which the existing church had exposed him while it had made him profoundly melancholy and had even dragged him through terrible moral crises he had not really been touched by it all it was cruel to suffer the oppression of his superiors to have his every action spied upon by the bishops and watched by the free thinkers who were endeavouring to exploit his ideas to use him as a weapon against his own faith and to be misunderstood and attacked both by his co-religionists and the enemies of his religion it was impossible for him to offer any resistance for submission was enforced upon him it was impossible for him to submit in his heart for he knew that the authorities were wrong it was agony for him to hold his peace it was agony for him to speak and to be wrongly interpreted not to mention the soul for which he was responsible he had to think of those who looked to him for counsel and help while he had to stand by and see them suffer the abbe cornet suffered both for them and for himself but he was resigned he knew how small a thing were the days of trial in the long history of the church only by dint of being turned in upon himself in his silent resignation slowly he lost heart and became timid and afraid to speak so that it became more and more difficult for him to do anything and little by little the torpor of silence crept over him meeting christophe had given him new courage his neighbour's youthful ardour and the affectionate and simple interest which he took in his doings his sometimes indiscreet questions did him a great deal of good christophe forced him to mix once more with living men and women aubert the journeyman electrician once met him in christophe's room he started back when he saw the priest and found it hard to conceal his feeling of dislike even when he had overcome his first inclination he was uncomfortable and oddly embarrassed at finding himself in the company of a man in a cassock a creature to whom he could attach no exact definition however his sociable instincts and the pleasure he always found in talking to educated men were stronger than his anti-clericalism he was surprised by the pleasant relations existing between m vatelet and the abbe cornet he was no less surprised to find a priest who was a democrat and a revolutionary who was an aristocrat it upset all his preconceived ideas 
He tried vainly to classify them in any social category, for he always had to classify people before he could begin to understand them. It was not easy to find a pigeonhole for the peaceful freedom of mind of a priest who had read Anatole France and Renan, and was prepared to discuss them calmly, justly, and with some knowledge. In matters of science, the Abbe Cornet's way was to accept the guidance of those who knew, rather than of those who laid down the law. He respected authority, but in his eyes it stood lower than knowledge. The flesh, the spirit, and charity, the three orders, the three rungs of the divine ladder, the ladder of Jacob. Of course, honest Aubert was far indeed from understanding, or even from dreaming, of the possibility of such a state of mind. The Abbe Cornet used to tell Christophe that Aubert reminded him of certain French peasants whom he had seen one day. A young Englishwoman had asked them the way in English. They listened solemnly, but did not understand. Then they spoke in French. She did not understand. Then they looked at each other pityingly, and wagged their heads, and went on with their work, and said, "'What a pity! What a pity!' such a pretty girl too as though they had thought her deaf or dumb or soft in the head at first aubert was abashed by the knowledge and distinguished manners of the priest and m vatelet and sat mum listening intently to what they said then little by little he joined in the conversation giving way to the naive pleasure that he found in hearing himself speak he paraded his generous store of rather vague ideas the other two would listen politely and smile inwardly Aubert was delighted. He could not hold himself in. He took advantage of, and presently abused, the inexhaustible patience of the Abbe Cornet. He read his literary productions to him. The priest listened resignedly, and it did not bore him over much, for he listened not so much to the words as to the man, and then he would reply to Christophe's commiseration. Bah! I hear so many of them. Aubert was grateful to M. Watelet and the Abbe Cornet, and without taking much trouble to understand each other's ideas or even to find out what they were, the three of them became very good friends without exactly knowing why. They were very surprised to find themselves so intimate. They would never have thought it. Christophe was the bond between them. He had other innocent allies in the three children, the two little Elsbergers and M. Watelet's adopted daughter. He was great friends with them. They adored him. He told each of them about the other and gave them an irresistible longing to know each other. They used to make signs to each other from the windows and spoke to each other furtively on the stairs. Aided and abetted by Christophe, they even managed to get permission sometimes to meet in the Luxembourg gardens. Christophe was delighted with the success of his guile and went to see them there the first time they were together. They were shy and embarrassed and hardly knew what to make of their new happiness. He broke down their reserve in a moment and invented games for them and races and played hide-and-seek. He joined in as keenly as though he were a child of ten. The passers-by cast amused and quizzical glances at the great big fellow, running and shouting and dodging round trees with three little girls after him. And as their parents were still suspicious of each other and showed no great readiness to let these excursions to the Luxembourg Gardens occur very often, because it kept them too far out of sight, Christophe managed to get Commandant Chabrin, who lived on the ground floor, to invite the children to play in the garden belonging to the house. Chance had thrown Christophe and the old soldier together. Chance always singles out those who can turn it to account. Christophe's writing-table was near his window. One day the wind blew a few sheets of music down into the garden. Christophe rushed down, bareheaded and dishevelled, just as he was, without even taking the trouble to brush his hair. He thought he would only have to see a servant. However, the daughter opened the door to him. He was rather taken aback, but told her what he'd come for. She smiled and let him in. They went into the garden. When he had picked up his papers, he was for hurrying away, and she was taking him to the door when they met the old soldier. The commandant gazed at his odd visitor in some surprise. His daughter laughed and introduced him. Ah, so you are the musician, said the old soldier. We are comrades. They shook hands. They talked in a friendly, bantering tone of the concerts they gave together, Christophe with his piano, the commandant with his flute. Christophe tried to go, but the old man would not let him, and he plunged blindly into a disquisition on music. Suddenly he stopped short and said, Come and see my cannons. Christophe followed him, wondering how anybody could be interested in anything he might think about French artillery. The old man showed him in triumph a number of musical cannons, amazing productions, compositions that might just as well be read upside down or played as duets. 
one person playing the right-hand page and the other the left. The commandant was an old pupil of the Polytechnic and had always had a taste for music, but what he loved most of all in it was the mathematical problem. It seemed to him, as up to a point it is, a magnificent mental gymnastic, and he racked his brains in the invention and solution of puzzles in the construction of music, each more useless and extravagant than the last. Of course, his military career had not left him much time for the development of his mania, but since his retirement he'd thrown himself into it with enthusiasm. He expended on it all the energy and ingenuity which he had previously employed in pursuing the hordes of Negro kings through the deserts of Africa or avoiding their traps. Christophe found his puzzles quite amusing and set him a more complicated one to solve. The old soldier was delighted. They vied with one another. They produced a perfect shower of musical riddles. After they'd been playing the game for some time, Christophe went upstairs to his own room. But the very next morning his neighbour sent him a new problem, a regular teaser, at which the commandant had been working half the night. He replied with another, and the duel went on until Christophe, who was getting tired of it, declared himself beaten at which the old soldier was perfectly delighted. He regarded his success as a retaliation on Germany. He invited Christophe to lunch. Christophe's frankness in telling the old soldier that he detested his musical compositions and shouting in protest when Chabrin began to murder an Andante of Haydn on his harmonium completed the conquest. From that time on, they often met to talk, but not about music. Christophe could not summon up any great interest in his neighbor's crotchety notions about it, and much preferred getting him to talk about military subjects. The commandant asked nothing better. Music was only a forced amusement for the unhappy man. In reality, he was fretting his life out. He was easily led on to yarn about his African campaigns, gigantic adventures worthy of the tales of a Pizarro and a Cortez. Christophe was delighted with the vivid narrative of that marvellous and barbaric epic, of which he knew nothing, and almost every Frenchman is ignorant. The tale of the twenty years during which the heroism and courage and inventiveness and superhuman energy of a conquering handful of Frenchmen were spent far away in the depths of the black continent, where they were surrounded by armies of Negroes, where they were deprived of the most rudimentary arms of war, and yet, in the face of public opinion and a panic-stricken government, in spite of France, conquered for France an empire greater than France itself. There was the flavour of a mighty joy, a flavour of blood in the tale, from which, in Christophe's mind's eye, there sprang the figures of modern condottieri, heroic adventurers, unlooked for in the France of today, whom the France of today is ashamed to own, so that she modestly draws a veil over them. The commandant's voice would ring out bravely as he recalled it all, and he would jovially recount with learned descriptions, oddly interpolated in his epic narrative, of the geological structure of the country, in cold, precise terms, the story of the tremendous marches and the charges at full gallop, and the man-hunts in which he had been hunter and quarry, turn and turn about in a struggle to the death. Christophe would listen and watch his face and feel a great pity for such a splendid human animal, condemned to inaction and forced to spend his time in playing ridiculous games. He wondered how he could ever have become resigned to such a lot. He asked the old man how he had done it. The commandant was at first not at all inclined to let a stranger into his confidence as to his grievances, but the French are naturally loquacious, especially when they have a chance of pitching into each other. "'What on earth should I do?' he said in the army, as it is today. "'The marines write books. The infantry study sociology. "'They do everything but make war. "'They don't even prepare for it. "'They prepare never to go to war again. "'They study the philosophy of war. "'The philosophy of war? "'That's a game for beasts of burden, "'wondering how much thrashing they're going to get. "'Discussing. Philosophizing. "'No, that's not my work. "'Much better stay at home and go on with my cannons.' He was too much ashamed to air the most serious of his grievances, the suspicion created among the officers by the appeal to informers, the humiliation of having to submit to the insolent orders of certain crass and mischievous politicians, the army's disgust at being put to base police duty, taking inventories of the churches, putting down industrial strikes at the bidding of capital and the spite of the party in power. The petty burgess, radicals, and anti-clericals against the rest of the country. 
not to speak of the old african's disgust with the new colonial army which was for the most part recruited from the lowest elements of the nation by way of pandering to the egoism and cowardice of the rest who refused to share in the honour and the risks of securing the defence of greater france france beyond the seas christophe was not concerned with these french quarrels they were no affair of his but he sympathised with the old soldier whatever he might think of war it seemed to him that an army was meant to produce soldiers as an apple-tree to produce apples and that it was a strange perversion to graft it on to politicians aesthetes and sociologists and yet he could not understand how a man of such vigour could give way to his adversaries it is to be his own worst enemy for a man not to fight his enemies in all french people of any worth at all there was a spirit of surrender a strange temper of renunciation to christophe it was even more profound and even more touching as it existed in the old soldier's daughter her name was celine she had beautiful hair plaited and braided so as to set off her high round forehead and her rather pointed ears her thin cheeks and her pretty chin she was like a country girl with fine intelligent dark eyes very trustful very soft rather short-sighted her nose was a little too large and she had a tiny mole on her upper lip by the corner of her mouth and she had a quiet smile which made her pout prettily and thrust out her lower lip which was a little protruding she was kind active clever but she had no curiosity of mind she read very little and never any of the newest books never went to the theatre never travelled for travelling bored her father who had had too much of it in the old days never had anything to do with any polite charitable work her father used to condemn all such things made no attempt to study he used to make fun of blue stockings hardly ever left her little patch of garden enclosed by its four high walls so that it was like being at the bottom of a deep well and yet she was not really bored she occupied her time as best she could and was good-tempered and resigned about her and about the setting which every woman unconsciously creates for herself wherever she may be there was a chardinesque atmosphere the same soft silence the same tranquil expression the same attitude of absorption a little drowsy and languid in the common task the poetry of the daily round of the accustomed way of life with its fixed thoughts and actions falling into exactly the same place at exactly the same time thoughts and actions which are cherished none the less with an all-pervading tranquil gentleness the serene mediocrity of the fine-souled women of the middle class honest conscientious truthful calm calm in their pleasures unruffled in their labours and yet poetic in all their qualities they are healthy and neat and tidy clean in body and mind all their lives are sweetened with the scent of good bread and lavender and integrity and kindness there is a peace in all that they are and do the peace of old houses and smiling souls christophe whose affectionate trustfulness invited trust had become very friendly with her they used to talk quite frankly and he even went so far as to ask her certain questions which she was surprised to find herself answering she would tell him things which she had not told anybody even her most intimate friends you see christophe would say you're not afraid of me there's no danger of our falling in love with each other we're too good friends for that you're very polite she would answer with a laugh her healthy nature recoiled as much as christophe's from philandering friendship that form of sentimentality dear to equivocal men and women who are always juggling with their emotions they were just comrades one to another he asked her one day what she was doing in the afternoons when he saw her sitting in the garden with her work on her knees never touching it and not stirring for hours together she blushed and protested that it was not a matter of hours but only a matter of a few minutes perhaps a quarter of an hour during which she went on with her story what story the story i'm always telling myself you tell yourself stories oh tell them to me she told him that he was too curious she would only go so far as to intimate that they were stories of which she was not the heroine he was surprised at that if you're going to tell yourself stories it seems to me it would be more natural if you told your own story with embellishments and lived in a happier dream life i couldn't she said if i did that i should become desperate she blushed again at having revealed even so much of her inmost thoughts and she went on besides when i'm in the garden and a gust of wind reaches me i'm happy 
Then the garden comes alive for me, and when the wind blusters and comes from a great distance, he tells me so many things. In spite of her reserve, Christophe could see the hidden depths of melancholy that lay behind her good humour and the restless activity which, as she knew perfectly well, led nowhere. Why did she not try to break away from her condition and emancipate herself? She would have been so well fitted for a useful and active life. But she alleged her affection for her father, who would not hear of her leaving him. In vain did Christophe tell her that the old soldier was perfectly vigorous and energetic and had no need of her, and that a man of his stamp could quite well be left alone and had no right to make a sacrifice of her. She would begin to defend her father by a pious fiction. She would pretend that it was not her father who was forcing her to stay, but she herself who could not bear to leave him. And up to a point what she said was true. It seemed to have been accepted from time immemorial by herself and her father and all their friends that their life had to be thus and thus, and not otherwise. She had a married brother who thought it quite natural that she should devote her life to their father in his stead. He was entirely wrapped up in his children. He loved them jealously and left them no will of their own. His love for his children was to him, and especially to his wife, a voluntary bondage, which weighed heavily on their life and cramped all their movements. His idea seemed to be that as soon as a man has children, his own life comes to an end, and he has to stop short in his own development. He was still young, active, and intelligent, and there he was, reckoning up the years he would have still to work before he could retire. Christophe saw how these good people were weighed down by the atmosphere of family affection, which is so deep-rooted in France, deep-rooted but stifling and destructive of vitality. And it has become all the more oppressive since families in France had been reduced to the minimum, father, mother, one or two children, and here and there perhaps an uncle or an aunt. It is a cowardly, fearful love turned in upon itself like a miser clinging tightly to his hoard of gold. A fortuitous circumstance gave Christophe a yet greater interest in the girl, and showed him the full extent of the suppression of the emotions of the French, their fear of life, of letting themselves go and claiming their birthright. Elsberger, the engineer, had a brother ten years younger than himself, likewise an engineer. He was a very good fellow, like thousands of others of the middle class, and he had artistic aspirations. He was one of those people who would like to practice an art, but are afraid of compromising their reputation and position. As a matter of fact, it's not a very difficult problem, and most of the artists of today have solved it without any great danger to themselves. But it needs a certain amount of willpower, and not everybody is capable of even that much expenditure of energy. Such people are not sure enough of wanting what they really want, and as their position in life grows more assured, they submit and drift along without any show of revolt or protest. They cannot be blamed if they become good citizens instead of bad artists, but their disappointment too often leaves behind it a secret discontent, a qualis artifex pereo, which, as best it can, assumes a crust of what is usually called philosophy, and spoils their lives until the wear and tear of daily life and new anxieties have erased all trace of the old bitterness. Such was the case of André Elsberger. He would have liked to be a writer, but his brother, who was very self-willed, had made him follow in his footsteps and enter upon a scientific career. André was clever and quite well equipped for scientific work, or for literature for that matter. He was not sure enough of being an artist, and he was too sure that he was middle class, and so, provisionally at first, one knows what that means, he had bowed to his brother's wishes. He entered the centrale, high up in the list, and passed out equally high, and since then he had practiced his profession as an engineer conscientiously, but without being interested in it. Of course he had lost the little artistic quality that he possessed, and he never spoke of it except ironically. And then, he used to say, Christophe recognized Olivier's pessimistic tendency in his arguments, life is not good enough to make one worry about a spoiled career. What does a bad poet, more or less, matter? The brothers were fond of one another. They were of the same stamp morally, but they did not get on well together. They had both been Dreyfus mad. But André was attracted by syndicalism and was an anti-militarist, and Elie was a patriot. From time to time, André would visit Christophe without going to see his brother, and that astonished Christophe, for there was no great sympathy between himself and André, who used hardly ever to open his mouth except to gird at something or somebody, which was very tiresome, and when Christophe said anything, André would not listen. 
Christophe made no effort to conceal the fact that he found his visits a nuisance, but André did not mind and seemed not to notice it. At last Christophe found the key to the riddle one day when he found his visitor leaning out of the window and paying much more attention to what was happening in the garden below than to what he was saying. He remarked upon it, and André was not reluctant to admit that he knew Mademoiselle Chabrin, and that she had something to do with his visits to Christophe and his tongue being loosed, he confessed that he had long been attached to the girl, and perhaps something more than that. The Elsbeggers had long ago been in close touch with the Chabrons, but though they had been very intimate, politics and recent events had separated them, and thereafter they saw very little of each other. Christophe did not disguise his opinion that it was an idiotic state of things. Was it impossible for people to think differently, and yet to retain their mutual esteem? André said he thought it was, and protested that he was very broad-minded, but he would not admit the possibility of tolerance in certain questions, concerning which he said he could not admit any opinion different from his own, and he instanced the famous affair. On that, as usual, he became wild. Christophe knew the sort of thing that happened in that connection, and made no attempt to argue, but he asked whether the affair was ever going to come to an end, or whether its curse was to go on and on to the end of time, descending even unto the third and fourth generation. André began to laugh, and without answering Christophe, he felt a tender praise of Céline Chabrin, and protested against her father's selfishness, who thought it quite natural that she should be sacrificed to him. "'Why don't you marry her?' asked Christophe. "'If you love her, and she loves you?' André said mournfully that Céline was clerical. Christophe asked what he meant by that. André replied that he meant that she was religious and had vowed a sort of feudal service to God and his bonzes. But how does that affect you? I don't want to share my wife with anyone. What? You're jealous even of your wife's ideas? Why, you're more selfish even than the commandant. It's all very well for you to talk. Would you take a woman who did not love music? I have done so. How can a man and a woman live together if they don't think the same? Don't you worry about what you think. Ah, my dear fellow, ideas count for so little when one loves. What does it matter to me whether the woman I love cares for music as much as I do? She herself is music to me. When a man has the luck as you have to find a dear girl whom he loves and she loves him, she must believe what she likes, and he must believe what he likes. When all is said and done, what do your ideas amount to? There is only one truth in the world. There is only one God. Love. You speak like a poet. You don't see life as it is. I know only too many marriages which have suffered from such a want of union in thought. Those husbands and wives did not love each other enough. You have to know what you want. Wanting does not do everything in life. Even if I wanted to marry Mademoiselle Chabrin, I couldn't. I'd like to know why. André spoke of his scruples. His position was not assured. He had no fortune and no great health. He was wondering whether he had the right to marry in such circumstances. It was a great responsibility. Was there not a great risk of bringing unhappiness on the woman he loved, and himself, not to mention any children there might be? It was better to wait or give up the idea. Christophe shrugged his shoulders. That's a fine sort of love. If she loves you, she will be happy in her devotion to you. And as for the children, you French people are absurd. You would like only to bring them into the world when you are sure of turning them out with comfortable private means so that they will have nothing to suffer and nothing to fear. Good Lord, that's nothing to do with you. Your business is only to give them life, love of life, and courage to defend it. The rest, whether they live or die, is the common lot. Is it better to give up living than to take the risks of life? The sturdy confidence which emanated from Christophe affected André, but did not change his mind. He said, yes, perhaps that is true. But he stopped at that. Like all the rest, his will and power of action seemed to be paralyzed. End of section 38. Read by Sandra, 2022. Section 39 of Jean-Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland Translated by Gilbert Canin The House, Chapter 2, Part 6 
Christophe had set himself to fight the inertia which he found in most of his French friends, oddly coupled with laborious and often feverish activity. Almost all the people he met in the various middle-class houses which he visited were discontented. They had almost all the same disgust with the demagogues and their corrupt ideas. In almost all there was the same sorrowful and proud consciousness of the betrayal of the genius of their race. And it was by no means the result of any personal rancor, nor the bitterness of men and classes beaten and thrust out of power and active life, or discharged officials or unemployed energy, nor that of an old aristocracy which has returned to its estates, there to die in hiding like a wounded lion. It was a feeling of moral revolt, mute, profound, general. It was to be found everywhere, in a greater or less degree in the army, in the magistracy, in the university, in the officers, and in every vital branch of the machinery of government. But they took no active measures. They were discouraged in advance. They kept on saying, there is nothing to be done, or let us try not to think of it. Fearfully they dodged anything sad in their thoughts and conversation, and they took refuge in their home life. If they had been content to refrain only from political action, but even in their daily lives these good people had no interest in doing anything definite, they put up with the degrading, haphazard contact with horrible people whom they despised, because they could not take the trouble to fight against them, thinking that any such revolt must of necessity be useless. Why, for instance, should artists, and in particular the musicians with whom Christophe was most in touch, unprotestingly put up with the effrontery of the scaramouche of the press, who laid down the law for them. There were absolute idiots among them whose ignorance in omni re scibili was proverbial, though they were none the less invested with a sovereign authority in omni re scibili. They did not even take the trouble to write their articles and books. They had secretaries, poor starving creatures, who would have sold their souls if they had had such things, for bread or women. There was no secret about it in Paris, and yet they went on riding their high horse and patronizing the artists. Christophe used to roar with anger sometimes when he read their articles. They have no heart, he would say. Oh, the cowards! Who are you screaming at? Olivier would ask. The idiots of the marketplace? No, the honest men. These rascals are plying their trade. They lie, they steal, they rob and murder, but it is the others, those who despise them and yet let them go on, that I despise a thousand times more. If their colleagues on the press, if honest, cultured critics and the artists on whose backs these harlequins strut and poise themselves did not put up with it in silence from shyness or fear of compromising themselves, or from some shameful anticipation of mutual service, a sort of secret pact made with the enemy so that they may be immune from their attacks if they did not let them preen themselves in their patronage and friendship, their upstart power would soon be killed by ridicule. There's the same weakness in everything, everywhere. I've met twenty honest men who've said to me of so-and-so, he's a scoundrel, but there's not one of them who would not refer to him as his dear colleague and, if he met him, shake hands with him. There are too many of them, they say. Too many cowards, too many flabby, honest men. Eh? What do you want them to do? Be every man his own policeman. What are you waiting for, for heaven to take your affairs in hand? Look you, at this very moment. It is three days now since the snow fell. Your streets are thick with it, and your Paris is like a sewer of mud. What do you do? You protest against your municipal council for leaving you in such a state of filth. But do you yourselves do anything to clear it away? Not a bit of it. You sit with your arms folded. Not one of you has energy enough even to clean the pavement in front of his house. Nobody does his duty, neither the state nor the members of the state. Each man thinks he's done as much as is expected of him by laying the blame on someone else. You have to become so used, through centuries of monarchical training, to doing nothing for yourselves that you all seem to spend your time in stargazing and waiting for a miracle to happen. The only miracle that could happen would be if you all suddenly made up your minds to do something. 
My dear Olivier, you French people have plenty of brains and plenty of good qualities, but you lack blood. You, most of all. There's nothing the matter with your mind or your heart. It's your life that's all wrong. You're sputtering out. What can we do? We can only wait for life to return to us. You must want life to return to you. You must want to be cured. You must want. Use your will. And if you are to do that, you must first let in some pure air into your houses. If you won't go out of doors, then at least you must keep your houses healthy. You have let the air be poisoned by the unwholesome vapours of the marketplace. Your art and your ideas are two-thirds adulterated, and you're so dispirited that it hardly occasions you any surprise and rouses you to no sort of indignation. Some of these good people, it's pitiful to see, are so cowed that they actually persuade themselves that they're wrong and the charlatans are right. Why, even on your escop review, in which you profess not to be taken in by anything, I've found unhappy young men persuading themselves that they love an art and ideas for which they have not a vestige of love. They get drunk on it, without any sort of pleasure, simply because they're told to do so, and they're dying of boredom, boredom with the monstrous lie of the whole thing. Christophe passed through these wavering and dispirited creatures like a wind shaking the slumbering trees. He made no attempt to force them to his way of thinking. He breathed into them energy enough to make them think for themselves. He used to say, You're too humble. The grand enemy is neurasthenia, doubt. A man can and must be tolerant and human, but no man may doubt what he believes to be good and true. A man must believe in what he thinks, and he should maintain what he believes. Whatever our powers may be, we have no right to forswear them. The smallest creature in the world, like the greatest, has his duty, and though he is not sufficiently conscious of it, he also has a power. Why should you think that your revolt will carry so little weight? A sturdy, upright conscience which dares assert itself is a mighty thing. More than once during the last few years you've seen the state, in public opinion, forced to reckon with the views of an honest man, who had no other weapons but his own moral force which with constant courage and tenacity he had dared publicly to assert. And if you must go on asking what's the good of taking so much trouble, what's the good of fighting, what's the good of it all, then I will tell you, because France is dying, because Europe is perishing, because if we did not fight our civilization, the edifice so splendidly constructed at the cost of centuries of labor by our humanity would crumble away. These are not idle words. The country is in danger. Our European mother country, and more than any, yours, your own native country, France. Your apathy is killing her. Your silence is killing her. Each of your energies as it dies, each of your ideas as it accepts and surrenders, each of your good intentions as it ends in sterility, every drop of your blood as it dries up unused in your veins means death to her. Up, up, you must live, or if you must die, then you must die fighting like men. But the chief difficulty lay not in getting them to do something, but in getting them to act together. They were quite unmanageable. The best of them were the most obstinate, as Christophe found in dealing with the tenants in his own house, M. Félix Vahe, Elsberger, the engineer, and Commandant Chabrin, lived on terms of polite and silent hostility. And yet, though Christophe knew very little of them, he could see that underneath their party and racial labels they all wanted the same thing. There were many reasons, particularly why M. Vahe and the Commandant should have understood each other. By one of those contrasts common to thoughtful men, M. Weil, who never left his books and lived only in the life of the mind, had a passion for all things military. "'We're all cranks,' said the half-Jew Montaigne, applying to mankind in general what is perfectly true of certain types of minds, like the type of which Mr. Weil was an example. The old intellectual had the craze for Napoleon, he collected books and relics which brought to life in him the terrible dream of the imperial epoch. Like many Frenchmen of that crepuscular epoch, he was dazzled by the distant rays of that glorious sun. He used to go through the campaigns, fight the battles all over again, and discuss operations. 
He was one of those chamber strategists who swarm in the academies and the universities, who explain Austerlitz and declare how Waterloo should have been fought. He was the first to make fun of the Napoleonite in himself. It tickled his irony. But nonetheless, he went on reading the splendid stories with the wild enthusiasm of a child playing a game. He would weep over certain episodes, and when he realized that he'd been weak enough to shed tears, he would roar with laughter and call himself an old fool. As a matter of fact, he was a Napoleonite not so much from patriotism as from a romantic interest and a platonic love of action. However, he was a good patriot and much more attached to France than many an actual Frenchman. The French anti-Semites are stupid and actively mischievous in casting their insulting suspicions on the feeling for France of the Jews who have settled in the country, outside the reasons by which any family does, of necessity, after a generation or two, become attached to the land of its adoption, where the blood of the soil has become its own. The Jews have a special reason to love the nation which in the West stands for the most advanced ideas of intellectual and moral liberty. They love it because for a hundred years they have helped to make it so, and its liberty is in part their work. How then should they not defend it against every menace of feudal reaction? To try, as a handful of unscrupulous politicians and a herd of wrong-headed people would like, to break the bonds which bind these Frenchmen by adoption to France, is to play into the hands of that reaction. Commandant Chabrin was one of those wrong-headed old Frenchmen who are roused to fury by the newspapers, which make out that every immigrant into France is a secret enemy, and in a human, hospitable spirit force themselves to suspect and hate and revile them, and deny the brave destiny of the race which is the conflux of all the races. Therefore he thought it incumbent on him not to know the tenant of the first floor, although he would have been glad to have his acquaintance. As for Monsieur Vile, he would have been very glad to talk to the old soldier, but he knew him for a nationalist, and regarded him with mild contempt. Christophe had much less reason than the commandant for being interested in Monsieur Vile, but he could not bear to hear ill spoken of anybody unjustly, and he broke many a lance in defence of Monsieur Vile while he was attacked in his presence. One day, when the commandant, as usual, was railing against the prevailing state of things, Christophe said to him, "'It is your own fault. You all shut up yourselves inside yourselves. When things in France are not going well, to your way of thinking, you submit to it and send in your resignation. One would think it was a point of honour with you to admit yourselves beaten. I've never seen anybody lose a cause with such absolute delight. Come, commandant. You have made war? Is that fighting or anything like it? It is not a question of fighting, replied the commandant. We don't fight against France. In such struggles as these we have to argue and vote and mix with all sorts of knaves and low blackguards, and I don't like it. You seem to be profoundly disgusted. I suppose you had to do with knaves and low blackguards in Africa. On my honour that did not disgust me nearly so much. Out there one could always knock them down. Besides, if it's a question of fighting, you need soldiers. I had my sharpshooters out there. Here, I'm all alone. It isn't that there's any lack of good men. Where are they? Everywhere, all around us. Well, what are they doing? Just what you're doing. Nothing. They say there's nothing to be done. Give me an instance. Three, if you like, in this very house. Christophe mentioned Monsieur Val, the commandant gave an exclamation. And the Elsbeckers. He jumped in his seat. That Jew? Those Dreyfusards? Dreyfusards, said Christophe. Well, what does that matter? It is they who've ruined France. They love France as much as you do. They're mad, mischievous lunatics. Can't you be just to your adversaries? I can get on quite well with loyal adversaries who use the same weapons. The proof of that is that I am here talking to you, Monsieur German. I can think well of the Germans, although some day I hope to give them back with interest the thrashing we got from them. But it is not the same thing with our enemies at home. They use underhand weapons, 
sophistry and unsound ideas and a poisonous humanitarianism. Yes, you are in the same state of mind as that of the knights of the Middle Ages, when for the first time they found themselves faced with gunpowder. What do you want? There's evolution in war, too. So be it. But then let us be frank and say that war is war. Suppose a common enemy were to threaten Europe. Wouldn't you throw in your lot with the Germans? We did so, in China. Very well, then. Look about you. Don't you see that the heroic idealism of your country and every other country in Europe is actually threatened? Don't you see that they are all more or less a prey to the adventurers of every class of society? To fight that common enemy, don't you think you should join with those of your adversaries who are of some worth and moral vigor? How can a man like you set so little store by the realities of life? Here are people who uphold an ideal which is different from your own. An ideal is a force. You cannot deny it. In the struggle in which you were recently engaged, it was your adversary's ideal which defeated you. Instead of wasting your strength in fighting against it, why not make use of it, side by side with your own, against the enemies of all ideals, the men who are exploiting your country and your wealth of ideas, the men who are bringing European civilization to rottenness, for whose sake one must know where one is, to make our adversaries triumph? When you were in Africa, you never stopped to think whether you were fighting for the king or the republic. I fancy that not many of you ever gave a thought to the republic. They didn't care a rap. Good. And that was well for France. You conquered for her, as well as for yourselves, and for the honor and the joy of it. Why not do the same here? Why not widen the scope of the fight? Don't go haggling over differences in politics and religion. These things are utterly futile. What does it matter whether your nation is the eldest daughter of the church or the eldest daughter of reason? The only thing that does matter is that it should live. Everything that exalts life is good. There's only one enemy, pleasure-seeking egoism, which fouls the sources of life and dries them up. Exalt force, exalt the light, exalt fruitful love, the joy of sacrifice, action, and give up expecting other people to act for you. Do, act, combine, come. And he laughed and began to bang out the first bars of the march in B minor from the choral symphony. Do you know, he said, breaking off, that if I were one of your musicians, say Charpentier or Bruno, devil take the two of them, I would combine in a choral symphony, aux armes, citoyens, l'international, vive Henri IV, and Dieu protège la France. You see, something like this. I would make you a soup so hot that it would burn your mouth. It would be unpleasant, no worse in any case than what you are doing now but I vow it would warm your vittles and that you would have to set out on the march. And he roared with laughter. The commandant laughed, too. You're a fine fellow, Monsieur Kraft. What a pity you're not one of us. But I am one of you. The fight is the same everywhere. Let us close up the ranks. The commandant quite agreed, but there he stayed. Then Christophe pressed his point and brought the conversation back to Monsieur Val and the Elsbeckers and the old soldier no less obstinately went back to his eternal arguments against Jews and Dreyfusars, and nothing that Christophe had said seemed to have had the slightest effect on him. Christophe grew despondent. Olivier said to him, Don't you worry about it. One man cannot all of a sudden change the whole state of mind of a nation. That's too much to expect. But you have done a good deal without knowing it. What have I done? said Christophe. You are Christophe. What good is that to other people? A great deal. Just go on being what you are, my dear Christophe. Don't you worry about us. But Christophe could not surrender. He went on arguing with Commandant Chabrin, sometimes with great vehemence. It amused Céline. She was generally present at their discussions, sitting and working in silence. She took no part in the argument, but it seemed to make her more lively, and quite a different expression would come into her eyes. It was as though it gave her more breathing space. She began to read and went out a little more, and found more things to interest her. And one day, when Christophe was battling with her father about the Elsbergers, the commandant saw her smile. He asked her what she was thinking, and she replied calmly, 
I think Mr. Kraft is right. The commandant was taken aback and said, You, you surprise me. However, right or wrong, we are what we are, and there's no reason why we should know these people. Isn't it so, my dear? No, father, she replied. I would like to know them. The commandant said nothing, and pretended that he had not heard. He himself was much less insensible of Christophe's influence than he cared to appear. His vehemence and narrow-mindedness did not prevent his having a proper sense of justice and very generous feelings. He loved Christophe, he loved his frankness and his moral soundness, and he used often bitterly to regret that Christophe was a German. Although he always lost his temper in these discussions, he was always eager for more and Christophe's arguments did produce an effect on him, though he would never have been willing to admit it. But one day Christophe found him absorbed in reading a book, which he would not let him see. And when Céline took Christophe to the door and found herself alone with him, she said, Do you know what he was reading? One of Mr. Ryle's books. Christophe was delighted. What does he say about it? He says, Beast, but he can't put it down. Christophe made no allusion to the fact with the commandant. It was he who asked, Why have you stopped hurling that blessed Jew at my head? Because I don't think there's any need to, said Christophe. Why? asked the commandant aggressively. Christophe made no reply and went away laughing. Olivier was right. It is not through words that a man can influence other men, but through his life. There are people who irradiate an atmosphere of peace from their eyes and in their gestures and through the silent contact with the serenity of their souls. Christophe irradiated life. Softly, softly, like the moist air of spring, it penetrated the walls and the closed windows of the somnolent old house. It gave new life to the hearts of men and women whom sorrow, weakness, and isolation had for years been consuming, so that they were withered and like dead creatures. What a power there is in one soul over another! Those who wield that power and those who feel it are alike ignorant of its working, and yet the life of the world is in the ebb and flow controlled by that mysterious power of attraction. On the second floor below Christophe and Olivier's room, there lived, as we have seen, a young woman of thirty-five, a Madame Germain, a widow of two years standing, who, the year before, had lost her little girl, a child of seven. She lived with her mother-in-law, and they never saw anybody. Of all the tenants of the house, they had the least to do with Christophe. They had hardly met, and they had never spoken to each other. She was a tall woman, thin but with a good figure. She had fine brown eyes, dull and rather inexpressive, though every now and then there glowed in them a hard, mournful light. Her face was sallow and her complexion waxy. Her cheeks were hollow and her lips were tightly compressed. The elder Madame Germain was a devout lady and spent all her time at church. The younger woman lived in jealous isolation in her grief. She took no interest in anything or anybody. She surrounded herself with portraits and pictures of her little girl, and by dint of staring at them she had ceased to see her as she was. The photographs and dead presentments had killed the living image of the child. She had ceased to see her as she was, but she clung to it. She was determined to think of nothing but the child, and so, in the end, she reached a point at which she could not even think of her. She had completed the work of death. There she stopped, frozen, with her heart turned to stone, with no tears to shed, with her life withered. Religion was no aid to her. She went through the formalities, but her heart was not in them, and therefore she had no living faith. She gave money for masses, but she took no active part in any of the work of the church. Her whole religion was centered in the one thought of seeing her child again. What did the rest matter? God? What had she to do with God? To see her child again, only to see her again. And she was by no means sure that she would do so. She wished to believe it, willed it hardly, desperately, but she was in doubt. She could not bear to see other children, and used to think, Why are they not dead too? In the neighborhood there was a little girl who in figure and manner was like her own. When she saw her from behind with her little pigtails down her back, she used to tremble. She would follow her, and when the child turned round and she saw that it was not she, she would long to strangle her. 
She used to complain that the Asperger children made a noise below her, though they were very quiet and even very subdued by their upbringing. And when the unhappy children began to play about their room, she would send her maid to ask her neighbours to make them be quiet. Christophe met her once as he was coming in with the little girls and was hurt and horrified by the hard way in which she looked at them. One summer evening, when the poor woman was sitting in the dark in the self-hypnotized condition of the utter emptiness of her living death, she heard Christophe playing. It was his habit to sit at the piano in the half-light, musing and improvising. His music irritated her, for it disturbed the empty torpor into which she had sunk. She shut the window angrily. The music penetrated through to her room. Madame Germain was filled with a sort of hatred for it. She would have been glad to stop Christophe, but she had no right to do so. Thereafter, every day, at the same time, she sat waiting impatiently and irritably for the music to begin, and when it was later than usual, her irritation was only the more acute. In spite of herself, she had to follow the music through to the end, and when it was over, she found it hard to sink back into her usual apathy. And one evening, when she was curled up in a corner of her dark room, and through the walls and the closed windows the distant music reached her, that light giving music. She felt a thrill run through her, and once more tears came to her eyes. She went and opened the window and stood there, listening and weeping. The music was like rain, drop by drop falling upon her poor withered heart and giving it new life. Once more she could see the sky, the stars, the summer night, Within herself she felt the dawning of a new interest in life, as yet only a poor, pale light, vague and sorrowful sympathy for others. And that night, for the first time for many months, the image of her little girl came to her in her dreams, for the surest road to bring us near the beloved dead, the best means of seeing them again, is not to go with them into death, but to live. They live in our lives and die with us. She made no attempt to meet Christophe, Rather, she avoided him, but she used to hear him go by on the stairs with the children, and she would stand in hiding behind her door to listen to their babyish prattle, which so moved her heart. One day, as she was going out, she heard their little padding footsteps coming down the stairs, rather more noisily than usual, and the voice of one of the children saying to her sister, "'Don't make so much noise, Lucette. Christophe says you mustn't because of the sorrowful lady.' and the other child began to walk more quietly and to talk in a whisper. Then Madame Germain could not restrain herself. She opened the door and took the children in her arms and hugged them fiercely. They were afraid. One of the children began to cry. She let them go and went back into her own room. After that, whenever she met them, she used to try to smile at them, a poor withered smile, for she'd grown unused to smiling. She would speak to them awkwardly and affectionately, and the children would reply shyly in timid, bashful whispers. They were still afraid of the sorrowful lady, more afraid than ever, and now, whenever they passed the door, they used to run lest she should come out and catch them. She used to hide to catch sight of them as they passed. She would have been ashamed to be seen talking to the children. She was ashamed in her own eyes. It seemed to her that she was robbing her own dead child of some of the love to which only she was entitled. She would kneel down and pray for her forgiveness, but now that the instinct for life and love was newly awakened in her, she could not resist it. It was stronger than herself. One evening, as Christophe came in, he saw that there was an unusual commotion in the house. He met a tradesman who told him that the tenant of the third floor, Monsieur Vatelet, had just died suddenly of angina pectoris. Christophe was filled with pity, not so much for his unhappy neighbour as for the child who was left alone in the world. Monsieur Vatelet was not known to have any relations, and there was every reason to believe that he had left the little girl almost entirely unprovided for. Christophe raced upstairs and went into the flat on the third floor, the door of which was open. He found the Abbe Cornet with the body, and the child in tears crying to her father. The housekeeper was making clumsy efforts to console her. Christophe took the child in his arms and spoke to her tenderly. She clung to him, desperately. He could not think of leaving her. He wanted to take her away, but she would not let him. He stayed with her. He sat near the window in the dying light of day and went on, rocking her in his arms and speaking to her softly. The child gradually grew calmer and went to sleep, still sobbing. 
Christophe laid her on her bed and tried awkwardly to undress her and undo the laces of her little shoes. It was nightfall. The door of the flat had been left open. A shadow entered with a rustling of skirts. In the fading light, Christophe recognized the fevered eyes of the sorrowful lady. He was amazed. She stood by the door and said thickly, I came. Will you, will you let me take her? Christophe took her hand and pressed it. Madame Germain was in tears. Then she sat by the bedside, and a moment later she said, Let me stay with her. Christophe went up to his own room with the Abbe Cornet. The priest was a little embarrassed and begged Miss Pardon for coming up. He hoped, he said humbly, that the dead man would have nothing to reproach him with. He had gone not as a priest but as a friend. Christophe was too much moved to speak and left him with an affectionate shake of the hand. Next morning, when Christophe went down, he found the child with her arms around Madame Germain's neck with the naive confidence which makes children surrender absolutely to those who have won their affection. She was glad to go with her new friend. Alas, she had soon forgotten her adopted father. She showed just the same affection for her new mother. That was not very comforting. Did Madame Germain, in the egoism of her love, see it? Perhaps. But what did it matter? The thing is, to love, that way lies happiness. A few weeks after the funeral, Madame Germain took the child into the country, far away from Paris. Christophe and Olivier saw them off. The woman had an expression of contentment and secret joy which they had never known in her before. She paid no attention to them. However, just as they were going, she noticed Christophe and held out her hand and said, It was you who saved me. What's the matter with the woman? asked Christophe in amazement as they were going upstairs after her departure. A few days later, the post brought him a photograph of a little girl whom he did not know, sitting on a stool with her little hands sagely folded in her lap, while she looked up at him with clear, sad eyes. Beneath it were written these words, with thanks from my dear dead child. End of section 39. Read by Sandra near Montreal. Section 40 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Cannon. The House, Chapter 2, Part 7. Thus it was that the breath of life passed into all these people. In the attic on the fifth floor was a great and mighty flame of humanity, the warmth and light of which were slowly filtered through the house. But Christophe saw it not. To him the process was very slow. Ah, he would sigh, if one could only bring these good people together, all these people of all classes and every kind of belief who refuse to know each other can't it be done what do you want said olivier you would need to have mutual tolerance and a power of sympathy which can only come from inward joy the joy of a healthy normal harmonious existence the joy of having a useful outlet for one's activity a feeling that one's efforts are not wasted and that one is serving some great purpose you would need to have a prosperous country a nation at the height of greatness or better still on the road to greatness and you must also have the two things go together a power which could employ all the nation's energies and intelligent and strong power which would be above party now there is no power above party save that which finds its strength in itself not in the multitude that power which seeks not the support of anarchical majorities as it does nowadays when it is no more than a well-trained dog in the hands of second-rate men and bends all to its will by service rendered the victorious general the dictatorship of public safety the supremacy of the intelligence what you will it does not depend on us you must have the opportunity and the men capable of seizing it you must have happiness and genius let us wait and hope the forces are there the forces of faith knowledge work 
old france and new france and the greater france what an upheaval it would be if the word were spoken the magic word which should let loose these forces altogether of course neither you nor i can say the word who will say it victory glory patience the chief thing is for the strength of the nation to be gathered together and not to rust away and not to lose heart before the time comes happiness and genius only come to those peoples who have earned them by ages of stoic patience and labour and faith who knows said christophe they often come sooner than we think just when we expect them least you are counting too much on the work of ages make ready gird your loins always be prepared with your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand for you do not know that the lord will not pass your doors this very night the lord came very near that night his shadow fell upon the threshold of the house following on a sequence of apparently insignificant events relations between france and germany suddenly became strained and in a few days the usual neighbourly attitude of banal courtesy passed into the provocative mood which precedes war there was nothing surprising in this except to those who were living under the illusion that the world is governed by reason but there were many such in france and numbers of people were amazed from day to day to see the vehement gallophobia of the german press becoming rampant with the usual quasi unanimity certain of those newspapers which in the two countries arrogate to themselves a monopoly of patriotism and speak in the nation's name and dictate to the state sometimes with the secret complicity of the state the policy it should follow launch forth insulting ultimatums to france there was a dispute between germany and england and germany did not admit the right of france not to interfere the insolent newspapers called upon her to declare for germany or else threatened to make her pay the chief expenses of the war they presumed that they could wrest alliance from her fears and already regarded her as a conquered and contented vassal to be frank like austria it only showed the insane vanity of german imperialism drunk with victory and the absolute incapacity of german statesmen to understand other races so that they were always applying the simple common measure which was law for themselves force the supreme reason naturally such a brutal demand made of an ancient nation rich in its past ages of a glory and a supremacy in europe such as germany had never known had had exactly the opposite effect to that which germany expected it had provoked their slumbering pride france was shaken from top to base and even the most diffident of the french roared with anger the great mass of the german people had nothing at all to do with the provocation they were shocked by it the honest men of every country ask only to be allowed to live in peace and the people of germany are particularly peaceful affectionate anxious to be on good terms with everybody and much more inclined to admire and emulate other nations than to go to war with them but the honest men of a nation are not asked for their opinion and they are not bold enough to give it those who are not virile enough to take public action are inevitably condemned to be its pawns they are the magnificent and unthinking echo which casts back the snarling cries of the press and the defiance of their leaders and swells them into the marseillaise or the wacht am rhein it was a terrible blow to christophe and olivier they were so used to living in mutual love that they could not understand why their countries did not do the same neither of them could grasp the reasons for the persistent hostility which was now so suddenly brought to the surface especially christophe who being a german had no sort of ground for ill-feeling against the people whom his own people had conquered although he himself was shocked by the intolerable vanity of some of his fellow-countrymen and up to a certain point was entirely with the french against such a high-handed brunswicker demand he could not understand why france should after all be unwilling to enter into an alliance with germany the two countries seemed to him to have so many deep-seated reasons for being united so many ideas in common 
and such great tasks to accomplish together that it annoyed him to see them persisting in their wasteful sterile ill-feeling like all germans he regarded france as the most to blame for the misunderstanding for though he was quite ready to admit that it was painful for her to sit still under the memory of her defeat yet that was after all only a matter of vanity which should be set aside in the higher interests of civilization and of france herself he had never taken the trouble to think out the problem of alsace and lorraine at school he had been taught to regard the annexation of those countries as an act of justice by which after centuries of foreign subjection a german province had been restored to the german flag and so he was brought down with a run and he discovered that his friend regarded the annexation as a crime he had never even spoken to him about these things so convinced was he that they were of the same opinion and now he found olivier of whose good faith and broad-mindedness he was certain telling him dispassionately without anger and with profound sadness that it was possible for a great people to renounce the thought of vengeance for such a crime but quite impossible for them to subscribe to it without dishonour they had great difficulty in understanding each other olivier's historical argument alleging the right of france to claim alsace as a latin country made no impression on christophe there were just as good arguments to the contrary history can provide politics with every sort of argument in every sort of cause christophe was much more accessible to the human and not only french aspect of the problem whether the alsatians were or were not germans was not the question they did not wish to be germans and that was all that mattered what nation has the right to say these people are mine for they are my brothers if the brothers in question renounce that nation though they be a thousand times in the wrong the consequences of the breach must always be borne by the party who has failed to win the love of the other and therefore has lost the right to presume to bind the other's fortunes up with his own after forty years of strained relations vexations patent or disguised and even of real advantage gained from the exact and intelligent administration of germany the alsatians persist in their refusal to become germans and though they might give in from sheer exhaustion nothing could ever wipe out the memory of the sufferings of the generations forced to live in exile from their native land or what is even more pitiful unable to leave it and compelled to bend under a yoke which was hateful to them and to submit to the seizure of their country and the slavery of their people christophe naively confessed that he had never seen the matter in that light and he was considerably perturbed by it and honest germans always bring to a discussion an integrity which does not always go with the passionate self-esteem of a latin however sincere he may be it never occurred to christophe to support his argument by the citation of similar crimes perpetrated by all nations all through the history of the world he was too proud to fall back upon any such humiliating excuse he knew that as humanity advances its crimes become more odious for they stand in a clearer light but he knew also that if france were victorious in her turn she would be no more moderate in the hour of victory than germany had been and that yet another link would be added to the chain of the crimes of the nations so the tragic conflict would drag on for ever in which the best elements of european civilization were in danger of being lost though the subject was terribly painful for christophe it was even more so for olivier it meant for him not only the sorrow of a great fratricidal struggle between the two nations best fitted for alliance together in france the nation was divided and one faction was preparing to fight the other for years pacific and anti-militarist doctrines had been spread and propagated both by the noblest and the vilest elements of the nation the government had for a long time held aloof with the weak need dilettantism with which it handled everything which did not concern the immediate interests of the politicians and it never occurred to it that it might be less dangerous frankly to maintain the most dangerous doctrines than to leave them free to creep into the veins of the people and ruin their capacity for war while armaments were being prepared 
these doctrines appealed to the free thinkers who were dreaming of founding a european brotherhood working altogether to make the world more just and human they appealed also to the selfish cowardice of the rabble who were unwilling to endanger their skins for anything or anybody these ideas have been taken up by olivier and many of his friends once or twice in his rooms christophe had been present at discussions which had amazed him his friend mooch who was stuffed full of humanitarian illusions used to say with eyes blazing quite calmly that war must be abolished and that the best way of setting about it was to incite the soldiers to mutiny and if necessary to shoot down their leaders and he would insist that it was bound to succeed ellie ellsberger would reply coldly and vehemently that if war were to break out he and his friends would not set out for the frontier before they had settled their account with the enemy at home andre ellsberger would take mooch's part one day christoph came in for a terrible scene between the two brothers they threatened to shoot each other although their bloodthirsty words were spoken in a bantering tone he had a feeling that neither of them had uttered a single threat which he was not prepared to put into action christophe was amazed when he thought of a race of men so absurd as to be always ready to commit suicide for the sake of ideas madmen crazy logicians and yet they are good men each man sees only his own ideas and wishes to follow them through to the end without turning aside by a hair's breadth and it is all quite useless for they crush each other out of existence the humanitarians wage war on the patriots the patriots wage war on the humanitarians and meanwhile the enemy comes and destroys both country and humanity in one swoop but tell me christophe would ask andre ellsberger are you in touch with the proletarians of the rest of the nations some one has to begin and we are the people to do it we have always been the first it is for us to give the signal and suppose the others won't follow they will have you made treaties and drawn up a plan what's the good of treaties our force is superior to diplomacy it is not a question of ideas it's a question of strategy if you are going to destroy war you must borrow the methods of war draw up your plan of campaign in the two countries arrange that on such and such a date in france and germany your allied troops shall take such and such a step but if you go to work without a plan how can you expect any good to come of it with chance on the one hand and tremendous organized forces on the other the result would never be in doubt you would be crushed out of existence andre ellsberger did not listen he shrugged his shoulders and took refuge in vague threats a handful of sand he said was enough to smash the whole machine if it were dropped into the right place in the gears but it is one thing to discuss at leisure theoretically and quite another to have to put one's ideas into practice especially when one has to make up one's mind quickly those are frightful moments when the great tide surges through the depths of the hearts of men they thought they were free and masters of their thoughts but now in spite of themselves they are conscious of being dragged onwards onwards an obscure power of will is set against their will then they discover that it is not they who exist in reality not they but that unknown force whose laws govern the whole ocean of humanity men of the firmest intelligence men the most secure in their faith now saw it dissolve at the first puff of reality and stood turning this way and that not daring to make up their minds and often to their immense surprise deciding upon a course of action entirely different from any that they had foreseen some of the most eager to abolish war suddenly felt a vigorous passionate pride in their country leap into being in their hearts christophe found socialists and even revolutionary syndicalists absolutely bowled over by their passionate pride in a duty utterly foreign to their temper at the very beginning of the upheaval when as yet he hardly believed that the affair could be serious he said to andre ellsberger with his usual german want of tact that now was the moment to apply his theories unless he wanted germany to take france andre fumed and replied angrily just you try swine you haven't even guts enough to muzzle your emperor and shake off the yoke in spite of your thrice blessed socialist party with its four hundred thousand members and its three million electors we'll do it for you take us we'll take you 
and as they were held on and on in suspense they grew restless and feverish andre was in torment he knew that his faith was true and yet he could not defend it he felt that he was infected by the moral epidemic which spreads among the people of a nation the collective insanity of their ideas the terrible spirit of war it attacked everybody about christophe and even christophe himself they were no longer on speaking terms and kept themselves to themselves but it was impossible to endure such suspense for long the wind of action willy-nilly sifted the waverers into one group or another and one day when it seemed that they must be on the eve of the ultimatum when in both countries the springs of action were taut ready for slaughter christophe saw that everybody including the people in his own house had made up their minds every kind of party was instinctively rallied round the detested or despised government which represented france not only the honest men of the various parties but the aesthetes the masters of depraved art took to interpolating professions of patriotic faith in their work the jews were talking of defending the soil of their ancestors at the mere mention of the flag tears came to hamilton's eyes and they were all sincere they were all victims of the contagion andre ellsberger and his syndicalist friends just as much as the rest and even more for being crushed by necessity and pledged to a party that they detested they submitted with a grim fury and a stormy pessimism which made them crazy for action aubert the artisan torn between his cultivated humanitarianism and his instinctive chauvinism was almost beside himself after many sleepless nights he had at last found a formula which could accommodate everything that france was synonymous with humanity thereafter he never spoke to christophe almost all the people in the house had closed their doors to him even the good arnauds never invited him they went on playing music and surrounding themselves with art they tried to forget their general obsession but they could not help thinking of it when either of them alone happened to meet christophe alone he or she would shake hands warmly but hurriedly and furtively and if the very same day christophe met them together they would pass him by with a frigid bow on the other hand people who had not spoken to each other for years now rushed together one evening olivia beckoned to christophe to go near the window and without a word he pointed to the ellsbergers talking to commandant chabron in the garden below christophe had no time to be surprised at such a revolution in the minds of his friends he was too much occupied with his own mind in which there had been an upheaval the consequences of which he could not master olivier was much calmer than he though he had much more reason to be upset of all christophe's acquaintance he seemed to be the only one to escape the contagion though he was oppressed by the anxious waiting for the outbreak of war and the dread of schism at home which he saw must happen in spite of everything he knew the greatness of the two hostile faiths which sooner or later would come to grips he knew also that it is the part of france to be the experimental ground in human progress and that all new ideas need to be watered with her blood before they can come to flower for his own part he refused to take part in the skirmish while the civilized nations were cutting each other's throats he was fain to repeat the device of antigone i made for love and not for hate for love and for understanding which is another form of love his fondness for christophe was enough to make his duty plain to him at a time when millions of human beings were on the brink of hatred he felt that the duty and happiness of friends like himself and christophe was to love each other and to keep their reason uncontaminated by the general upheaval he remembered how goethe had refused to associate himself with the liberation movement of eighteen thirteen when hatred sent germany to march out against france christophe felt the same and yet he was not easy in his mind he who in a way had deserted germany and could not return thither he who had been fed with the european ideas of the great germans of the eighteenth century so dear to his old friend schultz and detested the militarist and commercial spirit of new germany now found himself the prey of gusty passions and he did not know whither they would lead him he did not tell olivier but he spent his days in agony longing for news secretly he put his affairs in order and packed his trunk he did not reason the thing out it was too strong for him olivier watched him anxiously and guessed the struggle which was going on in his friend's mind and he dared not question him 
they felt that they were impelled to draw closer to each other than ever and they loved each other more but they were afraid to speak they trembled lest they should discover some difference of thought which might come between them and divide them as their old misunderstanding had done often their eyes would meet with an expression of tender anxiety as though they were on the eve of parting for ever and they were silent and oppressed but still on the roof of the house that was being built on the other side of the yard all through those days of gloom with the rain beating down on them the workmen were putting the finishing touches and christophe's friend the loquacious slater laughed and shouted across there the house is finished happily the storm passed as quickly as it had come the chancelleries published bulletins announcing the return of fair weather barometrically as it were the howling dogs of the press were dispatched to their kennels in a few hours the tension was relieved it was a summer evening and christophe had rushed in breathless to convey the good news to olivier he was happy and could breathe again olivier looked at him with a little sad smile and he dared not ask him the question that lay next his heart he said will you have seen them all united all these people who could not understand each other yes said christophe good-humouredly i have seen them united you're such humbugs you all cry out upon each other but at bottom you're all of the same mind you seem to be glad of it remarked olivier why not because they were united at my expense bah i'm strong enough for that besides it's a fine thing to feel the mighty torrent rushing you along and the demons that were let loose in your hearts they terrify me said olivier i would rather have eternal solitude than have my people united at such a cost they relapsed into silence and neither of them dared approach the subject which was troubling them at last olivier pulled himself together and in a choking voice said tell me frankly christophe you were going away christophe replied yes olivier was sure that he would say it and yet his heart ached for it he said tell me christophe could you could you christophe drew his hand over his forehead and said don't let's talk of it i don't like to think of it olivier went on sorrowfully you would have fought against us i don't know i never thought about it but in your heart you had decided christophe said yes against me never against you you are mine where i am you are too but against my country for my country it is a terrible thing said olivier i love my country as you do i love france but could i slay my soul for her could i betray my conscience for her that would be to betray her how could i hate having no hatred or without being guilty of a lie assume a hatred that i did not feel the modern state was guilty of a monstrous crime a crime which will prove its undoing when it presumed to impose its brazen laws on the free church of those spirits the very essence of whose being is to love and understand let caesar be caesar but let him not assume the godhead let him take our money and our lives over our souls he has no rights he shall not stain them with blood we are in this world to give it light not to darken it let each man fulfil his duty if caesar desires war then let caesar have armies for that purpose armies as they were in olden times armies of men whose trade is war i'm not so foolish as to waste my time in vainly moaning and groaning in protest against force but i'm not a soldier in the army of force i'm a soldier in the army of the spirit with thousands of other men who are my brothers in arms i represent france in that army let caesar conquer the world if he will we march to the conquest of truth to conquer said christophe you must vanquish you must live truth is no hard dogma secreted by the brain like a stalactite by the walls of a cave truth is life it is not to be found in your own head but to be sought for in the hearts of others attach yourself to them be one of them think as much as you like but do you every day take a bath of humanity you must live in the life of others and love and bow to destiny it is our fate to be what we are it does not depend on us whether we shall or shall not think certain things even though they be dangerous we have reached such a pitch of civilization that we cannot turn back yes you have reached the farthest limit of the plateau of civilization that dizzy height to which no nation can climb without feeling an irresistible desire to fling itself down religion and instinct are weakened in you you have nothing left but intelligence you are machines grinding out philosophy death comes rushing in upon you death comes to every nation it is a matter of centuries 
have done with your centuries the whole of life is a matter of days and hours if you weren't such an infernally metaphysical lot you'd never go shuffling over into the absolute instead of seizing and holding the passing moment what do you want the flame burns the torch away you can't both live and have lived my dear christophe you must live it is a great thing to have been great it is only a great thing when there are still men who are alive enough and great enough to appreciate it wouldn't you much rather have been the greeks who are dead than any of the people who are vegetating nowadays i'd much rather be myself christophe and, and very much alive olivia gave up the argument it was not that he was without an answer but it did not interest him all through the discussion he had only been thinking of christophe he said with a sigh you love me less than i love you christophe took his hand and pressed it tenderly dear olivier he said i love you more than my life but you must forgive me if i do not love you more than life the son of our two races i have a horror of the night into which your false progress drags me all your sentiments of renunciation are only the covering of the same buddhist nirvana only action is living even when it brings death in this world we can only choose between the devouring flame and night in spite of the sad sweetness of dreams and the hour of twilight i have no desire for that peace which is the forerunner of death the silence of infinite space terrifies me heap more faggots upon the fire more and yet more myself too if needs must i will not let the fire dwindle if it dies down there is an end of us an end of everything what you say is old said olivia it comes from the depths of the barbarous past he took down from his shelves a book of hindu poetry and read the sublime apostrophe of the god krishna arise and fight with a resolute heart setting no store by pleasure or pain or gain or loss or victory or defeat fight with all thy might christophe snatched the book from his hands and read i have nothing in the world to bid me toil there is nothing that is not mine and yet i cease not from my labour if i did not act without a truce and without relief setting an example for men to follow all men would perish if for a moment i were to cease from my labours i should plunge the world in chaos and i should be the destroyer of life life repeated olivier what is life a tragedy said christophe hurrah section forty one of jean christophe in paris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org jean christophe in paris by romain roland translated by gilbert cannon the house chapter two part eight the panic died down every one hastened to forget with a hidden fear in their hearts no one seemed to remember what had happened and yet it was plain that it was still in their thoughts from the joy with which they resumed their lives the pleasant life from day to day which is never truly valued until it is endangered as usual when danger is past they gulped it down with renewed avidity christophe flung himself into creative work with tenfold vigour he dragged olivier after him in reaction against their recent gloomy thoughts they had begun to collaborate in a rabelaisian epic it was coloured by that broad materialism which follows on periods of moral stress to the legendary heroes gargantua friar john panurge olivier had added on christophe's inspiration a new character a peasant jacques patience simple cunning sly resigned who was the butt of the others putting up with it when he was thrashed and robbed putting up with it when they made love to his wife and laid waste his fields tirelessly putting his house in order and cultivating his land forced to follow the others to war bearing the burden of the baggage coming in for all the kicks and still putting up with it waiting laughing at the exploits of his masters and the thrashings they gave him and saying they can't go on for ever foreseeing their ultimate downfall looking out for it out of the corner of his eye and silently laughing at the thought of it with his great mouth agape one fine day it turned out that gargantua and friar john were drowned while they were away on a crusade patience honestly regretted their loss merely took heart of grace saved panurge who was drowning also and said i know that you will go 
on playing your tricks on me you don't take me in but i can't do without you you drive away the spleen and make me laugh christoph set the poem to music with great symphonic pictures with soli in chorus mock heroic battles riotous country fairs vocal buffooneries madrigals a la Jeannequin with tremendous childlike glee a storm at sea the island of bells and finally a pastoral symphony full of the air of the fields and the blithe serenity of the flutes and oboes and the clean souled folk-songs of old france the friends worked away with boundless delight the weekly olivier with his pale cheeks found new health in christophe's health gusts of wind blew through their garret the very intoxication of joy to be working together heart to heart with one's friend the embrace of two lovers is not sweeter or more ardent than such a yoking together of two kindred souls they were so near in sympathy that often the same ideas would flash upon them at the same moment or christophe would write the music for a scene for which olivier would immediately find words christophe impetuously dragged olivier along in his wake his mind swamped that of his friend and made it fruitful the joy of creation was enhanced by that of success hector had just made up his mind to publish the david and the score well launched had had an instantaneous success abroad a great wagnerian kapellmeister a friend of hex who had settled in england was enthusiastic about it he had given it at several of his concerts with considerable success which with the kapellmeister's enthusiasm had carried it over to germany where also the david had been played the kapellmeister had entered into correspondence with christoph and had asked him for more of his compositions offered to do anything he could to help him and was engaged in ardent propaganda in his cause in germany the iphigenia which had originally been hissed was unearthed and it was hailed as a work of genius certain facts in christophe's life being of a romantic nature contributed not a little to the spurring of public interest the frankfurter zeitung was the first to publish an enthusiastic article others followed then in france a few people began to be aware that they had a great musician in their midst one of the parisian conductors asked christophe for his rabelaisian epic before it was finished and gujar perceiving his approaching fame began to speak mysteriously of a friend of his who was a genius and had been discovered by himself he wrote a laudatory article about the admirable david entirely forgetting that only the year before he had decried it in a short notice of a few lines nobody else remembered it either or seemed to be in the least astonished at his sudden change there are so many people in paris who are now loud in their praises of wagner and cesar franck where formerly they roundly abused them and actually used the fame of these men to crush those new artists whom to-morrow they will be lauding to the skies christophe did not set any great store on his success he knew that he would one day win through but he had not thought that the day could be so near at hand and he was distrustful of so rapid a triumph he shrugged his shoulders and said that he wanted to be left alone he could have understood people applauding the david the year before when he wrote it but now he was so far beyond it he had climbed higher he was inclined to say to the people who came and talked about his old work don't worry me with that stuff it disgusts me so do you and he plunged into his new work again rather annoyed at having been disturbed however he did feel a certain secret satisfaction the first rays of the light of fame are very sweet it is good it is healthy to conquer it is like the open window and the first sweet sense of the spring coming into a house christophe's contempt for his old work was of no avail especially with regard to the iphigenia there was a certain amount of atonement for him in seeing that unhappy production which had originally brought him only humiliation be lauded by the german critics and in great request with the theatres as he learned from a letter from dresden in which the directors stated that they would be glad to produce the piece during their next season the very day when christophe received the news which after years of struggling at last opened up a calmer horizon with victory in the distance he had another letter from germany it was in the afternoon he was washing his face and talking gaily to olivier in the next room when the housekeeper slipped an envelope under the door his mother's writing 
he had been just on the point of writing to her and was happy at the thought of being able to tell her of his success which would give her so much pleasure he opened the letter there were only a few lines how shaky the writing was my dear boy i'm not very well if it were possible i should like to see you again love mother christophe gave a groan olivier who was working in the next room ran to him in alarm christophe could not speak and pointed to the letter on the table he went on groaning and did not listen to what olivier said who took in the letter at a glance and tried to comfort him he rushed to his bed where he had laid his coat dressed hurriedly and without waiting to fasten his collar his hands were trembling too much went out olivier caught him up on the stairs what was he going to do go by the first train there wasn't one until the evening it was much better to wait there than at the station had he enough money they rummaged through their pockets and when they counted all that they possessed between them it only amounted to thirty francs it was september hecked the arnauds all their friends were out of paris they had no one to turn to christophe was beside himself and talked of going part of the way on foot olivier begged him to wait for an hour and promised to procure the money somehow christophe submitted he was incapable of a single idea himself olivier ran to the pawn shop it was the first time he had been there for his own sake he would much rather have been left with nothing than pledge any of his possessions which were all associated with some precious memory but it was for christophe and there was no time to lose he pawned his watch for which he was advanced a sum much smaller than he had expected he had to go home again and fetch some of his books and take them to a bookseller it was a great grief to him but at the time he hardly thought of it his mind could grasp nothing but christophe's trouble he returned and found christophe just where he had left him sitting by his desk in a state of collapse with their thirty francs the sum that olivier had collected was more than enough christophe was too upset to think of asking his friend how he had come by it or whether he had kept enough to live on during his absence olivier did not think of it either he had given christophe all he possessed he had to look after christophe just like a child until it was time for him to go he took him to the station and never left him until the train began to move in the darkness into which he was rushing christophe sat wide-eyed staring straight in front of him and thinking shall i be in time he knew that his mother must have been unable to wait for her to write to him and in his fevered anxiety he was impatient of the jolting speed of the express he reproached himself bitterly for having left louisa and at the same time he felt how vain were his reproaches he had no power to change the course of events however the monotonous rocking of the wheels and springs of the carriage soothed him gradually and took possession of his mind like tossing waves of music dammed back by a mighty rhythm he lived through all his past life again from the far distant days of his childhood loves hopes disillusion sorrows and that exultant force that intoxication of suffering enjoying and creating that delight in blotting out the light of life and its sublime shadows which was the soul of his soul the living breath of the god within him now as he looked back on it all was clear his tumultuous desires his uneasy thoughts his faults mistakes and headlong struggles now seemed to him to be the eddy and swirl borne on by the great current of life towards its eternal goal he discovered the profound meaning of those years of trial each test was a barrier which was burst by the gathering waters of the river a passage from a narrow to a wider valley which the river would soon fill always he came to a wider view and a freer air between the rising ground of france and the german plain the river had carved its way not without many a struggle flooding the meadows eating away the base of the hills gathering and absorbing all the waters of the two countries so it flowed between them not to divide but to unite them in it they were wedded and for the first time christophe became conscious of his destiny which was to carry through the hostile peoples like an artery all the forces of life and of the two sides of the river a strange serenity a sudden calm and clarity came over him as sometimes happens in the darkest hours then the vision faded and he saw nothing but the tender sorrowful face of his old mother 
it was hardly dawn when he reached the little german town he had to take care not to be recognized for there was still a warrant of arrest out against him but nobody at the station took any notice of him the town was asleep the houses were shut up and the streets deserted it was the grey hour when the lights of the night are put out and the light of day is not yet come the hour when sleep is sweetest and dreams are lit with the pale light of the east a little servant girl was taking down the shutters of a shop and singing an old german folk song christoph almost choked with emotion o oh, fatherland beloved he was fain to kiss the earth as he heard the humble song that set his heart aching in his breast he felt how unhappy he had been away from his country and how much he loved it he walked on holding his breath when he saw his old house he was obliged to stop and put his hand to his lips to keep himself from crying out how would he find his mother his mother whom he had deserted he took a long breath and almost ran to the door it was ajar he pushed it open no one there the old wooden staircase creaked under his footsteps he went up to the top floor the house seemed to be empty the door of his mother's room was shut christophe's heart thumped as he laid his hand on the door-knob and he had not the strength to open it louisa was alone in bed feeling that the end was near of her two other sons rodolph the business man had settled in hamburg the other ernest had emigrated to america and no one knew what had become of him there was no one to attend to her except a woman in the house who came twice a day to see if louisa wanted anything stayed for a few minutes and then went about her business she was not very punctual and was often late in coming to louisa it seemed quite natural that she should be forgotten as it seemed to her quite natural to be ill she was used to suffering and was as patient as an angel she had heart disease and palpitations during which she would think she was going to die she would lie with her eyes wide open and her hands clutching the bedclothes and the sweat dripping down her face she never complained she knew that it must be so she was ready she had already received the sacrament she had only one anxiety lest god should find her unworthy to enter into paradise she endured everything else in patience in a dark corner of her little room near her pillow on the wall of the recess she had made a little shrine for her relics and trophies she had collected the portraits of those who were dear to her her three children her husband for whose memory she had always preserved her love in his first freshness the old grandfather and her brother gottfried she was touchingly devoted to all those who had been kind to her though it were never so little on her coverlet close to her eyes she had pinned the last photograph of himself that christophe had sent her and his last letters were under her pillow she had a love of neatness and scrupulous tidiness and it hurt her to know that everything was not perfectly in order in her room she listened for the little noises outside which marked the different moments of the day for her it was so long since she had first heard them all her life had been spent in that narrow space she thought of her dear christophe how she longed for him to be there near her just then and yet she was resigned even to his absence she was sure that she would see him again on high she had only to close her eyes to see him she spent days and days half unconscious living in the past she would see once more the old house on the banks of the rhine a holiday a superb summer day the window was open the white road lay gleaming under the sun they could hear the birds singing melchior and the old grandfather were sitting by the front door smoking and chatting and laughing uproariously louisa could not see them but she was glad that her husband was at home that day and that grandfather was in such a good temper she was in the basement cooking the dinner an excellent dinner she watched over it as the apple of her eye there was a surprise at chestnut cake already she could hear the boy's shout of delight the boy where was he upstairs she could hear him practising at the piano she could not make out what he was playing but she was glad to hear the familiar tinkling sounds and to know that he was sitting there with his grave face what a lovely day the merry jingling bells of a carriage went by on the road oh good heavens the joint perhaps it had been burned while she was looking out of the window she trembled lest grandfather of whom she was so fond though she was afraid of him should be dissatisfied and scold her thank heaven there was no harm done there everything was ready and the table was laid she called melchior and grandfather they replied eagerly and the boy he had stopped playing his music had ceased a moment ago without her noticing it christophe what was he doing there was not a sound to be heard 
he was always forgetting to come down to dinner father was going to scold him she ran upstairs christoph he made no sound she opened the door of the room where he was practising no one there the room was empty and the piano was closed louisa was seized with a sudden panic what had become of him the window was open oh heaven perhaps he had fallen out louisa's heart stops she leans out and looks down christoph he is nowhere to be found she rushes all over the house downstairs grandfather shouts to her come along don't worry he'll come back she will not go down she knows that he is there that he is hiding for fun to tease her oh naughty naughty boy yes she is sure of it now she heard the floor creak he is behind the door she tries to open the door but the key is gone the key she rummages through a drawer looking for it in a heap of keys this one that no not that ah that's it she cannot fit it into the lock her hand is trembling so she is in such haste she must be quick why she does not know but she knows that she must be quick and that if she doesn't hurry she will be too late she hears christophe breathing on the other side of the door oh bother the key at last the door is opened a cry of joy it is he he flings his arms round her neck oh naughty naughty good darling boy she has opened her eyes he is there standing by her for some time he had been standing looking at her so changed she was with her face both drawn and swollen and her mute suffering made her smile of recognition so infinitely touching and the silence and her utter loneliness it rent his heart she saw him she was not surprised she smiled all that she could not say a smile of boundless tenderness she could not hold out her arms to him nor utter a single word he flung his arms round her neck and kissed her and she kissed him great tears were trickling down her cheeks she said in a whisper wait he saw that she could not breathe neither stirred she stroked his head with her hands and her tears went on trickling down her cheeks he kissed her hands and sobbed with his face hidden in the coverlet when her attack had passed she tried to speak but she could not find words she floundered and he could hardly understand her but what did it matter they loved each other and were together and could touch each other that was the main thing he asked indignantly why she was left alone she made excuses for her nurse she cannot always be here she has her work to do in a faint broken voice she could hardly pronounce her words she made a little hurried request about her burial she told christophe to give her love to her two other sons who had forgotten her and she sent a message to olivier knowing his love for christophe she begged christophe to tell him that she sent him her blessing and then timidly she recollected herself and made use of a more humble expression her affectionate respects once more she choked he helped her to sit up in her bed the sweat dripped down her face she forced herself to smile she told herself that she had nothing more to wish for in the world now that she had her son's hand clasped in hers and suddenly christophe felt her hand stiffen in his louisa opened her lips she looked at her son with infinite tenderness so the end came This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks.